I hope you can hear me correctly. If there are some problems, just uh, leave some messages in the chat so that I know if, if there is uh, something happening. So um, good morning to all again, and welcome to this uh, Mosaic 5G workshop on Agile 5G network services and applications. My name is Bruno Marafini, uh, part of the uh, Mosaic 5G team and uh, Euregom Institute, and I will be uh, one of the co-hosts today for this uh, uh, workshop, and I'm really happy to welcome all of you here. So let me go to the agenda so that I could uh, share with you part of the uh, program of today. Just let me know if you see it correctly. I'm sharing with you uh, the first introductory part on um, today's workshop. So uh, I am briefly going through the agenda. Uh, the introduction we we uh, we shifted of five ten minutes just to enable all of you uh, to connect. Uh, uh, Professor Navid Nikayen and uh, following speakers will follow with all the uh, agenda with all with different topics uh, and following by uh, different workshops um, and live demos that will succeed during the uh, the afternoon session. So here are some of the speakers, some from Emregom, some from other affiliations. Um, you already saw the agenda online. It was uh, completely the same. We have also uh, the first break that will start 10.40, uh, 10 minutes break, and then we will continue with the second part of the speakers before going through the uh, lunch break. So during the lunch break, we will enable uh, a breakout room so some of you uh, who are willing to join will be able to join a session by uh, Chen Chung Chen who will present uh, a prototyping of OS and the IoT. Uh, there will be two sessions on that so if you miss one you will be able to um, rejoin. So after going through this there will be in the afternoon the ones highlighted in red will be uh, some live sessions and some trainings that will be followed by Professor Nigaen and then um, other, uh, so Osama Rook, Mr. Robert Schmidt, and Tien Tin Buyen, who will follow up with uh, some Cube 5G, FlexRun, and LLMEC uh, live, live demos. Um, in the end, uh, Professor Nigaen will now uh, then introduce the, 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 the following status and roadmap of Mosaic 5G and will also uh, be the, let's say, concluder of the, of the overall meeting. I just wanted to give you some brief guidelines on how it's going to be uh, moderated, the, the, the overall meeting. So for any type of questions, just when whatever speaker is, is actually speaking for the moment, you can use the Zoom chat, and each speaker will have the opportunity of, of uh, to reading the questions and then answering the questions. Uh, being always uh, aware that I will um, check the timings in order for us not to, to go too late. Um, so he is free, willing to, um, to answer them as soon as the, the, the talk is finished, as soon as uh, he, he, let's say, uh, is willing to. Uh, there will be also some short uh, sessions that will be dedicated to uh, Q&A. So generically, when you want to address a generic questions to the group, you can just type in the chat and uh, send a message to all. Whereas you have also the possibility of sharing a message privately with one of the speakers if you want to share something specifically. Um, after saying that, a uh, brief, um, let's say, intro on how to join a breakout room. So the breakout room for the moment is still not enabled, but as soon as it will be enabled for the lunch break, um, you will receive a notification and you will see the breakout room there. By doing this, you will be um, invited by the host, so by uh, Professor Nigaen or by myself, to join. And there you will be able to join this uh, workshop session. Okay. And after entering the breakout room, the controls will be the same as you have here in the, in the normal meeting. Uh, in order to leave the breakout room, you can just click on to leave breakout room and you can, uh, of course, choose whether you want to leave the breakout room or you want to uh, leave the, the, the entire meeting, for example. 
Um, after saying this, I do not want to take too much time. So if there are no questions, um, I would um, stop my uh, screen sharing. This was just uh, a warm welcome for all of you and for the ones who are welcoming now. So the ones who are entering now. And I would leave the floor to Professor Negaen, coordinator of uh, Mosaic 5G, and who will illustrate the current uh, open air interface 5G status and uh, roadmap. Please, Professor Nigaen, uh, welcome. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Bruno, for the introduction. Let me share my screen. So again, also my uh, warm welcome on behalf of the Mosaic 5G team to your attendance to, to this uh, workshop. So I'm, uh, as Bruno said, uh, a professor at Eurecom. I'm also a board member on Open Air Interface Software Alliance and also coordinating uh, activity of the Mosaic uh, 5G. So let's uh, uh, go to the first uh, item on the table which basically to introduce to you what is uh, Mosaic 5G and why uh, this uh, initiative is uh, uh, what is the offering of this uh, initiative. So Mosaic 5G is a non-profit initiative that provides um, uh, an open ecosystem of agile 4G 5G service platform. So by service here we mean that the 4G and 5G network is delivered on as a service basis. It already embeds the idea of uh, customizing the network towards the service, the idea of extending the service, uh, extending the network towards the, the service and providing, uh, uh, providing a service-based uh, network. Mosaic 5G also is the ecosystem of the use cases. So the approach taken in Mosaic 5G is top down. So we try to, to look at the uh, use cases and see which one of them are uh, innovative and then try to uh, further develop the platform, provide new functionalities and features to demonst demonstrate those uh, showcases. Also, it's worth mentioning that uh, the initiative funded by Eurecom uh, after the success of Open Air Interface, uh, and then it is launched in, in 2016. So uh, the, que the answer to the question is why do we need uh, Mosaic 5G? I just want to recall the transformation uh, that we observed all of us from 4G to, to 5G. So 4G, the, the way it was designed was really communication oriented. The focus was on, on performance, mainly throughput in, in downlink. The design was bottom up and it was like one dedicated network that kind of fit all of the, the use cases. This was not a, at all the, the approach uh, uh, taken for, for 5G. The 5G was actually designed to be service oriented, to be top down and providing uh, multiple virtual networks that tailors to the requirement of, of service. With this observation, um, what we noted is that there are a, a, a quite a lot of interesting emerging IT technologies that are uh, uh, providing uh, uh, very good functionalities, like for instance, software-defined networking, network function virtualization, cloud native computing, uh, mobile edge computing, and of course, uh, machine learning and, and AI. And the idea here of top down is bring this technology, this IT technology that uh, are not yet applied to the wireless, bring them to the wireless and uh, try to extend the functionalities of the of the mobile network and this is of course the, today is, is a trend that whatever technology that comes to the IT it also uh, 
sees its road towards the um, towards the uh, mobile networking. Another is also to enable rapid cloud-ready prototyping and innovations. Uh, of course, targeting uh, R and D here. Uh, this is uh, this observation and this reason is that we we noticed that uh, in the community. Uh, always there are uh, issues in terms of uh, installation problem, uh, in terms of not knowing exactly how to set up the, the whole end-to-end -end system. So with Mosaic 5G, because we took the approach, uh, the top-down approach, we wanted to, to make this uh, uh, deep prototyping and innovation faster and cloud-ready. So this is also uh, one of the reasons why we it started Mosaic 5G, and lastly but not least, is the the it is use case driven. So we, we really want to bring the idea into existence. What are the use cases that are uh, very uh, promising in the era of uh, even 4G, 5G, uh, and beyond? And we want to have them uh, demonstrated in in uh, in reality, and of course experiment and. Uh, maybe uh, even extend. So in terms of objectives, so if I want really to, to summarize, so there is 3GPP technology. We want to bring this uh, 3GPP uh, technologies uh, into uh, a white box approach, like into commodity hardware platform. So this is already uh, to the good extent achieved by uh, open air interface and other open source uh, software platform whereby the whole stack could run on a commodity uh, platforms. The softwareization is being able to decouple control plane and data plane. And this is, um, uh, let's say, already an approach that 3GPP took, but also uh, there is also a, a need for decoupling the, the, the control logic from the control plane. So this softwareization software-defined networking is another pillar that uh, we would like to, to have it in, in Mosaic 5G for, of course, for the RAN segment and for the core segment, and to certain extent for the, for the edge. The cloudification, so this uh, cloud-native um, computing is really an emerging technology whereby it really changes the way the network is, uh, deployed and it the, the way the network is uh, delivered to the end user or the end service provider so these principles of cloudification so i can just mention like uh, microservices or ci cd is quite important to to consider when uh, going forwards with 3gpp technologies data driven so uh, given that uh, the whole uh, stack is, is so softwareized it's become very easy to, to make it data-driven because the data is exposed on the North One API, and this could be consumed by many existing uh, tools uh, to, to make it uh, data-driven, like getting the data, analyzing data, mining the data, and then making uh, some predictions, some, some decisions, and then through the same uh, software-defined platform, exercise the, the control command. And finally, the openness, whereby the, the applications, the, the, the network could uh, be uh, connected to, to other third party uh, services. So in terms of uh, offering of, of Mosaic 5G, uh, we have uh, five projects. So on the bottom, on the blue, we, it's the opener interface project here we just uh, show it for the sake of uh, completeness, but also we provide the, the packaging of the opener interface uh, software in the form of a snap that you're going to see uh, later in the training session in the afternoon. So these five projects, one of them, which is uh, the project that maybe most of the members are interested in is, is the FlexRAN, is a software defined uh, radio access network platform that you see on a green. So this is the, the platform that uh, decouple 
the control plane from the data plane on the radio access network. On the left, on the right, sorry, we have LLMEC, the uh, orange uh, color, where we have a edge uh, uh, multi-axis uh, edge platform plus the core network controller. This platform manages the um, the data plane of the user on the core network part and also operates with FlexRAN when it comes to the radio network information service. So LLMEC could work in a standalone mode or could work in collaboration with uh, FlexRAN to expose a, a better Northman API to the applications. On the application, we have a concept of network store where we uh, have uh, an example of the X applications that could run either on the RAM segment or on the core or edge segment or on both. These applications, in order to facilitate the, the development of these applications and also uh, provide a, a better level of abstractions for these um, X apps, we introduced the service development kit whereby the applications could use the methods and API provided by uh, service development kit and basically be able to uh, develop the, the app. So here, as an example, we, we showed the monitoring applications, the control applications and analytic applications that are available. Each of these applications could on their turn, expose another API to the, to the third parties. And on the top, on the red, we have two platforms. Uh, historically, we were working with the Juju or uh, network function uh, uh, manager from uh, Canonical, and we de developed a, an orchestrator on the top. And more recently, we started a Cube 5G, which is a, a, a and a tool on the top of Kubernetes to fully automate the deployment of uh, 4G and 5G uh, network. Uh, and this afternoon, we are going to have four trainings. So one training uh, on the store that is going to be delivered by, by myself. And we have a, another training on FlexRAN, LLMEC, and Cube 5G that are planned for this afternoon. Just one word about the uh, li license. Uh, there is uh, open air air interface public license 1.1 which is applied to to the 4G and 5G RAN, 5G core network and also SP Gateway C and SP Gateway U on the 4G. We have three clouds BSD license for 4G MME and HSS and Apache V2 for Mosaic 5G uh, platform. So a number of uh, partners and members joined our uh, initiative and they are either monitoring or using the, uh, the, the platform. So up to now, most of the, the members uh, were the, the users of, uh, of the platform in conjunction with open air or even in a more standalone mode. There are different uh, uh, the different uh, usage pattern that we observed in the in the community and today we have more than 80 80 members that uh, signed up for the project and we hope that this number uh, increased more in terms of the sponsors we have uh, one uh, currently one uh, sponsor company like davidson consulting and the rest of the sponsors are, are Eurecom and the projects, the collaborative projects that uh, uh, make use of these software suits to show the innovations in the era of 4G, 5G and, uh, uh, and beyond. <clears throat> so I just wanted to give a word and credit the people uh, made Mosaic 5G possible and also the contributors. Currently in Eurecom, we are a team of six person that are uh, contributing to the to the code base and also strongly uh, collaborating with the team in the opener interface. 
in the past we had uh, many people also contributed to, uh, to to the code base that are not anymore at Eurocom that I, I, I have their, their names listed here. Also many partners across different type of collaboration, like I want to really mention University of Edinburgh, NTUSD from Taiwan, VTT from Finland, Poznan University in Poland, uh, University of Thessaly in Greece, RISE in Sweden, University of Bern in Switzerland, UPT, in China and University of Barcelona in, in Spain. So all of this uh, platform see the reality because all of these people uh, contributed uh, to, to the platform, to the development. In terms of the roadmap, I wanted to give you a bigger picture what, uh, what uh, we achieved across the years. As I said before, we started the uh, initiative in 2016 and um, uh, in the first release we had the uh, the first set of platform we had the 4g opener we had the llmake and, and the flex run later in 2018 and 19 uh, we worked on the concept of the store we are in, improved significantly the FlexRun platform to, to support uh, more, more features like even the uh, X apps. In 2019, we, we developed Jox and Cube5G, the, the first version. So this version of Cube5G was based on just the, the Docker component. And here we our focus was really on the orchestrations and the monitoring on the, within this year and then in, Recently, we, we worked heavily on the Kubernetes and the operator framework to significantly improve the uh, utility deployment integration of 4G and 5G network. We worked on the concept of the network store. We are going to have uh, uh, trainings on the on this all of this concept. Uh, we have also provided this uh, simulation platform, OASIM, that is, you are going to see in the afternoon that the usage of this platform is very useful uh, for R&D, for validating uh, the, the ideas and concept without uh, requiring to set up the RF platform. LLMake also has got uh, new features that we want to, to share with you later here, and also uh, OAI 5G that we, we brought it in into uh, Mosaic 5G and we are going to also sh show you and how to, to set it up very, very quickly. So now that I presented you the, 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 the project, the partners and also the, the, the roadmap, uh, so the natural question is that what we foresee as the next steps and how we could uh, uh, bring these tools to the to the next level so that it could be helpful for the community at at large. So the first announcement we would like to to share with uh, all of you at this stage is that the we are opening up all of the resources to to public uh, as of uh, January 2021. So you know that the access to the code base was restricted. There was this uh, terms that needs to, to be signed so that we, we grant the access. So now we decided that it's the right time to, to open the whole project to the, to, to the public. This means that the, the code base, the, the, the wiki and all the resources that offered by Mosaic 5G will be made uh, uh, public and uh, 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 free to access. The second announcement is that uh, we also, towards the same line, we want to uh, have the same uh, governance on both Mosaic 5G and Opener interface, which means that Mosaic 5G will become uh, another project of uh, Open Air Interface Software Alliance. This will facilitate, as I said, the governance 
of the project, the membership, uh, and all the um, all the details that are uh, there for the contributors, individual or corporate. That that all, we, all of them will be uh, merged together. The code base will will be managed under uh, the, the same uh, entity. But more importantly, the CI/CD to to maintain the, the good quality code uh, all the time and better integration across OpenAir and Mosaic 5G. So it means that whenever you you get the code, this this code is tested uh, uh, across the two 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 software projects. Lastly, but not least, as I said, we we would like to. Uh, uh, to bring these tools to the to the next step, as I mentioned before, these tools are meant for R and D. We really want to make it faster for you to prototype and uh, show the innovations from the top-down uh, approach. So, we we would like to to extend the flex run. Uh, to to the 5G, so 5G in open air is, is coming up, and we would like to uh, support this in, in the flex run uh, as well. Cube 5G, we also want to automate the whole life cycle of the 4G and 5G system using the cloud native approach, and this is where Cube 5G comes to to the picture, and also LLMEC. This is also important because if we want to have a very dynamic uh, uh, user plane function and we want that to be controlled through via the X apps, this piece of software is also important. And together we could uh, then only focus on developing the X apps and letting these platforms to work by themselves and showing the use cases only by means of uh, customization and extendability. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Nigan. Sorry to interrupt, but I do not want to steal too much time to, to other speakers. Um, maybe right. maybe uh, we, we will have definitely the possibility later in the other speech to, uh, sure. to show something forward. Um, uh, so thank you very much for the introduction You're welcome. and roadmap on, on, on Mosaic 5G. I would like now to uh, introduce you all to the next speaker, uh, Mr. Florian Kaltenberger, who is uh, an assistant professor here at Eurocom Institute and is also secretary of Open Air Interface Alliance. And he will go now and illustrate uh, Open Air Interface 5G status and uh, roadmap. Please, Florian, the floor is yours. Uh, good morning. Hello, good morning. Can you hear me well? Can you see me? We can hear you yes. and uh, see you correctly. Okay, very well. Let me share my screen here. Oh, I should go in presentation mode. Can you see the presentation? Definitely. Okay, good. Um, so anyway, I'm, um, I'm going to pick up uh, exactly where, where it left off. Um, and, uh, and, and uh, continue from there. So, so yeah, I'm very happy actually to um, the, the, for the two announcements that were that were just made. Um, so the first one that uh, that the Mosaic 5G code is going uh, is going public, um, and uh, the second announcement that um, um, Mosaic 5G, um, you know, will will be um, integrated um, into the into the Open Interface Software Alliance um, as a as a project um, next to the next to the Radio Access Network and uh, the Core Network. So I'm, I'm very happy about that. Um, it was a, a bit of a slow process, um, but um, we, we're going to get there. <clears throat> so let me let me quickly um, just say a few words about myself. So I'm Florian Kaltenberger. I'm an assistant professor here at Euricom, and I'm also the general secretary um, of the Open Interface Software Alliance. And that's that's my hat um, here for this uh, for this presentation. So um, I'm I'm representing uh, the the open interface software lines here so and so so in this presentation i want to sh um just uh, present the alliance uh, its its projects and then um show more uh, particularly the the status and the roadmap of the of the open interface 5g developments 
Okay, so where we are, uh, you, all, you all know that um, Open Interface is known for, for LTE. Um, it has a very stable LTE today. Um, 5G is, is rather new, and I want to show you where we are exactly with our, with our 5G developments. All right, so the Open Interface Software Alliance <clears throat> was, uh, was launched in um, 2014 as an endowment fund. So it's, a, um, it's, a, it's an entity that uh, allows to receive donations. Um, so all of the, the strategic members that, uh, that are here um, on, this, on this slide today, they are um, actively contributing, uh, they're, they're giving donations, regular donations to the, to the Alliance. Um, and these donations allow us to um, to support the development of open air interface to support and support the com community at large. Um, so um, through um, workshops and 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 other activities, but mostly um, through the the CI CD um, work that that they're doing. So so the alliance today is responsible um, for the. Um, for the continuous integration. Um, so today, when you um, when a, a merge request is created uh, created into the Open Interface code, it will go through a bunch of, of CI um, tests. So this is maintained by by the alliance, <clears throat> and they're also helping with um, um, with a lot of other um, um, items. And um, last but not least, the, the Open Interface Alliance is also there to, to, to promote the, the licensing model of Open Interface. So Navid has already mentioned it, um, Open Interface um, Iran and now also the core, the 5G core, have a unique uh, licensing model, which is the Open Interface um, public license version 1.1. Um, which is um, based on Apache, uh, but has some extensions that are that were necessary um, because of of 3GPP because you know 3GPP is very um, uh, patent driven and so we needed a clause um, that allows users to contribute code without having to um, relinquish their, their their rights to the patents. Okay, so uh, there are several, as I said already, and as David said, there, there are several projects, the, the, the three big projects in, in, the, in the alliance. One is the radio access network, so that includes both LTE and 5G, uh, 5G and R. Um, so E node B, UE, G node B and R UE, and uh, several other, other tools. And all of these are available um, openly at the, at the, the GitLab, um, at the Eurocom GitLab server that is here. There's the core network as well. Um, so this is split in several repositories. Uh, the MME and HSS are, are um, as well as the, the SP Gateway C, SP Gateway U are on GitHub Hub. And the 5G development is, is um, um, partially on, on GitLab and, and partially on GitHub. And now um, in, the, in the future, we'll, um, Mosaic 5G will be a project um, will be also a, a part of a, an Alliance project. Um, so Navid has already mentioned the, the licensing, so I don't need to spend much more, much more time on this. <clears throat> so let me go uh, in the interest of time also, right into the status and the roadmap for, for 5G new radio. Um, so you see already here on this slide that um, 5G new radio is um, really a collaborative project so i have included here the the logos of all the uh, the teams that have contributed to the code um so far um so it's quite a large number of of, of teams um uh, which is good but which is also a challenge um, for the lines because all of these contributions need to be coordinated and uh, and integrated um so the different development phases um, are, are depicted here. So you know that uh, 5G has um, uh, two basic deployment modes. Um, one is this, the so-called non-standalone mode, or, or more precisely, the, the EUTRAN NR dual connectivity, um, which, is, uh, which is the mode which is currently being deployed by most of the operators, um, which um, um, still is based on the, on the 4G core network, the EPC. And requires also uh, that the phone is covered by by a 4G cell by an E node B, and the 
the 5G cell um, is is um, basically is connected over X2 um, and acts as a as a as a slave um, to the to the master, which is the E node B. So a phone first needs to connect to the E node B, and basically all the configuration of the 5G cell is done. All the control plane goes over the over the 4G link. Um, there's also uh, so this is actually what we what um, in um, in the lines we we call the phase two of the development, um, but there was also a phase one um, which is still um, active and still available, um, which was an intermediate mode, um, which is basically an evolution of of what was called the NOS one mode in LTE, so it allows you to use the the G B and the OIUE only um, together standalone. Um, without the core network or without the ENOB. And now currently we're working on, on standalone. Um, so uh, there have been the, the, the work currently on the, on, the, on the radio part of the GNOB is, is ongoing and I'll say a few words about it later. And uh, 5G uh, core has the first version has been released already and, and work, uh, but work continues here. So um, regarding the status of the development today. Um, so we basically, as I said, we have the first release of, um, uh, of the non-standalone code. It works with, a, with an off-the-shelf phone um, since August 2020. So uh, we can have a relatively stable connection with a few pings. Uh, the, the traffic is not, um, let's say, uh, huge yet. So, so the traffic is limited to a few uh, megabits per second. Um, but that is, that is um, currently being, being improved. Uh, so what, what works today is FR1 DDD with 30 kilohertz subcarrier spacing and 40 megahertz bandwidth, size of single user. And um, you should also note that there's no split bearer. So basically the traffic is redirected to the 5G cell. So once the UE connects um, and goes into 5G mode, um, the, the core, there's a path switch um, at the level of the core and all the traffic will go over the all the, the user plane traffic will go over the, the 5G cell. Um, and as I said, the, yeah, the NOS one mode is, is also there. Um, that allows you to, to uh, test the OIUE to, together with the GNOTB and also pass some, some traffic. Um, a word on the, on the functional splits uh, that are in the, in the 5G GNOTB. Um, so we have um, adapted the, the 5G FAPI just like in LTE. Um, we have adapted the 5G FAPI as an interface between the MAC um, and the FI. Um, and currently, um, N FAPI is under integration. So, FAPI itself is just a functional interface that defines the, the messages and the, um, and the procedures, um, but still um, requires you that both of them are in the, in the same machine, uh, same, in the same process. NFAPI allows you to physically separate the two over a network and uh, allow a connection over the network. So this is currently under integration. We have a, a frontal network too. Um, this is uh, now all on 7.2. Today it's user plane only. So this was done work done with Benetel. Um, so Benetel is a manufacturer of RAUs that you can see here. Um, and the other uh, planes, uh, synchronization plane and control plane um, will be done um, 2021. F1 is also available, well, is, is under integration, is, is partially available already. Um, so that, that, that will also happen um, in 2021. Um, I already said about limitations, so let me, in the interest of time, move forward. Um, so the roadmap for non-standalone is, um, well, first of all, to improve the throughput. Um, so. I saw that this was November. I said put the miles in November 2020. We're not quite there yet, uh, but we did get a bit closer um, to have a full throughput in uh, on 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 40 megahertz. Um, so probably this uh, this target two will will shift a little bit too to get the full throughput on on 80 megahertz. Um, we're also working uh, quite intensively on on FR2 frequency range two millimeter wave, um, which requires support for beam forming. Um, so they're quite of uh, uh, beamforming um, adds a, a layer of complexity. So there are a lot of new procedures that need to be done, like initial access, CSI feedback, TCI states. 
So that's all um, under integration. And we, we really want to have FR2 interoperability as well by the end of the year. Multi-user scheduling is under integration and hopefully by the end of the year, we can schedule at least two users. As I said, the NFAP is split is in, under integration and there will also be MIMO support um, that's actually contributed by one uh, by Fraunhofer at this, at this point in time. Now, I'm hurrying up uh, to the to the standalone part. So, stand, work on standalone part has, has started already um, at the end of summer, beginning of autumn. Um, so today there are quite a few uh, pieces already available. Um, for example, the RSC and the NGAP is already available. Um, and actually, there are, there are testers today um, that can test uh, these two individually without the, 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 the DO uh, part at the, at the bottom. Um, there have been some um, um, work already on, on fine Mac. So what is different in standalone at these layers is that now we have to support the complete uh, initial access on these layers. So the initial access in non-standalone mode is, is a bit simplified. Um, but in SA, we have to do the full initial access and including transmission of system information, um, which is currently under um, under testing. Um, yeah, which which also includes um, you know a different configuration of the bandwidth parts and the, and the core sets. Okay. Yeah, what is um, important to note as well, we have a commitment also for standalone to have a fully functional UE. So remember for, for non-standalone, uh, the OER UE is not um, fully functional. So the, the only this, this um, you can only use it in this noise one mode with the G0B. Uh, you can't have the dual connectivity. Um, but for 5G, we have a commitment to, to uh, provide a fully functional UE and eventually to also be uh, compliant with, um, with commercial networks to a limited extent, like we have done with the, with the LTE. Um, so that's, uh, that's currently ongoing. And for example, what we can do already with the 5G UE is, is receive the system information and uh, initiate the initial access. Um, so the timeline for this, um, basically, by the um, we, we want to have a you know an initial prototype at least with the OEI UE until the end of the year, and in parallel we're also working with um, interoperability with um, with um, off-the-shelf phones. It's a bit more tricky for a standalone um, than for non-standalone. The devices are um, most of the devices according to the technical specifications do support standalone but it's in many phones it's not activated you need special firmware from the operator to activate it um, but we have found some modules like for example from quacktail that are a bit more promising that that seem to be more open so we're currently in fact doing interoperability testing with um with this quacktail module and also with the simcom uh, module um, further along the road, we're planning to support MIMO, as I said, URLC, um, time-sensitive networking, uh, as I said, full ORAN frontal support. There's also a project uh, that will start 2021 for non-terrestrial networks. So there's actually a, a prototype planned um, that uses open interface for uh, in, in a satellite environment. And we're also planning to have um, 5G, uh, sorry, the, um, this is also part of all around this, this E2 interface. Um, so we're planning to, to include that. Um, how much time do I have left? You have still three minutes, Mark. Okay, good. Just enough to present the two remaining slides on the 5G core. So um, this is not my specialty. Uh, so I just have two slides here to summarize the status. Um, so again, this is a joint project. Uh, the main contributors so far are Eurocom, BUPT, and, and BCOM. Um, it's available. So the first release was done about um, a month ago. Um, so the, the AMF, SMF, and UPF are already available. Um, and they, they support the basic call flows, so the connection and registration procedures, UE, registration, deregistration service request, and um, excuse me, basic session, session management. And all of these have also been tested with a, with a commercial tester. So that's actually part of the CI CD framework. Um, 
So first of all, they can run in, in Docker containers and they have been validated with, uh, with a DS tester, which is a commercial tester, uh, which basically emulates the, the 5G uh, radio network, including the UEs. Okay, so that's, um, that's the current status. So phase one, that's, that's now, that has been released, uh, AMF, SMF, and UPF. Phase two is ongoing um, with, a, with a planned release in, uh, in spring or the end of spring, beginning of spring uh, 2021. Uh, that includes also the UDM, uh, AUSF and NRF functions. And um, by the time, of course, we'll also um, have validated, uh, we'll also have the, 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 the 5G radio network ready to, um, to integrate and validate it together with that. Um, and then phase three um, towards um, more and more towards uh, 2021, uh, 2022, sorry, um, having the full, um, you know, core implementation with all the, the remaining uh, functions here uh, that you see in this picture. Um, that's, that's planned for the, uh, for the longer term. All right, so that concludes what I prepared. Thank you very much. Um, if you have questions, I didn't, uh, check the chat here. Um, I don't know, Bruno, if you no, if there are questions no in the question chat. Were, no questions were asked during your presentation, but definitely if there are some emerging questions later for uh, somebody who even joined maybe later, you, we will definitely I, have time to, to discuss them. Yeah, I have to say that um, I can't attend the, the full workshop. I'll be around for another um, half an hour maybe. So maybe uh, if there are an urgent question Maybe now. they can send it directly to, to you on the chat. So direct messages. So maybe you can even, you can also answer them on, on the chat. Okay, or all right. I'll stay connected chat. and then look out for the chat. So thank you. Thank you very much, Florian, for, for your intervention. Um, I would like to uh, introduce you to the next speaker, uh, Mari Sardash, who is um, uh, E2E end-to-end so -end architecture manager in Orange, Romania. Uh, also the part of the 5G program manager for uh, 5G NSA, uh, SA network development and uh, Telco Cloud's uh, IAAS implementation that is involved in many Horizon uh, 2020 research and development activities and actions, including, as of today, uh, 5G Victory, uh, acting as uh, Orange Romania technical responsible for infrastructure development and deployment and use cases integration in the uh, proposed 5G ecosystem. Uh, Marius, good morning. The floor is yours. Good morning and um, hello everyone. Um, we are happy to, to introduce um, our uh, projects and activities related to the open source 5G platform that we are using here in uh, Orange Romania with the support of the, of the consortium. And today with my uh, colleague, Christian Pasakia, we will um, have a brief uh, view about our 5G Victory project, the vertical that we will experiment in uh, Romania using, as I said, open source 5G platforms. So the brief agenda will be the introduction of our um, Orange Romania innovation ecosystem. We will detail the key objectives of the 5G victory and of course the innovation cases. We will describe the 5G victory use cases and we will stay focused on the Romanian use cases that will be supported by Mosaic 5G. And of course we will have a short view of the Romanian uh, cluster facility implementation, of course supported by, uh, uh, by France uh, infrastructure. Uh, this is a city where, uh, in Alba Iulia, that is a focused on our uh, uh, use case, where we will implement it, we will implement in fact the, the two use cases and we will dem demonstrate based on the Mosaic 5G or open air interfaces, we will uh, we'll demonstrate uh, two use cases in a real life uh, environment offered to the municipality. Um, as a um, research and development ecosystem, as it was mentioned, we are um, well involved in different R&D Horizon 2020 uh, projects. Um, as you can see on the screen, uh, part of them um, supported by, uh, by Mosaic 5G, uh, uh, mentioning 5G Victory or 5G EVE uh, that are ongoing projects or already uh, uh, finished project, Matilda and SliceNet, where we have done the use case uh, demonstration using, in fact, the open air interface platform. Um, this, uh, this open environment, in fact, is supported in, uh, in Orange Romania 
by the building of 5G Open Lab here in uh, in Bucharest, uh, an Open Lab that in fact is uh, uh, is providing a use cases uh, platform to prove the 5G and IoT uh, benefits. And 5G Open Lab open for different proof of concept, definition, validation, and of course uh, deployment of the uh, use cases, supported by an uh, infrastructure and, and engineering team that are providing these uh, capabilities and uh, and benefits, and also an open uh, 5G lab that is supported by Horizon Europe uh, collaboration, uh, including uh, our uh, our project. In uh, going back to the uh, project uh, 5G Victory project, we have to 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 mention that this project is designed to to prototype an open 5G infrastructure capable capable of instantiating different uh, vertical uh, sector. Sectors. This integration, in fact, is um, based on um, the request of do of doing commercial relevant operational environments uh, in a large variety of use cases, and doing this uh, um, demonstration uh, based on uh, different vertical cross uh, uh, cross uh, cross use cases. The main uh, use cases that will be will be demonstrated in in the project, in fact, are uh, media and entertainment, are based on the energy, transportation, and the smart factory. Five G victory concepts, in fact, um, are are focused on uh, inter interconnecting different main sites, as it is an ICT nineteen uh, project is based on uh, several ICT seventeen uh, infrastructure as. 5G Vini, 5G Genesis, 5G Eve, and 5G UK testbed. Uh, mentioning in fact that uh, in our uh, in our case in Romania, our is Romania use case, we will will base our de development, deployment, and demonstration using the the 5G Eve uh, concept and infrastructure. Also, 5G Eve uh, Victory platform aims to transform the current almost closely closed the purpose developed and to dedicate this uh, this infrastructure to uh, into an open environment for uh, different 5g uh, testing also providing a thin interdomain orchestration on top of already existing in, uh, orchestration solution that exists at this moment for the each individual site uh, facility also 5g victory uh, is aiming to develop an open data management platform for different scalable data collection, aggregation, and process, processing across um, um, the various project uh, infrastructure sites that have been uh, mentioned. As a brief uh, picture, these are the main uh, cluster of the 5G Victory, supported, as I said, by the 5G UK, 5G Genesis, 5G Eve, and 5G uh, Vini, uh, aiming to exploit this ICT 17 5G infrastructure interconnecting main sites, in fact, of this uh, already existing infrastructure and providing uh, by case different uh, minor enhancement of the existing infrastructure in order to demonstrate the, the verticals and cross verticals use cases proposed in the project. One of the most important uh, concept of this, uh, of this project is in fact the 5G victory functional architecture that is based in fact, um, on the cross facility vertical network and services for the use cases, uh, for the project uh, use cases, and doing through a multi site and multi uh, site, multi site inventory, multi site orchestrator, the per each facility uh, service resource and site orchestrator. In fact, <clears throat> introducing a 5G BIOS that is a general portal component that should work with each and every uh, ICT-17 um, uh, facilities orchestrator in order to provide the service deployment in a very friendly uh, way on each uh, uh, cluster that will be, will be deployed. Um, the main uh, use cases in, uh, in 5G Victory are based on um, enhanced mobile broadband under high speed mobility in the vertical of transportation and rail, digital mobility like uh, cross vertical transportation and media use cases, critical services for a railway system in a vertical rail, uh, smart energy uh, metering as a cross vertical between uh, energy and rail, digitization of power plants as a vertical between uh, 
uh, as a vertical of a smart factory. And in the end, the CDN services in the statics and mobile environment as a cross vertical between uh, media and uh, transportation. Each of the use cases, uh, of these use cases are, um, are highlighted in the, in the presentation. And of course are provided per each site facility that will be, that are, are in fact under uh, development in this, uh, in, this, uh, in this case. Um, in 5G Victory, we will stay focused on Romanian use cases that are supported by uh, Mosaic 5G. Briefly, the introduction of these uh, uh, use cases. In fact, there are two main uh, use cases, the media service use cases that will be developed through the support of uh, 5G EVE in Alba Iulia municipality, the city in uh, Romania that will um, uh, support us in implementing and demonstrating experimentation, doing the experimentation of these uh, uh, use cases. And in fact, it will be an infotainment video service in dense, static and mobile um, um, environment, providing, the, providing in fact, real time infotainment services that will be delivered to the uh, municipality and public, of course, um, providing to the uh, tourist or the, or the public different uh, surveys, alerts, or tourist uh, information uh, using a captive portal that will be uh, connected through the 5G infrastructure to the Alba Iulia Municipality Public Traffic Management Center for real-time uh, communication. In this uh, use case implementation, um, the users, in fact, will be uh, connected through a 5G a network to this application as a status and um, uh, uh, as a status of this uh, implementation, in fact, we can say that the testbed components, configuration and test, set, test scenarios have been already uh, evaluated. We have performed different size surveys determining the facility requirements in terms of device location, radio site deployments, the radio design and coverage. To, to do next the portal application deployment, the end-to-end -end infrastructure deployment supported by Mosaic 5G and of course including a 5G EVE integration and doing the demonstration in Alba Iulia municipality. The second um, application of the use case, it will be based on an artificial intelligence recognition and identification of emerging situation. Emerging situation means, uh, meaning in fact, um, um, that we'll apply this use case inside a public bus, identifying um, uh, uh, um, emerging situation that will be, will happen in, uh, in the bus. Uh, based on a face recognition algorithm running in, um, in a 5G in environment, um, analyzing uh, different images collected from cameras installed in the public uh, buses, track, tracking events on board and routes of public buses via these uh, video feeds, and of course, triggering uh, alerts in case of different uh, emergency situations that will be uh, identified. This use case, of course, is intensive uh, related to the network uh, uh, requirement. And of course, for this, we have al already provided the testbed components configuration and evaluating the, the, the test uh, scenarios. Also, we have performed the public transport sur survey for the use case deployment and uh, different equipment acquisition in order to, to, to provide the end-to-end -end, uh, uh, implementation. Uh, expecting uh, further to, to, to do the end-to-end -end infrastructure deployment, including uh, the 5G integration, uh, as it is our uh, ICT-17 support based on Mosaic 5G uh, components. Um, the third uh, application um, for, this, uh, for this use case will be, in fact, the prioritization of the communication to the command and control center. In fact, when a, an emergency situation it, it will be uh, identified, um, the traffic flow for this uh, uh, video uh, uh, streaming will be uh, prioritized, uh, mainly in the run part, uh, using this uh, Mosaic 5G components as it has been already presented in a previous uh, uh, presentation uh, through the flex run in 5G uh, environment, and this, will, uh, and this will come. And also <clears throat> this use case um, through the end-to-end -end integration deployment will be demonstrated in the real live uh, uh, environment. The second 
um, the second use case it's in fact it's a real time low voltage energy metering uh, as a service for um, uh, des designed for different point of uh, uh, interest in fact um, we expect to to collect uh, different uh, data collection uh, in the city and this uh, collect uh, measurements uh, will be transferred in fact to the 5g victory uh, will be in fact uh, sorry uh, the slides didn't uh, didn't move ah, we are on the right side right now sorry so <clears throat> going back to this uh, to this uh, use case uh, the second it's about uh, low voltage uh, energy metering across um, alba Iulia municipal, municipal, municipality uh, uh, city in fact collecting um, low voltage um, uh, data from a different uh, collection point and providing uh, this uh, data into a process and um, of course they will be analyzed by the telemetry uh, platform uh, in fact this is an iot massive machine type communication iot use case supported by by mosaic uh, 5g um, the second application of this uh, use case <clears throat> It will be the um, energy analytics for predictive and proactive man maintenance for the designated points that we'll take into uh, consideration. The energy analytics and application dev development for this real time and historical reporting of the status and uh, uh, and parameters, uh, real time energy aud audit, and why not potential fraud uh, fraud detection. This uh, will provide to the municipality the advantage of a, a report about usage, running cycles and times, operational status of different low voltage devices that will be uh, implemented, that will be uh, developed. And all this information will be, pro, uh, will be offered to the municipality through a visualization graphic portals and reports based on the energy sensors and the data that will be collected from the, from the infrastructure. In this scenario, the site surveys for doing this uh, use case are already um, uh, are already done. We are in the phase of testing and validation the initial uh, services per uh, each of these uh, per each of these uh, use cases in uh, Orange Romania uh, laboratory. And the next step will be to do this uh, France Romania cluster facility implementation. And of course, uh, uh, planning based on the use case requirements and the, the platform capabilities. As a short summary, um, these use cases are based on open air interface, 5G software or alliance, Mosaic 5G and in relation with the uh, with the um, uh, service and uh, site orchestrator, we expect to use uh, uh, on app. We expect to implement the use cases and the application uh, based on the times and plan that we will we have already uh, set uh, using in the beginning the 5G NSA option 3x um, following the lab uh, validation and uh, further doing different network slice design installing commission or configuration the proper configuration for each service and network slice in order to, to provide the required, required capabilities from the uh, infrastructure uh, pers perspective. In fact, extending um, the 5G EVE capabilities in, uh, in 5G uh, victory, the France, uh, the France uh, cluster supported by Orange France and uh, Eurecom to Romanian cluster in Alba Iulia municipality for this 5G victory uh, implementation. Different activities will be uh, provided, including the extension of 5G infrastructure and testbed integration with, uh, with our pl uh, project platform for uh, experimentation. The test network will have to carry different, in fact, networks and service resources configuration in order to demonstrate and to implement the, the two use cases. Um, we will integrate, and in fact, we are in the pro process of integrating different component different architectural components uh, mainly in uh, in terms of uh, open air interface uh, mosaic 5g and uh, orchestration of these uh, components then um, um, as activities we have to move uh, the experimental methodology and guidelines supported by uh, the the cluster it's uh, in fact implemented in sofia antipolis or uh, or paris in uh, in our infrastructure in order to validate the integration of the use case and the experimentation of the use case in uh, in romania 
the high level architecture view, it will look like a 5G virus portal that has been uh, introduced, connected to a Paris or Sofia Antipolis uh, orchestration uh, tool through an IPsec connection to, to Bucharest facility. And then in Alba Iulia municipality, we will run the 4G run and VPC and the 5G run in the beginning in the NSA configuration, following in fact, not only the extension of the ICT 17 5G project, but also implementing the 5G NSA option 3X from the Mosaic 5G uh, repository, implementing this 5G core and run uh, uh, snap, snap, as you can see on the, on the picture in the architecture, using in fact the USRP N310 uh, family, that will be, in fact, our E node B and our G node B in this scenario. The second phase, the second step will be to implement the services and the same uh, architecture view, but using the standalone um, uh, infrastructure. Very briefly, uh, the two use cases for the digital mobility is expected to deploy using the 5G VIOS uh, portal to deploy the two, the two services for the ultra reliable low latency communication or uh, EMBB, as it can be seen on the, on the slide in case we will identify uh, a problem in the, in the, bu in the bus, the, the red slice, the video analytics will be prioritized mainly in the run part because in the run part we faced uh, we are facing uh, issues and in this uh, scenario this video analytics will be delivered in a proper condition to the command and control center that will in fact will uh, will take any decision uh, further the second use case will be also to deploy a simple use case in this uh, in this scenario uh, from the 5g vios uh, uh, platform a massive machine type communication use case that will uh, provide access of the low voltage metering devices and sensors through IoT gateway to, um, to a telemetry platform, giving the possibility to the municipality to, um, uh, to have real time data and analysis of this, um, of this uh, application. Next activities uh, in this, uh, for this use case implementation and uh, demonstration will be to, to deploy, to finish and to deploy the run and core uh, based on Mosaic 5G in an NSA uh, scenario because we, ha we have already all the hardware required and we have validated this, uh, this hardware that it's already installed and deployed in the Bucharest running at the moment we are speaking the Mosaic 5G components in terms of uh, run 4G and the virtual EPC, MME, HSS, S and uh, SP gateway. And after all this configuration in uh, uh, 5G NSA 3X will be uh, implemented and uh, validated in, in the lab, we will move the facility to the, uh, and the infrastructure to Alba Iulia. And uh, we will provide in fact the real uh, live environment to connect the devices and the sensor to these um, uh, applications. Um, we will use for this scenario uh, Orange Romania uh, license spectrum uh, uh, for the 4G LTE anchoring. Uh, we will use uh, B1, uh, 5 megahertz in B1. And for uh, uh, 5G uh, NR, we'll use uh, band N78 and we'll provide up to 1 megahertz uh, spectrum in order to support the EMBB requirements and video analytics requirements in terms of traffic, uh, in terms of traffic performance. As a plan, uh, we are now in the moment of um, validating the functionalities in the lab. Uh, also, we are facing some challenges due to this COVID situation and we are restricted to, to, to travel to Alba Iulia municipality to, to deploy the infrastructure in the real uh, environment. But we expect to, to continue this uh, implementation to do the test KPI validation and features of the use cases. Um, as in uh, beginning of the next year in Q1 2021, uh, hoping to, to have the use cases implemented and integrated in Alba Iulia municipality, um, maybe in the first, uh, in the first um, uh, implementation 
uh, all these components to be uh, manually onboarded and uh, deployed. And the second phase to do it uh, automatically through the service flight orchestrator using uh, a cluster orchestrator in our case, uh, in our case uh, on up. Thank you for- Thank you very uh, much, uh, Mr. Yordash. Thank you, Thank you very time. much to you. Sorry for interrupting, but we, 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 have, we have short time. Just to let you know, if you check in the chat, there are some questions for your interventions by Chu Niu from Tiam uh, Research and Development Malaysia. So maybe you can you can answer them uh, privately in the chat so that you, you, you can have a separate yeah. discussion. Yeah, and we will I would answer in the chat. Thank you. Okay, I would uh, kindly ask you even to you and to Florian and to all of the other next speakers to share with us uh, the slides because later they will be shared on our uh, website and they will be shared on our final recordings for uh, all of the participants that maybe couldn't join. So you could share with uh, them with me straight on the chat uh, by linking a private file or either sending us an email if you, if, if you need one. So I will move on to the next speaker uh, that is Mr. Thomas Dreipholz. Um, he is uh, uh, a chief researcher engineer at Simula Metropolitan uh, Center for Resilient Networks and Applications, uh, and he will be talking about custom-made announced packet cores as network services for 4G, 5G test beds uh, managed with open source MANO. Good morning, Thomas. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, can you see my slides now? Yes. Okay, then uh, welcome to my presentation this morning. Custom made enhanced packet cores as network service for 4G, 5G test beds managed with open source MANO. So I will first shortly introduce the idea of our work and our goal, and then come to, um, to some basic 4G, 5G test bed setups to be realized with our virtual network function uh, to get uh, an instantiation of an enhanced packet core. And uh, particular order, I will briefly give you an overview or some interesting details, which may be useful for you. And finally, I would like to present a short live demo showing you the components of our setup. Well, uh, first, um, of course, what is the idea? Uh, the idea is, of course, to set up 4G, 5G test beds, particularly to do research on different topics, for example, mobile edge computing or network slicing or enhancing functionalities of the mobile broadband uh, packet core. So you need, in fact, some user equipment, some program on the SIM cards, and some uh, software defined radio boards. So this is the required hardware. But um, the software you need is in fact based on open interface. So it's open source, it runs on regular Linux PCs. So it is not uh, a big challenge to uh, uh, realize such a mobile broadband testbed setup, for example, for small research projects. But the software is uh, somewhat difficult to install and maintain, particularly for, for example, students. So the idea is to uh, make this much easier by having first the packet core, the enhanced packet core of open air interface realized as a virtual network function, which is then to be managed by open source man management orchestration framework of Etsy. It's also an open source project. And particularly the idea is, of course, that you can get a customized enhanced packet core with this VNF. That is, you specify the exact uh, Git repository and commit of each of the packet core's components. And then upon the day one configuration of the VNF, the instance of the VNF, everything is uh, compiled from scratch according to your needs. This, in fact, you just then specify what kind of packet core you need and combine the VNF to other features of your testbed setup, for example, at uh, mobile edge computing resources or do some setup with a flex run to use uh, network slicing. So basically what you set up is an enhanced packet core consisting of MME, HSS, SPGW, U, and SPGWC. 
quite obvious, so I do not need to do many more introduction. And the idea is, of course, then to use open source menu to instantiate the components of this enhanced packet core into a network function virtualization infrastructure, NFVI, uh, usually in the form of open stack. But uh, of course, uh, open source menu also supports other virtualization platforms, for example, also uh, vSphere and others. So uh, what do we need to use uh, our VNF? We need a base video image. Video is virtual deployment unit. This is uh, the virtual machine instantiating a part of the VNF. I come to this on the next slide. Then you need obviously the VNF itself and some Judo charms to configure the components and um, also some help of build scripts. First, uh, you need the base video image as the operating system installation to be installed, for example, into OpenStack or any other NFVI. Uh, since we want to build the, the components from scratch, from the sources, by compiling them, of course, it does not really make sense to use a standard uh, Ubuntu cloud image. It is uh, useful to have it um, customized a little bit, for example, to add uh, another PPA with additional packages, do some keyboard layout setup, particularly in known English countries, do some uh, other pre-configurations and particularly install, of course, tools like compilers and debugging tools. And I automated this creation of video images using a tool Packer which makes automated installations of operating systems and creates images from them in different underlying uh, virtualization infrastructures. And uh, these uh, scripts do this for Ubuntu 16.04 to 20.04 LTS. So in fact, everything you need to run open interface. And of course, also uh, Mosaic actually sources as well. So then uh, this is the overview of our VNF. So quite obvious, it has four videos, one video for each component of the EPC, MB, SHS, SPGWC, and SPGWU. So um, basically you will get this when you use our VNF. You just need to specify the necessary parameters, necessary parameters obviously are the parameters of the mobile network you want to create, but particularly also for each of the four components, Git, reposit Git repository and uh, commit. That is then they want instantiation and the one configuration of the VNF instance gets you a tailor-made EPC setup according to your needs. For example, in this example here, it uses um, the sources of uh, Mosaic 5G. That is, you get a Mosaic 5G setup of the EPC, for example, to use it with FlexRAN for slicing. Well, um, important thing to mention is uh, when you use open source menu, you have to think about how to build everything. You have to build VNF packages, you have to use um, these packages in finally specifying a network service and finally instantiate a network service. So we have a lot of jumble files, files for VNFs, for network services, and uh, Juju proxy charm code, Python code, and a helper library. So um, doing the build process manually is, of course, quite inconvenient. It's easy to do steps in the wrong order or forget something. So initially we just used a make file for making this more automated. But finally, the solution is to use CMake with the help of Git to get information about all the relevant files and then let CMake write make files to actually build everything. So to build a network service as well as all the dependencies 
for the network services, particularly our VNF, possibly other VNFs as well. But I will not go into too much of these details here. Instead, I would like to present you a small live demo. And for this, I have to change the screen sharing to show you the desktop. Just a moment. Just a moment. You should now see my desktop screen. Can you confirm that you can see my desktop screen now? Yeah, we can, definitely. There is some window flickering. Oh, it has something. Okay, now. So this is the user interface of Open Source Menno. And you see in this case, there are five instances of network services. Four of these instantiate packet cores, and there is another instance instantiating a network service for a Flexron controller, which is then connected to two different uh, packet cores with a, five, a five, Mosaic 5G setup. We have also another project uh, called CloudRun, which is um, then uh, using a cloud. Uh, based uh, radio setup in uh, two different variants and a simple test uh, setup for testing the regular open air interface EPC. And what open source Menno does is in fact to instantiate everything based on uh, the provided uh, or the created video base images, which are as I've mentioned, uh, different versions of Ubuntu with some additional installation of uh, necessary build tools. And um, then, of course, as I've said, for each of the packet cores, you get four videos. And there's another video for a Flexron controller. Well, and um, if you use this, for example, you can log into open source manual machine. And um, for example, I go into one of the components. Just pressing an SSH connection. And um, what uh, Juju also does is some helpful configuration to make it a little bit more comfortable for the researcher to work interactively with these machines, for example, we get a prominent uh, view of a banner of uh, what component you're logging in. Otherwise, it's easy to mix up different components. So in this case, of course, obviously, you know, you are logged in into the SPGWU and um, can also directly open log in, see all the IP addresses. And there are some service scripts already pre-installed, for example, to look at the current log file of this component. So in fact, um, you can get quite easily a setup of the packet core with some uh, helpful pre-configuration of the software installed into the components as the videos, as well as uh, some helpful tools also pre-installed for helping debugging the setup. So I go back to the slides for the conclusion, just a moment. Uh, a lot of windows open, just a moment. Uh, can you see my slides now again? Yes, they are in presenter mode, but we can. Yes, we, can see, we see your slide. Uh, this should not be 
copy and presenter mode. Okay, uh, if I, it's uh, just a single slide. So um, obviously our system that is our VNF and all the build scripts are open source. So you can find them in our Git repository, particularly also with some documentation and uh, helpful information about our VNF and uh, the corresponding scripts to help instantiating VNF as well as building the uh, VDU image. So I come to the conclusion. Thank you for your attention. And um, there is probably short moment for questions or you can of course also ask questions in the chat. Thanks a lot, uh, uh, Thomas, for the intervention. So there is one question for from uh, Professor Nigan, if you see in the chat, uh, he is asking whether you use the Mosaic 5G snaps to build uh, run or CN images, or you just build the images directly from the source code. Uh, the images are directly built from source code. So that is, you get uh, your um, components directly compiled from the source code. So you do not need to download uh, fixed uh, snaps. Then, of course, you can particularly specify your own Git repositories with your own changes, for example, bug fixes or extensions. Okay, thanks a lot for your answer there. Uh, I cannot see any other questions for the moment in the chat, uh, but if you will still be connected with us and there will be any, any more questions, we will then more than pleased to, to, to ask them to you and, to, and for you to answer them. Thank you very much. Good, of course. Um, and, and of course, I'm also yeah. waiting for the email for further questions. Okay, good. Um, just a reminder for all of you, uh, that it would be nice to receive all of your uh, slides as we will publish them on the uh, on the on the website and we will be more than happy uh, to to share them and to share the contacts with all of you so that there is some more uh, questions based on participants that won't be able to join today uh, that can be asked and, and answered later um so there is um, uh, the next speaker who is uh, Carlos Herans Claveras and uh, is um, basically um, a senior researcher at I2CAT Foundation in uh, Barcelona, Spain. He holds a PhD degree in telecommunications engineering uh, from the Polytechnic University of Valencia, uh, Spain, and he has been conducting research on wireless and cellular networks uh, for over 10 years. And in the last two years, his main research was on to 5G run. Hi, Carlos. Uh, can you hear us? Welcome. The floor is yours. Hi, Bruno. Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. Can you hear me? Uh, we can hear you correctly. OK, thank you. So yes, as Bruno said, my name is Carlos Arant, and I am a senior run researcher at the Mobile Wireless Internet Group at iTucat Foundation. I will share my screen if I, I, I am sh sharing my screen now. No, probably not. Not at the moment. Yes, okay. Should be now. Good. Can you see it now? Yes. So as I was saying, <laughs> I am a senior run researcher on the wireless mobile inter internet group at iTucat Foundation. And before starting my presentation, I would like to express our gratitude to the organizers for having us here to talk about how do we envision the automation of an open interface cellular deployment with NetConf and also with Blockchain. But first of all, I would like to provide some background on our activities uh, related to the cellular networks in general, but and also in, with Mosaic 5G in particular. So I took at Foundation is a public research center based in Barcelona. And we conduct research with many technologies related to it, with the with the internet, and that's including that includes wireless and also cellular networks. We develop a run manager called Raccoon to configure wireless nodes and also collect data from the network. Raccoon started with Wi-Fi and a single LTE vendor, but we are in extending it and to, to incorporate more and more 4G and 4G solutions. 
Raccoon is also aimed to configure run slices and map them to services or network slices. So in the near future, we aim at integrating FlexRun to configure open interface cells and manage the run slices. So currently, we have an open interface based cellular physical test bed, which consists of an open interface in OD running on an Intel NUC with a USB, USB B210 from, from ASUS. The testbed is aimed at showing multi operator core network, MOCAN. And so we can connect up to six core networks to the cell, and each core network would, would belong to a different operator with a unique PLM and ID. Different COTS UEs are proper revision with a SIM card from any of these network operators will be able to connect to the cell. In our testbed, each operator may be allocated to exclusive PRBs or run slices. So we can define a quota of resources for each operator through flex run. So in example of the right, you can see that we have two operators that we, and we, they will deploy dedicated run slices. The first operator will define some, some space in the, in the cell bandwidth. And the other one, with different, you can see that we can have different uh, downlink and uplink shirts. They don't need to be exactly the same one. This is an by flex one. And the second operator could have a different uh, run slice. We also config can configure a common run slice area for you initial attachment procedures. So and this is also a transitionary area where UEs will be allocated when, this, when they complete the attachment procedure. We created a control app to move UEs from the common run slice to the one belonging to the to the operator. The control app only takes actions if the slicing is activated. In Flex Run, each run slice has a label attribute, and we control and and the control app can map this label to the to a given PLM and set of PLM and IDs, naming the MCC and also the MMC of each connected UE. The control app periodically looks for new UEs in the common area, in the common run slice, to relocate to it to any of the dedicated PLM and, uh, PLM and ID run slices. If, if there is no PLM and, if, if there is no op exclusive operator's run slice, or even if a slicing is switched off, the UEs will share the same, the whole cell bandwidth. So we also developed a proof of concept of a federation of LT core networks of, or APCs for a Spanish R&D project called OpenVersa. And different, a user joining the OpenVersa platform can configure its own virtual mobile network operator or MBNO. There will be an orchestrator in the OpenVersa platform, which will deploy a virtual APC for each of these MBNOs somewhere from a server pool. The selection of the resources will depend on the capacity or latency requirements of the of the of the user and also of the capabilities of the service. So, in alignment with, other, with the previously mentioned open AI interface testbed, each MBNO is guaranteed a given quota of percentage of run resources. So, operate will so users from different operators will be able to connect to their to their PPCs to a shared run uh, in OB. So in this slide, we want to show one of the experiments we conduct about dynamic run slice example. This is enabled by FlexRun. So this is nothing new to this, but we, the way we implemented uh, to automate this slicing configuration, it might be beneficial, for example, to adapt the number of resources given the number of users or on the traffic demands. Of the of a, of a given time, so we can really we can change the size of the run slices on the fly. In this experiment, we have one coach UV with category four connected to the to a LTE cell of 10 megahertz of bandwidth, and it's doing hyperps to get the most of the downlink throughput. It came from the available resources. In the beginning, you can see that there is no slicing that applied. And the UE gets the maximum downlink throughput okay, that the cell can offer. At some point later, we enable a run slice for that UE, and it gets only 20% of the total number of resources, which is three resource block groups. 
you can see that the throughput is decreased dramatically and it stays like this at some point until we uh, increase the size of this RAM slice up to, and it gets 60% of the resources. As the run slice increases, the also the downlift increases and stays and it increases in the same proportion at the number of resources. In in the end, at some point, we turn off the slicing and the UE is again getting the whole the full data rate from the whole system cell bandwidth. So now we intend to automate the deployment of an open interface based run network with our raccoon which is our run controller, including the configuration of a run slice on it on its cell. Let's assume an LG deployment of L cells or NLBs, and we envision flex run server, a central, a central flex run server managing the run configuration of these and NLBs. We use netconf as the network configuration technology. There is one netconf configuration or uh, netconf server called NetOpier2 managing each of the open interfaces of this. And, and each, each network conf, each netconf server, we communicate with FlexRun central server to configure the node base. However, FlexRun does not support yet any the netconf. So we developed a netconf backend API for, for FlexRun. This slide is aimed just to show which are the capabilities offered by our backend API which can directly configure an open interface in OD or GNOD working in dual connectivity to the PC, which is also known in operation mode free. And then also through the NetConf backend API, we can, all, can interact with FlexRun to, for example, change the operation of frequency band of our running cell or to provision a different list of element IDs and also MEBs or of, of, of course also managing the, the run slice configuration. We are doing an effort to align Raccoon to our open to the O-Run architecture, which is in a great moment given the current trend in the industry about this democratizing, democratizing the run. O-Run standardized an O-1 interface to, for the net, for network management and uses NetConf, as, as you can see in the top of the figure there. Raccoon, in the, in the Oran architecture, our Raccoon run controller is, a, is seen as a non-real-time run intelligent controller or RIC, which can configure different parts of the run, including a new element called near, near real-time RIC. One operator may potentially have several near real-time RICs, one, for example, for every vendor it's of, of the run elements. And we envision FlexRun as a near real-time rig for open interface stack, run stack. And we plan to extend our NetConf back an API to support also the open run interface. The open run, sorry. NetConf requires an information model to describe the NLB cells network and slices, et cetera. So this information model contains essential configuration information for the run elements. And it's, this information can be formatted by means of young, young files. We initially created a simple information model for open interface, but we question ourselves if there would be any standardized solution for configuring the run elements. And the answer is yes, the 3GPP is already working in its technology independent run network management concept. And moreover, ORAN is also in the way to ad adopting this uh, in information model for configuring ORAN. So 3GPP working for group five defines the network resource model in TS28 dot 540 and this is for 5g nr networks essentially this the network the model aims to at being compatible with any vendor or any underlying technology so to achieve this goal 3gpp work on three different phases during phase one uh, they 3gpp define the requirements and use cases and they are relatively stable over a long period, so they are not expected to be changed. 
In then later phase two, the information server definition are, are described and standardized. So, and these are like the answer to the questions raised during the requirements and use cases definition. Again, this will be only introduce few changes during the evolution of 3GBP standards of, of 5G NR. And finally, during phase three, they offer this, what they call the solutions set, which provide some technology specific uh, solutions for the previous two phases. The solution set already contemplates the use of NetConf and the young models. And 3GBP working group five maintains a GitHub repository with part of the, of the young models described in the in the TS in the 28 series of the 3GBP. It's a very exhaustive collection of of young models, but still they are not it is not completed yet. It's it's still an ongoing work. So to conclude my presentation, uh, we see that FlexOne is a powerful tool that allows us to change the configuration of open interface cells and manage the run slices. Some parts of the run configuration can be automated with NetConf. And we have conceived a backend API to communicate NetConf with FlexRun. This work can help for integration of open interface and FlexRun and the mosaic solutions in the all run architecture, where FlexRun would definitely play the role of the near time rig for open interface run stack. We believe this kind of, of effort to align FlexRun with a standard or open source initiatives is beneficial in terms of gaining more visibility and increased probability of adopting the technology. Thanks a lot, uh, Carlos, for your presentation. Um, just for timing issues, I will go through just uh, one, max two questions that you received, but in the chat you, you received quite a lot. Uh, so the first question that you are asked is how do you optimize and change Mac layer and PBCP and mirror to have a real-time end-to-end lighting? Can you hear me? Uh, sorry, yeah. I, I was free for some time, so I couldn't. I only heard the half of your of your question. Yeah, so I was saying, uh, Manas else? asked, uh, how do you optimize and change your Mac layer and PBCP and mirror to have a real-time and when lighting we are not there yet we are trying to do those changes via um, flexron all the time so as long as flexron supports this kind of configuration we are able to interact with pdcp or lc or mac layers but the our objective is more related with configuration of the nod and the network from from the upper layers for the orchestration and for the deployment point of view, not adjusting this uh, or optimizing the run deployment. Okay. Um, another question is if you are if you are measuring the amount of unused RBS or just uh, the throughput reported by Iber Street. We are monitoring the what is the usage of each of the run slices, and yes, we are planning to collect and use this data to automatically adjust the the sizes of the run slices. Yes, this is already okay. on the map. We do. I think we we have time just for one more question before going to the break. Um, so Arled is asking, what is the reason of using Raccoon on top of Flex Run if it can already provide the network slice, slicing concept? if there is any particular architecture for the future with multiple controllers you want to manage. Yeah, exactly. So the objective of FlexRun is be able to manage as many different technologies, both run technologies as possible. You know that each vendor may have its own operational maintenance uh, protocols and services. So it's difficult for operators to have um, a uh, wide range of technologies implemented on the run. So our run controller aims at implementing these uh, interfaces between the, the operators uh, uh, control of the network and also how this uh, controlling uh, protocol is going to be applied to the different uh, run elements depending on the, on the technology. And okay. not only... Uh, I think 
Uh, sorry yeah. for interrupting. I think um, just one one more question for from Professor Nikan. Um He is asking what are the use cases that can benefit from the NetConf modules. Which are the use cases? For example, you can benefit, for example, when discovering when you want to deploy a, a, a when you set up a network slice and you want to devote some a particular, uh, like for example, run elements, um, for example, in a given area, for example, you want to deploy a number of you know, these for a specific scenario, limited in by the area, you can just, uh, our run controller knows the location of each of these uh, run elements and also the capabilities of each of them. So you can select smartly which elements to deploy and, and the better way to configure them. Thank you very much. Um, uh, we have to stop for time issues, sure. but uh, there are still um, some questions for you. You could you could still see them in the chat. Maybe also answer them publicly, like uh, with, with some explanations that come to publicly in the chat. Um, thank you for your intervention, for your speech. Um, we will go through now a 10 minutes break. And now that it's 10.43, I would say uh, we come back at 10.55 uh, so that we, we have our 10 minutes break and we come back with uh, the next uh, set of uh, speakers. Thank you very much and see you in uh, 10 minutes. Okay, so welcome back to everyone. We can, uh, we can now resume with the following set of speakers. I hope all of you could see me and hear me correctly. Um, so we will start with uh, Mr. Valid Dabous. Um, he is a, um, Dr. Dabous is a senior researcher at INRIA and his research interests include uh, validating networking protocols and architectures using some simulation and experimental testbed with a focus on reproducible evaluation of wireless networking systems. And he's been involved in several testbed related projects at French and European levels, such as uh, PITAR2 Lab, One Lab, and so on. Uh, I would kindly introduce you uh, to Valid. Valid, can you, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Do you hear me? We hear you correctly. The floor is yours. Welcome. OK, thank you. So I will share my slides. So in fact, I will share the whole screen because I need uh, also the Chrome. Okay, so do you see my slides? Yes. Okay, great, I'll put in. Okay. So, uh, hello everyone. Uh, thank you, Bruno, for introducing me. Today I will talk about our test bed at INRIA called Air2 Lab, Reproducer Research Lab. And I will present also a demo that is recorded, not a live one, uh, on uh, using Cube5G to deploy to deploy service on Air2 Lab. So first, I will introduce the reason why we built Air2 Lab, some description of the hardware and software. So this is the first part, and then there will be the recorded demo of eight minutes that will take the rest of the time of the presentation. So uh, as you know you can analyze or evaluate networking protocols using mathematical tools or simulations or, or like in the wild, in, in some deployment, real deployment, as we saw uh, uh, in the orange presentation. Uh, you can also use large scale uh, test fields like Planet Lab uh, or even small scale test feed. But one interesting uh, characteristic is to be able to use controlled test bed which is a test bed where you control the conditions of the wireless experimentation. And while you still use the real uh, software and uh, that is deployed uh, like open air interface or other software components that uh, are used. That's why we built uh, at Inria Sophia Antipolis in uh, uh, Faraday cage uh, with uh, some characteristics for the attenuation to be isolated from the outside world. And we add some uh, RF absorber so that we can have, let me say, reproducible uh, experiments. So yes, for sure, it's not an anechoic chamber to do uh, antenna propagation experiments because you, you still have multipath here. But uh, 
the multipath we have is kind of fixed and very well controlled uh, and you can you can know it in advance and uh, dimension or take it into account into in your experiments so these are the characteristics of the absorbers that you can see in the slides later if you want so uh, in Ertulab we have 37 nodes in 90 square meter uh, chamber and these nodes are a commercial of the shelf uh, nodes with Wi-Fi, uh, two Wi-Fi cards and three antenna each and we have uh, almost 20, 22 uh, SDR uh, augmented nodes uh, with uh, two commercial phones that can be used in your scenarios. So this test bed is uh, fully uh, open to experimenters and you can uh, access this testbed and run your experiment on top of it. And I will show you this in a moment. So a bit more detail about the, the nodes. I don't want to bore you with these details, but just to show that we took like neat lab equipment, okay? Uh, 37 nodes like that, that, uh, that was like uh, put on the ceiling, like here, okay? These blue boxes. And then uh, these are like regular computers uh, with quite acceptable the storage with like the control interfaces, the wired, the internet control interface to, to manage the power and reset uh, to, uh, and even can, they can be used for the experimentation. Okay, they can use to control the experimentation, but if you want to run, uh, for example, to connect to some SDR equipment, you can still use the wired interface for that, okay? So uh, we have two uh, Wi-Fi cards uh, with the different characteristics, and we have the chassis manager card from NITLAB. So this is a view of one of the nodes. As you see here, we have the spacing between the antennas, and we can, uh, here we fixed for five gigahertz, and we can uh, put some other spacing if, if we want, okay? But we, we have uh, information about the nodes, and image of each node that you can check uh, before running your experiment, okay? The SDR boards are different boards that I will not describe, but uh, just to show you that we have different uh, characteristics. Some of them have duplexers to run uh, open air interface uh, as e B or as user equipment and still benefit from duplex. So uh, all these are available uh, to be used in the, uh, in the Air2Lab testbed. Still, we have dongles to, to use like uh, uh, 4G uh, uh, user equipment uh, in, uh, with the computer. And we also have two commercial phones and we, we will use one of these phones in the demo, in the recorded demo that I will show later and some other experimental hardware. So this can be augmented and we have projects to augment this chamber in outside deployment, but this is for other presentation. Okay. So these are like old photos, sorry for the <laughs> carton boxes of etus.com. Now we remove those boxes as Thierry told me. So this work is done with Thierry Thierleti and Thierry Parmantla uh, from INRIA and in collaboration with uh, Osama Arouk and uh, Professor Nikain from, uh, from Euricom. These are different photos that I show you about the chamber. Here is the uh, snapshot of the whole 37 nodes and this show you that you can run the disk, the image, the OS image you want on any node and run your experiment on top of that. Okay, so you can build your own scenario. We have some pre built images that you can use. Okay, and they are prepared for uh, like uh, GNU radio, for open air interface, uh, core network, for, uh, for E node B, for UE. Uh, and some of them ready for Kubernetes uh, that will be used in this, uh, in this uh, demo. And you can still build your own and store it and use it for your, uh, uh, for your own usage, okay? So now if we go to a, a demonstration of the website, just to show you, so this is the website. So I think you see now my Chrome uh, application, you see it? Yes, we do. Okay, thank you. So here you have the possibility to uh, have an account. It's very easy. You uh, subscribe to the One Lab, to the One Lab uh, Federation, and with your uh, login, so you go into into the testbed, and here you have a view uh, of what is running. 
So now I, I booked, I booked this morning. So there is no experience running now in the test bed. So we will not interfere with anyone. <laughs> Just book it for the workshop. But uh, uh, booking, uh, booking a uh, uh, slot uh, in the, uh, uh, for Atrolab, once you have your slice, is as easy as drag and drop like that so that you have your slot booked and you can run your, you, you have the full access to the nodes and, uh, to, and you can run your experiments. Here you have some information about the nodes. For example, here we can see that node four is not available and node 18 also. Otherwise we see what are the last OS, last OS that was put, even if it's in off mode, you can see the last OS, et cetera, et cetera. You can book, uh, for example, for uh, three days period. Here you have our reservation policy, okay? For, uh, for booking. Uh, a very interesting part of, of the website is the one describing the nodes here where you have uh, all what I said about the nodes and much more information. And also you have some images, some photos of the uh, different nodes that, are, uh, that you can check before running your experiment and to see that everything is okay. We also have some tutorials that are here that you can use, for example, to sign up for an account and to run basic experiments. These are like very staged uh, 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 tutorial where different levels, A1, like the A series with A1, A2, A3, etc., where you can uh, have very uh, easy access and learning curve to the uh, testbed and it's very useful for students. So when we have a new student coming into the lab, so first thing is to tell him or tell her, go and do the tutorials. And really it's, it's very simple to, uh, to master the, um, the different parts of the, uh, of the test bed and uh, the software. We have a, a specific part dedicated to uh, the open air interface images that can run on our test bed because we have, uh, we have some uh, work with Euricom so that we can have the last version of Open Air Interface uh, on, uh, on Airtulab available. So I came back to uh, the presentation now to uh, present last piece before the demo, which is the Nipai NG software. It's a software for deployment. So uh, a lot of things were said or will be said about which deployment tool to use, okay? So with air to lab we have developed a kind of a tool that help to quickly script your experiments, even like for moderate size experiments with 30 nodes, 40 nodes, something like that. Okay, you want to make like AODV or uh, uh, ad hoc routing or whatever uh, with a lot of nodes, you still can run your experiments on the air to lab nodes and control this, controlling this experiment with this Nipai NG software, okay? And this software has the possibility to manage all the dependencies between the jobs and uh, uh, avoid you uh, to, uh, to, to go deeply into like doing the synchronization yourself. It's not specific to actual lab, so you can use it independently, okay? So today's demo that is recorded because uh, we, we didn't want to, to run the risk with, the, with this webinar to do, to do it uh, like in, in uh, live. So it's an automated 4G deployment on our testbed uh, using Nipai for one part, which is, which part? Is to deploy uh, the Kubernetes infrastructure on air to lab And once this deployed, so Nipai NG will go out of the picture and here you will have cube 5G that will deploy uh, the operator and the worker nodes and run uh, diff different scenarios. So we will show one scenario, but different scenarios can be run uh, using uh, this tool. Okay, so now I will go to the recorded uh, video. I hope it will work. So tell me if it's okay, I will start it. Hello everyone. And welcome to this video about using... Open the video is not, uh, it's not visible now, it's just audio. So what we're going to do today 
Hello, everyone. You don't see the video? No, now I just see take away. Okay, so and okay now, now yes, now yes, yeah, yeah, okay, now yes. Hello everyone. Just put it full screen, yeah. Video uh, using open our interface inside Autocad. So what we're going to do today is to take this tool named Cube5G and exposed by the Open Air Interface Consortium. This tool is able to deploy an LTE network as a CNF and VNF applications. And we're going to get it to run inside our tool, R2 Lab. And R2 Lab is, as you know, a shielded electromagnetic room where you can run radio experiment without being affected by the outside radio traffic. And to this end, we're going to use a dedicated script that we've written exactly for that purpose. So the script itself is located in its own GitHub repository, and I have it on my Mac. Future. And I'm going to run it without further ado. So the script goes like this. You can, of course, run it with a minus help option. That gives you the details of all the options you can, you can use. You also have the README that gives uh, many explanations on how to use it. And in particular, it's going to describe several options that we have in terms of um, strategies. Strategies meaning how we want to have the different pieces deployed inside the cluster. So the first option that we're going to exercise is minus minus dry run. The dry run mode obviously does nothing, but it shows us which nodes would be taken for which function. And let's remember that FIT01 is going to be used as the master node for the Kubernetes cloud. And that FIT23 is going to be used for hosting the E node B. And this is important because the E node B node, of course, needs hardware characteristics, which are not necessarily present on every node in the platform. Okay, so before we actually trigger the script, let's go to the Autolab main page just to make sure that the test bed is all off. And for this demo, we're going to use the minus O none option. The reason for that is we want to be able to choose the strategy later on. That is to say, we're just going to deploy the Kubernetes infrastructure, and then we will interactively deploy the network later on. In the meanwhile, let us see what exactly is going on. So for that, we have a PNG file that is created by the script itself, and that gives indication of what's going on. So in a nutshell, we're going to load hardware images on top of the nodes, and there are two images involved, one for the master node here, and one for the three worker nodes. Once this is done, we're going to set up the Kubernetes cloud in this particular sentence, human mean in it, on the master node. We are going to go to the three different worker nodes and request them to join the cluster. And once this is done, we are going to finish the preparation on the master node by creating one part that is going to host the Cube 5G operator, primarily this. Once all this is done, we're going to wait for a little while that everything settles. And at that point, we will be able to control our deployment. All right, so we can focus on the active nodes while they are being loaded. And then we have to wait for a little while. Okay, so the last stage was about triggering the operator. And at that point, we have four nodes as part of the cluster and one part here which hosts the operator. At this particular point, we only have one functional cluster, one functional operator, but of course there is no LTE network at all. And we are going to start it ourselves. All right, so now that the script is finished, we are going to be able to go to the interesting part, which is to control the cloud, and in particular to pick one strategy among the ones that are proposed. So to this end, I first need to SSH into the master node. I'm going to do it in two hops. And from the gateway, I need a second hop. 
And now I can follow the instructions from the readme. So I first need to go to the appropriate directory. From there, I can see that I have four nodes. I can also see that at that point, I have one pod, which is the operator pod, that I can instruct it to deploy 5G operator, deploy V1. And I'm going to choose the this aggregated core network mode. Oops. Yeah, sorry. So at this point, the Cube5G operator is doing the deployment for me. I can see its progress by doing Cube control get pods a couple of times. At this point, for example, it deployed the database at the HSS, which is currently being deployed. I have to wait for a little longer. Uh, the interesting part is I have the option to change the resource description, the Kubernetes resource description file in order to tweak the choices that have been made. So for example, at, with this scenario, I am using this file where, for example, I can see this part that says that the node which is going to have the OEI label, the Kubernetes label set to RAM is going to be the one that is chosen to host the e -node B. Well, you can tweak anything you want in these CLD files. And then after a while, at this point, we still do not have the network deployed. And I can see the last pieces currently being brought in. So I can now go to the phones and check their connectivity. So for this, I'm going to log out of the master node and still from the gateway, this time going to, for example, node number two, which as you can see on the map, it's currently turned off, it's in the airplane mode. So I can do something like phone status to check that it's turned off. I'm going to turn it on. I'm going to see whether its connection is it is not the case because the radio network is turned it on. So let's turn it off again. And let's be a little bit more patient and try again. So now we have connectivity. We can actually ping the outside world. It's perfectly fine. And we can, as usual, go and examine the screen. We can interactively manage the phone and, for example, run a speed test. So you can see that the phone is correctly connected with the 4G. And we can, for example, click on a speed test session and measure actual throughput by doing, sorry, this. Kind of things. So all this should give you a fairly good overview of what you can expect to do with this tool. Especially if you remember that this deployment will always use the latest stable software from open air interface. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Valida Bus. I'm sorry to interrupt, but we we uh, we are quite ahead of schedule. So it's okay. It's okay. So it's finished. <laughs> Thanks a lot. So if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer in the in the chat. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Maybe we will have some more time later, even in in afternoon or some session. Okay. To, to uh, I'll, I'll still I'll still be connected. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so let's pass on to the next speaker, who's Adnan Ajaz. He's a principal researcher with the Bristol Research and Innovation Lab of Toshiba Corporation, uh, and he has uh, more than eight years of experience in the wireless domain spanning from various roles, starting from the industrial, academic, and corporate research sector. Um, he is uh, leading a number of industrial wireless research and technology development activities focused on 5G, and we are pleased to, to welcome him today. Uh, hi, Adnan, can you hear us? Hi, Bruno, yes, I can hear you very well. Can you hear me and see me? Perfect, we can hear you and see you correctly. The floor is yours. 
Thank you. Uh, now let me share my screen and uh, it should be. I'm sorry, I'm just having some trouble in sharing my screen. It should be sorted. Um, Okay, perfect. You can see the screen. Right, uh, so I hope you can see the screen now. Right. Yes, we do. Right. Okay, lovely. Okay, great. Uh, th thanks, Bruno, for the introduction. That's very, 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 very kind of you. Um, um, welcome everyone to this talk on private 5G networks. Uh, this talk is exploring um, uh, private 5G networks from two main perspectives. The first is uh, why programmability is important in private networks. And the second is the role of open source platforms in addressing some of the design challenges of private 5G networks. Now, this talk is not going to be very implementation specific, but it is uh, mostly focused towards the bigger picture, towards private networks, 5G technology, and open source platforms. So, um, private 5G has been a very, very hot topic in 2020, and uh, uh, it has very much hit the headlines of various telecoms channels. And some of these headlines here, they show various developments from various parts of the world. Uh, and if you look at the main drivers, there are two main drivers for this growth of private 5G. Uh, the first is the digital transformation of industries, which is driven by Industry 4, Industrial Internet, and other similar initiatives. And the second is the open, opening of the shared spectrum for private 5G deployments in various parts of the world. And some of these uh, headlines here, they also show some very interesting trends, for example, the adoption of private 5G technology for industrial operations, and also non-cellular companies stepping into the value chain of private 5G markets today. So uh, by definition, uh, private 5G is a, is a combination of two things, the private networks and 5G technology, and uh, it can also be defined as a non-public local network, which is um, uh, customized and is, uh, it is designed for dedicated parties connectivity at a specific area or region. Uh, but the unique aspect of private 5G is that it empowers industrial and uh, enterprise stakeholders to run their own local networks with dedicated to competent settings. Uh, the benefits of private networks are well known. The private networks are known to provide various benefits like dedicated coverage or exclusive capacity. Um, uh, private networks can also be customized uh, and this customization is really possible on public networks, for example. Uh, but most important benefit of private networks is that they offer intrinsic control, uh, which means that the private, the owner of the private network has complete control over almost every aspect of the private network. It can deploy its own security and privacy policies and ensure that the, the sensitive data, which is typically the case with industrial operations, uh, it does not necessarily leave industrial uh, premises uh, or facility. Uh, but the most important question is what 5G technology offers for, for private networks, and this is very important because private networks have been around for, for some time now. Uh, so 5G has been designed uh, with native support for uh, very high data rates, very low latencies, and at the same time support very high connection densities. And this is, uh, this is where 5G provides the capability of a unified wireless interface for meeting the requirements of industrial applications. 5G has also been designed uh, with native support for mobility. This means that mobile platforms like AGVs and drones, they could be used for enhanced automation and industrial settings. Uh, also, uh, 5G brings the proven and tested security technology to the industrial settings, and this security technology uh, could be deployed in the industrial world as well. Um, and also, uh, in terms of positioning and localization capabilities, uh, some of these positioning and localization capabilities, they are, they are under standardization for 5G, and um, uh, some of the use cases, uh, actually a lot of different use cases are being considered in, in both indoor and outdoor settings, and uh, with very, very strict requirements, for example, the degree requirements as low as 10 centimeters. And uh, I mean, I'm sorry uh, to, to interrupt. Uh, can I just ask you maybe maybe for some of the of the audience to just uh, maybe uh, think a bit more slowly, just because I understand that uh, for, for you it's a uh, normal speaking, but maybe for some of them it's difficult to uh, to follow. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Apol apologies for that. I'll, I'll I'll try to go a bit slower. Uh, now. No worries. Apologies. So um, yes, also uh, 5G has various new capabilities uh, which, uh, which provide enhanced integration with mobile edge computing platforms. And these, uh, these capabilities are very, very important for uh, real-time contextual service management and also for AI-driven data analytic approaches, uh, which could be uh, used at the edge of the network without going through cloud servers. So uh, if we combine the benefits of private networks and 5G technology, uh, we create a new generation of private networks. And these private networks are mainly designed for mission-critical communication capabilities. Um, and this, this figure here shows the concept of a private 5G network here. Um, so the, the radio access network can scale as per the coverage and capacity requirements. Uh, the, the, the core network could be rather lean as compared to the public counterpart, for example. And um, a private network could be deployed for, for a single industrial application, uh, or it could be deployed for multiple different industrial applications using network size and technologies, which I will be talking about as well. So uh, from, from a functional perspective, uh, private networks could be deployed uh, as standalone networks or they could be deployed in conjunction with public networks as well. So in case of the standalone deployment on the left side here, 
the private network is completely separate and independent from the public network. And all the data for the network functions of the private network, they are, they are uh, confined to the premises of the private network. Uh, in case of the public-private shared RAN deployment, the two networks, they share the radio access network. Uh, however, they have uh, separate identities and all the data flows and network functions, they're still very, very separate in this case. Uh, and there's a third option as well. And that in the third option, um, there is um, a shared RAN and control plane deployment, which means that um, uh, the public and private networks, they share the radio access network, but uh, the control plane and management functions, they are mostly handled on the public network, whereas the data flows, they are confined to the private network itself. So uh, in terms of uh, different op op operation scenarios, these different functional architectures, they are also lead to different operation scenarios as well. Uh, for example, if you think about the standalone deployment, then standalone deployment is mainly focused by, uh, it's mainly attractive for non-MNOs. And um, um, and in this case, uh, service continuity could be provided by roaming agreements through real radio techniques or through based on interworking function between public and private networks. Uh, if you think about some, something like public-private shared RAN deployment, and then this is something which is very, very specific to mobile network operators. And um, in this case, the, the private network it probably exists as a, as a slice on the public network as well. However, uh, service continuity could be, could be quite straightforward in this scenario as well. Now, uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, programmability in private networks and why this is important. And um, uh, programmability is, is important from both technical and business perspectives. So purely from a business perspective, programmability means the capability of uh, offering new, new, new services uh, and providing new applications at a much greater level of flexibility and agility. And this often means um, new revenue stream for operators and vendors as well. But really from a technical perspective, uh, programmability means a network optimization and also fine gain control. And this is very important if, if the private networks have to be customized for, um, for various industry verticals. Uh, most of the time, this programmability is coming from the capability of software-defined networking. And this means you can have dynamic control of uh, re resources and also fine grain control of resources, and which is very, very important for mission critical communication capabilities. And also, uh, this such programmability is very, very important from, uh, from an innovation perspective. And if you think about this, um, uh, platforms like Mosaic, Mosaic 5G, and platforms like OpenNet Interface, uh, they are very much about real-world setups into the reach of the research community. And this often means that rapid, uh, this often means rapid prototyping and uh, testing of uh, innovative solutions, innovative platforms, uh, and innovative algorithm in, in the real world setup as well. So uh, taking this programmability discussion to, 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 um, to a slightly different level, we will look at two main aspects. The first aspect is the network slicing. So if you think about network slicing, this is something which is widely, widely recognized by the industry to unlock the potential of 5G for various, various vertical applications as well. And uh, this network slicing, it provides the capability of isolation from technical uh, from business as, and also from functional perspectives. And this gives you the capability of creating a network within the network. Uh, the fundamental concept of network slicing is to create multiple logical networks and, over, it, and these logical networks are customized uh, as per the service requirements of one or more applications. Uh, when you talk about private networks, then um, slicing a private network itself, it's, uh, it's very, very important. And there are multiple, multiple uh, reasons for that. And one of the most important reasons is that private networks, they, especially private 5G networks, um, they, uh, they are expected to fulfill the requirements of very different industrial applications, ranging from closed loop control uh, to mobile robots, for example, as well. And if you have to, if you need to have successful coexistence of these very different applications over a single network, then this is something which can, this, this capability can only be unlocked through, through network slicing technologies in this case. Um, network slicing also provides the capability of traffic isolation in an end to end manner. And this is very important for providing strict performance communities, especially in multi service coexistence scenarios. Uh, network sizing also provides uh, isolation in terms of computing, storage, and networking resources, and this is very, very attractive for, uh, uh, for efficient trading of the private 5G infrastructure. And uh, finally, uh, it provides the capability of slice specific customization, and this means that you can deploy customized resource allocation policies, customized security and privacy policies for different industrial applications. Now, uh, if you think about the slicing technologies, how to achieve slicing in private networks, then one of the one of the most effective ways is to is to slice the private network based on um, a gateway, and this gateway basically comes at a higher level in the network hierarchy as compared to um, as compared to the base stations, and this gateway level slicing it is it is uh, beneficial from various perspective. For example, it provides the capability of um, uh, network wide slicing uh, across the whole uh, across the whole private network as well. It also has minimum footprint for adoption in private networks and. Um, this is very important because your gateway could be interfaced with third-party base stations using open APIs. And also this gateway level slicing is very well aligned with software-defined networking paradigm, which is uh, very, very uh, promising for, for, for the radio access network and uh, so it's networks in general. Um, so programmability, we saw the programmability is very, very crucial for network slicing, but there is a different challenge which, is, challenge which is also emerging and that's the TSN integration challenge. And if you look at the industrial, legacy industrial networks, these legacy industrial networks, they are, um, 
uh, they are very much based on wide technologies, internet technologies, field-based technologies, and these technologies are uh, quite proprietary and they like interoperability. So TSN is a set of new standards uh, which has been developed under, under within the IEEE, and these standards are basically focusing on um, improving the real-time capabilities of generated Ethernet as well. And the key aspects of TSN is that it provides um, um, guaranteed data delivery with bounded latency and with deterministic latency as well. But TSN is going to be uh, still, TSN is still a wide technology, and it's still going to uh, it's still very much limited in terms of um, 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 what it can do in terms of flexibility, for example. So DSN and 5G technologies, they're expected to coexist in industrial networks, and therefore it is natural to talk about integration of 5G and TSN in, in, in industrial settings. And uh, this integration is very, very important for achieving end-to-end -end deterministic connectivity over both hybrid, uh, over both wide and wide, wireless segments in industrial networks. And also it provides various design simplifications because most of these industrial networks, they are um, they're characterized by uh, complex, uh, complex hierarchical architectures. And such integration basically provides much more degrees of freedom for connecting industrially computer and industrial devices. And most importantly, this integration, it provides um, a, a single standardized integrated solution for industrial communication, which means that you don't necessarily have to rely on uh, proprietary technology anymore. And there is much more interoperability between different technologies and in industrial settings. So when we talk about integration of private 5G and, uh, and, and DSN technologies, then um, uh, there is something in, happening in 3GPP as well. And this is something which is also um, quite actively pursued for, for release 16. Um, so in this case, one of the most one of the key approaches is is the bridge model. So in this case, the 5G system um, it acts as a virtual TSN bridge or a black box to TSN entities, which means that uh, it provides um, uh, ingress ports and egress ports for TSN traffic, um, but it, it does not really implement TSN protocols itself. And this means that it is going to handle TSN service requirements and TSN um, uh, service requests based on its own quality of service framework as well. Now, the main benefit of this uh, bridge model is the simplicity, which means that you don't have to have native support for TSM protocols in, in a 5G system. But that simplicity also becomes a challenge. And this is challenging because you have to achieve TSM-like functionality without native support for TSM protocols. And uh, this is where programmability becomes very, very important because with, with this programmability in, in, in private networks, you can basically program TSM-like functionality in, in, in private networks for, for industrial networking. And also, uh, now, this integration is, is uh, th this programmability is important because of, um, uh, for, for a different challenge as well. And this is because TSN operates on the principle of centralized scheduling. It also operates on the principle of time synchronization. So you need to expose the capabilities of the 5G network to the TSN entities for centralized configuration and management. And this is again where programmability uh, becomes uh, fairly, fairly important in, in, in private networks. Now, if you look at some of the uh, recent trends around uh, software, so software defined networking around virtualization technologies, we see a new ecosystem of five open, op open, uh, open, source, uh, open source platforms emerging um, around 5G. There are various um, community led platforms, there are various community, community led projects as well, and most of these are covering end to end aspects of uh, uh, private networks, uh, end to end aspects of, of 5G as well. Um, but I would like to talk a little bit about uh, the ORAN in general and how uh, the ORAN architecture is, is basically supporting programmability at multiple levels as well. So some of you would be familiar with the ORAN architecture. This is uh, uh, developing, uh, this is a community-led effort uh, looking into uh, developing an, uh, an open architecture for radio access networks based on the principles of openness and intelligence. And, uh, and uh, one of the key benefits of this ORAN architecture is, is that it supports uh, interoperability, which means that you can integrate um, uh, different uh, different components from different different uh, for different vendors. There is no single vendor login in this case, and multiple of these components from different vendors they can interwork uh, with with open interfaces as well. Now, uh, the ORAN architecture it uh, it is mainly uh, focused towards uh, deploying services at the edge of the radio access network, and it has uh, programmability at multiple different levels. Starting from let's say from the lowest level in this case, your radio units they could be programmed, and this is very important because um, you can use different radio units for different types of spectrums. And if you look at the private five G market, for example, different different uh, different spectrum bands have been opened for different um, uh, in, in different parts of the world, and um, uh, the radio units in one specific band they may not necessarily be uh, suitable for for deployments in different different parts of the world as well. Um, and secondly, uh, one of the things in ORAN architecture is the, is the is the split between CU and DU, the centralized unit and distributed units in this case, and this means that you can customize the CU and DU functionality as per as per the, as per the requirements of a private network itself. And also, in in case of uh, uh, ORAN architecture, there are two main types of controllers: the RAN intelligent controllers. One of them is the is a non real time controller, which is basically looking working at uh, at the time scale of of, of a few seconds, and which mainly provides um, service management and or session functionalities. And the second is this uh, near real-time controller, which is um, uh, mainly providing a software platform for different applications. And these applications could be could be um, uh, very, very attractive in terms of programming their end behavior, and also in terms of um, things like the slicing and TSN integration as well. 
Right, uh, but open source ecosystem uh, that we see it's is, is very promising for deploying uh, for developing right box technology with private networks, but it also presents various challenges, uh, and some of these challenges are listed here. Uh, for example, um, in, in in case of open source, uh, you have to standardize the software and also the APIs, and these APIs must be standardized in case for, for interoperability and for adoption at, at, at a very, very wide scale as well. Uh, and also, uh, uh, the devices which are based on open source stack and general purpose hardware, they have to undergo a various types of performance testing at, as well. And also, especially in terms of the industrial communication context, uh, you need to have different product certification schemes, and these product certification schemes must account for different um, uh, additional considerations like connectivity, um, safety, security, and also for inter interface, interfacing as well. And um, yes, so towards the end of this talk, I want to show some of one of one of our recent technology demonstrations. And uh, in this technology demonstration, um, we have uh, demonstrated the capability of uh, a slicing enabled private 5G network and shown that this could be customized to fulfill the requirements of very different industrial applications uh, with, with over, over a single wireless interface. So first of all, this is this is a completely open source uh, private 5G network using open source platforms like OEI and Wazip 5G service platforms. And uh, in terms of applications, we have considered three very different applications from closed loop control, open loop control, and video streaming. And all of these applications, they are, uh, they are they have been, um, they're successfully working with strict performance guarantees uh, through customization of, of the network in terms of uh, radio resource slicing capabilities. Um, so this 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 was uh, the demonstration that we presented uh, at uh, at Mobicom this year, and the video of this is available in the public domain if you're interested in, uh, in, in, in knowing more about this one. Right, so this brings me to the end of this talk, and uh, thank you very much for your attention, and if you have any questions, I would be happy to take those now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Adnan, for your intervention. Actually, there are um, some some questions that are addressed, but for reasons of timing we, we and schedule, we, we won't have time now to, to answer them. So maybe still uh, general advice, you could answer them publicly in the chat so that they, they, they could be clear for uh, for everyone. Sure. Sure. Okay. Uh, and just as, a, as an overall reminder, I started receiving um, slides for some of, from some of you. Uh, we, we just remind you that we will publish the, the live video later um, after this, uh, this talk, and we will share the slides on our LinkedIn page. So for all of you, just, uh, just share your, your slides after, after your talks or even before. Thanks. Um, let's move on. The next uh, speaker is uh, Professor Mr. Adrian Kitsentini from Eurocom and um, he's an IEEE Communication Society Distinguished Lecturer and also a professor here at uh, uh, Eurocom in the Communication Systems Department. He's uh, leading the network authorization group activities that are related to network slicing and edge computing and he will be uh, involving and is involved in many uh, Horizon 2020 EU projects on 5G, such as uh, 5G Pagoda, 5G Transformers, uh, 5G Drones, and Mon 5G. Uh, welcome, Adlen. Uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Bruno, for your introduction. Um, from my side, I will uh, give you um, a short introduction about the, uh, the Euricom 5G facility and focus in particularly how this facility can be used to trial vertical use cases. So, uh, so let me start by speaking about 5G and trials. As you may know, one of the objective of uh, 5G when it start the specification of 5G and uh, the requirement was to open the mobile network to verticals. So in order to allow uh, verticals using cellular network and mobile network and take advantage of uh, the feature that 5G should provide for them and to have like a common network for all the verticals. So by verticals, I mean every industry uh, that may be interested to uh, go to uh, more uh, ICT related, uh, using ICT related technology, like Industry 4.0, and now we are speaking about 5.0, uh, UAV and managed aerial uh, vehicle, augmented reality, autonomous driving, and so on. So even the first commercial deployment of 5G started in uh, 2019. But this um, uh, first uh, deployment was mainly targeting mobile broadband connectivity using the 5G non-standalone access. But still many 5G features are not deployed, particularly for this very high data rate, low latency and network slicing 
and all the core network uh, featuring standalone connectivity. So therefore, still there is a need to trial vertical use case on top of 5G architecture, 5G infrastructure, particularly to validate vertical key performance indicator, but also validate 5G KPI in order to support these uh, vertical industry use cases because they have their own requirement in terms of reliability, latency, bandwidth, and so on, which is completely different from those uh, we are having for broadband connectivity. In uh, the context of UE project, many uh, UE projects, I uh, mean, particularly three UE projects that have been founded by the European Commission in the program of H2020 ICT17 in order to create facilities and uh, build facilities in order to start the trial of 5G use case, particularly focusing on vertical industry. Among them, um, three main ICT17 platform are existing, 5GE, 5G Genesis, and 5G Vini. And Uricom facility is part of the 5G EVE project, which is uh, involving a lot of partner. So, 5G EVE project is uh, a project, as I mentioned, involving a lot of partner, partner from Italia, Spain, Greek, and other partner. But uh, there is a big seat here in France involving three or uh, four locations. So, uh, and the location are under the control of Orange France, but Uricom has its own seat, which is based mainly on open air interface tool and other open source tool. So it's based mainly on uh, open source component. So uh, as using open air interface and of course flex run. And uh, also it's providing uh, connectivity and the computing uh, capability at, at the edge. They you mainly using Kubernetes and OpenShift OpenShift, uh, to recall, is uh, a tool provided for, uh, by Red Hat in order to manage on top of Kubernetes. Also, uh, it provides a Mac platform. It's HC uh, compliant Mac platform. And uh, one advantage of the uh, facility that we have here for verticals is that the trial is run as a network service, which means that the facility support multi-tenancy and allow to run several trials in parallel because a trial is run as a network services. Some, some information regarding uh, the deployment that we have in terms of infrastructure. So in this picture, you see we have uh, outdoor deployment, which is covered with uh, 5G NR RRU, professional RRU, and antenna covering the uh, campus uh, the building and the look uh, the area of uh, Eureka, but also we have indoor deployment to test other uh, feature and so on. Uh, in terms of 5G and our connectivity, uh, we have now, uh, as uh, you have seen this morning in Florian's presentation, the FR1, which is uh, already uh, deployed and allow now to have 5G non-standalone uh, connection. But in the near future, we will be having um, 5G standalone. You have seen this in the roadmap of uh, Florian. But also uh, in the near future, I hope in uh, 2021, we'll be having also uh, FR2. We will be able to have connectivity on top of FR2 for millimeter waves to have higher bandwidth. In terms of computing resources, uh, we have several Dell servers based on Intel Xeon Gold and Silver, which allow to run uh, the EnodeB and the core network, but also uh, allow to run services and application coming from verticals. And everything is managed using OpenShift and Kubernetes. Now, I will show you uh, the global architecture of the facility and particularly for uh, automate deployment of the trial and uh, this facility are composed by uh, for the architecture is composed by three plan so we have the vertical user plan which interface to um, to a portal in order to define a trial 
or use a blueprint of a trial, then this web portal is uh, creating like what we call a trial descriptor. And this descriptor will include all the monitoring information requested by the vertical, because one important point when you do a trial is you need to see, uh, you know, monitoring of a specific KPI that interests the trial owner. So then we have a management and orchestration plan, because as I have mentioned before, all the trial are run as network slices. So we need somehow to, to translate this uh, trial descriptor to a a network slice template. This template will be uh, given to a slice orchestrator, a slice orchestrator we have built here. And this slice orchestrator will deploy the cloud part using the network service descriptor because it is extracted from this network slice template and the run descriptor to enforce the run slice. And here we have uh, everything based on flex run and the Mosaic 5G uh, tool. Then we have the infrastructure plan. The infrastructure plan, as I have mentioned, particularly for uh, everything related to cloud and Mac, is using OpenShift and Kubernetes. And the core network and the run network and the run is already deployed on the facility. So so uh, here we are not speaking about automotive deployment, but this is something we are able to do. You have seen the Cube 5G that allow to deploy automatically core network, but for vertical, everything is already deployed. And we have a Mac platform that allow to uh, do like the traffic of loading to the uh, application, which is sitting in the edge. And here we deploy the vertical uh, application. So in terms of the process, so the vertical first define the trial. It use a blueprint or an existing blueprint. Define the needed run resources and allowed user equipment that uh, need to be uh, deployed on the trial. And all regarding the application descriptor, like the URL of the image that it is used by the used by the vertical in order to be deployed and select the list of KPI. So this is done by the vertical through the web portal. Then we start to have the automation. So for the automation, we start by translating the trial descriptor into a network slice template, deploy it on top of the slice orchestrator and request the monitoring. And then we have the step of the life cycle management because the trial owner will be, uh, we ha have the possibility for instance, to update the run resource on runtime and uh, also the application computing resources and get the uh, KPI presentation. So we are able now to present the KPI in two form, in form of a dashboard or, or a raw data. And of course, the trial deletion, which is related to uh, deleting everything which are related to the trial and store the, tri the uh, trial descriptor, which could be used in the future. So in order to uh, do ensure this automate deployment, we have the web portal, which is, uh, which is the interface with the vertical. It's exposed graphical user interface. So, it's abstract the definition of the trial because this is very important because a vertical sometimes doesn't care about how the, uh, I would say this trial will be deployed, but it care about only deploying uh, and creating and defining the trial in a more abstracted way. So we need to allow it to uh, do it without, you know, having knowledge about how the resource will be deployed or knowledge about Kubernetes or how uh, the run part is defined. So we have the web portal, which is divided in different components, the front end, which is graphical user interface. And then we have three other components for one for the trial enforcement, one for the life cycle management, and one which is uh, related to the KPI monitoring and presentation. So all these together allow to the abstract the, uh, the trial definition and enforcement for the vertical and communicate with the slice orchestrator. So here's some uh, screenshot. For instance, this is the part defining the global information regarding the slice, the part defining 
how the run uh, the, uh, the run information resources needed by the vertical and for instance the list of mc which will be uh, you deployed for the will be used and will be able to use the network slice which will be created later for this trial and the list of kpi that can uh, will be monitored for the trial the same for instance for the slice the size deployment duration and reconfiguration execution duration which are kpi related to the slice and part which is dedicated for the creation of the nsd as i have mentioned before we put a lot of effort in order to abstract the deployment because we don't want that someone you know deploy this nsd and all this complexity so all this complexity are abstracted by defining just a form that allow the uh, vertical to create uh, request the necessary resources and deploy the application and for the life cycle management so after creating the slice and the slice is running and the trial is running the, uh, the the trial owner can have access to the kpi monitoring and update the slice resources for instance it can request more resource block for the run but also can update the application inform resources that are already dedicated and everything will be done on runtime. And here how the KPI are presented. So we are using a Kibana, a Kibana dashboard. So four parts which are coming from the NF view, which is coming from uh, the cloud part and edge part and part which are coming from the run. So these are based on uh, flex run statistics that are gathered and we are using like a wrapper in order to, uh, to create a new KPI which are not available in flex run. So of course, this is for the presentations of the KPI, but there is also a way to get access to the raw data. So we are using specific format for the raw data in order to allow the, uh, the vertical to, end, to get all this information and then store it somewhere and do like machine learning later and so on as indicated by Navid for everything regarding to uh, the data analytic and so on. And one important point is we are putting timestamp and we are trying to synchronize the timestamp coming from the run and Trump and those coming from the cloud in order to get like a correlation between what is happening at the run and what is happening at the edge and the cloud uh, platform. So this is important also for everything related to data statistic. And we are all, we have also uh, other KPI that I I'm not showing here and I will show you quickly uh, later this KPI. Now regarding the network slice orchestration and management, <clears throat> the slice orchestrator we have here, it is something similar to the 3GPP SN NSMF, network slice management function. It's allowed to deploy network slice to run a trial. It uses, as I have mentioned, a network slice template, which is following the GSMA uh, model and communicate with the run orchestrator and an NFV orchestrator, which can be seen as network sub slice management function. And this slice orchestrator is implementing uh, the API as specified in the document TS28530 of 3GPP, which allow to allocate network slice, activate, and uh, it, all the relation, all the operation like commissioning, operation and decommissioning, and provide monitoring API. What is important in the slice orchestrator, it's a point where it uh, aggregate all the monitoring information that comes from the interview and run and present them using the same format and the same uh, the same time sample. For the NFVO, I will not detail it. It's a homemade also, and it's running on top of OpenShift and allow to uh, take as input a network service descriptor and deploy all the instance of the uh, of the application as provide the, the application needed by the vertical. Here we are speaking only about the application of the vertical. And we have the run orchestrator, which is uh, fully based on, uh, on Mosaic 5G flex run. And I have here more detail about it. So it's component, which is using the flex run master controller and using the Flexran protocol to communicate with uh, base station, uh, OIA uh, base station. And we have two wrapper on top of it. One for the uh, deployment of a network slice, because we will get a run descriptor for 
uh, to deploy the run slice. And this is something coming from the vertical request. And we have the part which are regarding the uh, monitoring part because we are using uh, the statistic uh, collected from FlexRun, but we are having like a wrapper on top of it in order to, um, to create new KPI. And from the information coming from FlexRun, we are doing like some kind of uh, grooming in order to create new, as I mentioned, a new KPI, like the latency of um, the DLQ. We are using some kind of little low formulas in order to uh, try to predict this, um, this latency. But also we are providing uh, the API, which is used by HC, uh, which is specified by HCMEC, which is the Radio Network Information Services. So for all the UE involved in the uh, network slice and in the trial, we, have, we are pushing the information regarding the channel quality indicator, the RSRP, RSRQ, per UE and per slices. So everything here are using the Flex Run Master Controller which allow us to get all this uh, information using the SDK and API provided by uh, Flexron. So I will give you example of trials uh, we are conducting. So this is, uh, we have uh, one project, it is called 5G drone. It is uh, coming from the ICT-19 call. It's similar to the one uh, like 5G uh, Victory that has been presented this morning. So uh, 5G drone aims to uh, deploy some UAV uh, use cases using the facility. And one of the facility is uh, 5G Eve Sophia Antipolis. So the objective is to, uh, to use the facility in order to demonstrate and uh, evaluate some uh, trials coming from UAV for public safety, connectivity extension, and mission critical. The project involves 20 partners, UAV, mainly a lot of UAV companies who are experts on this uh, field, network operator, Orange and Cosmote, and other industrial, and of course, Uricom. So here, the, uh, the big image of the trial, as you may know, for when you, may when you fly drones, mainly we have one critical application which is the drone control and command in the jargon of uav it's called c2link where the drone report periodically their gps position and this position are communicated to the local uh, the local authority in order to understand if there are other flying drone in this area and if there is a prediction of collision or if there is a security issue this drone control command should send command to the drone in order to update their trajectory using uh, cellular connectivity. So this is one of the use case we want to see. And the drone in uh, the same time will send a remote video to a video server like tracking area and so on. So what's happened here? So we need like connectivity for this trajectory control command, which require ultra low, uh, ultra reliable low latency communication, because it's about security. This information should reach the drone if the drone need to change trajectory or reduce speed in uh, low latency. And we need another one, which require uh, EMBB function like high data rate, because in case of uh, sending raw video or a 3D video. So you see clearly here that this um, trial reel may require two types of slice in parallel, one for the traffic uh, trajectory control command and one for this uh, video streaming. So how this will be deployed in the facility, this uh, represents like a network service deployment. So we will be having, for example, here drones that are connected to the uh, facility hard component because this will be already deployed. And everything should be uh, should be uh, using the, the, the web portal in order to automate the deployment because we'll be deploying two service from the vertical, this c 2 link services because it is a software and need to run at the Mac and the streaming service also will be uh, run on the Mac. And we will be using the facility component composed by OEI, best station, 
and a programmable run using a Mosaic 5G. And we use all the tools in order to start uh, getting the KPI and run this type of trial. So as a takeaway, so the Euricom 5G facility will be operational in early 2021 for verticals. It's already uh, used, for instance, to deploy uh, a specific component, run component, a core component using Helm charts from OpenShift and through uh, Orange on app server. Now we have 5G drone, which will be uh, starting using the facility for UAV use case and other project like 5G Victory, 5G Croco, and Mobi 5G will be also using this platform. And in terms of extension, uh, we are thinking about adding the possibility to have slice specific core network. For instance, we deploy a core network specific per slice, allow to use more run feature like run split and be able, for instance, to plug uh, other CU, not only OAI, but someone interested to add CU or other uh, software in the platform. And for instance, include other radio access like uh, LoRa for IoT and Wi-Fi. So thanks for your attention. And uh, if there is any question, I will be happy to answer it. Thank you very much, uh, Alan, for the intervention and for the speech. There are some questions that were being addressed, but as we're 10 minutes late, I don't think we, we will have the time to address them. Um, maybe as, as, for, as for all the other speakers, it would be uh, nice to, to answer to them publicly so it's uh, more clear for the other participants, which could be the answer, maybe could be useful for them. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, let's move on with the next speaker that is uh, Dr. Enrique Crivella Perez. Um, he is um, a, a postdoctoral researcher at the University of the West of Scotland, United Kingdom, and he's been technically involved in the Horizon 2020 5G PPP phase two slice net and phase one self net project. Uh, his main interests include end-to-end uh, -end network slicing, monitoring and uh, network control and management. Uh, we are pleased to welcome him here. Uh, Enrique, could you hear us? Hi, could you hear me? Yes, we could. We can hear you correctly. Okay, we we'll put the video also. Yeah. Did you see my screen? Not yet. I don't have the option to share right now. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> you should be. You should be able. Okay. Cool. Yeah. No. Did you see my screen and the presentation? Yes, we do. Yeah. We okay, see perfect. presentation, presentation view, so presenter view, but it should be fine the same. Uh, okay, I have it in the other screen. One moment, yeah, no worries. I will remove the other screen. One second, please. Uh, still present review, but you could just, uh, yeah, okay, now it's fine. Okay, perfect. Okay, my name is Enrique Chiribella and I belong to the University of West of Scotland, to the UWS Beyond 5G group, and I will present the end-to-end -end network slides for critical services in crowd year scenarios. The agenda for today, I will present the uh, components that we have in in our group, that is the flow control agent, it's called FCA, the 5G topology agent that we call 5GTA, and the slice manager that we call SM. Later on, I will explain uh, the architecture that we have, uh, something about the networking that we are facing uh, to do the end-to-end -end network slicing deployment. I will go with the management steps that we are we need to do to deploy the end-to-end -end slice and at the end i will show you a short demo to
to uh, of the our use case. Okay, the FCA basically is a component that is in charge to control the slicing, to control the slicing in all the flows and is able to collect all the network interfaces in the physical and virtual devices. Also collect all the information regarding compute switches, containers and virtual machines in each of the physical machines and the connection among all. The FCA enforce actions to configure slicings in the flex run, in the edge and in the core segments. The FCA also is in charge to monitor and aggregate metrics per action. Here we have a diagram of our FCA that is basically receiving intents and with a unified uh, API, common API, we are able to enforce actions in the NIC controllers, in L2 controller, L3 controller, and also in the flex run controller. That means that uh, we are able to enforce rules in the uh, wire, wire data plane and in the wireless data plane. The next module that we have is the 5D topology agent that basically is in charge to collect all the topological information in the 4G, 5G infrastructure and is integrated with the Mosaic 5G components as a flex run, SPGWC and the MME. Also is collecting the topological information about the UIs and the metadata associated in real time. Also, we are able to detect the handovers when it's happening. The slice manager is a management component that is able to create end-to-end -end network slices in the same administrative domain. Also gather and combine the information coming from the FCA and the 5GTA to create the topology in, of the infrastructure. Also is able to locate the UEs in real time in the infrastructure. And also is able to dynamically reconfigure end-to-end -end slice network slices even when a handover is triggered. This is the architecture that we have. Basically, is divided in a core and edge. We have one core and we have two edges. Each of the edges is uh, with two antennas, one per tenant. And also we have the management uh, plane that is with the slice manager. This infrastructure, all the services that we have are deployed with the OpenStack that is acting as a beam. And later on, we have the VNFM and the NFBO to orchestrate some services. The CU uh, and all the modules that we have here are provided by uh, Mosaic 5G. Now we need to, uh, I will introduce some networkings to be able to understand what we are doing. As you know, we have a IP communications between all the physical machines and also uh, the connection that we that is going through internet. Later on, we have the encapsulation, the VXLAN. That means that we have an overlay network, the VXLAN over IP, that is going through the OBSs in each of the uh, physical machines that we have. And at the end, we have the tunnel GTP that is going between the N of V and the SPGWU. Uh, that is basically the channel bit for, for the phone. Also, we have the connection that is coming between the DU and the CU to be able to uh, connect the users to the antenna. And also we have each of the users that is connected through the antenna. That means that at the end, we, are, we have the end-to-end that that means that one user is able to uh, go through the pathway and is able to communicate one user to each other. For the sake of simplicity here, we uh, remove some uh, things about the networking part of OpenStack and we put uh, like only a switch, but it's a little bit more complex. 
And this is what we define an end-to-end -end slice. That means that a user to another user passing through uh, the same administrative domain, and we are able to enforce an slice in all the network points to be able to uh, ensure the capability of a service. Whoa, sorry. Okay. Come on. Okay. I don't know what happened, but I will do. First, the first step is that FCA is a is a sending all the information regarding the topology that is having in all the physical machines. Okay. Later on, the uh, I don't know what happened here. Okay. Later on, the uh, slice manager is a Sorry, guys. Okay, the FCA is sending is sending the all the components that the network components that have to the slice manager. Also, the flex run, sorry, the the five GTA is sending also the information regarding the topology in the uh, Mosaic five G uh, platform. Later on, the slice manager, because the uh, network administrator is sending. Is sending the is configuring the NST and the NSE. Okay, is able to deploy these uh, rules to the FCA. The presentation is doing okay. Okay, now <clears throat> now the uh, the network administrator is enforcing the rules. Here we have uh, the web interface, but we define the slice in the air that is the wireless part and in the earth that is the wired part okay the parameters that we define in the in the air basically is, are the intraslice share active down leak isolation down leak mac mxs and for the earth one we are uh, doing the uh, priority that we have that we can put a critical services with the availability in high and later on, we can do the limitation of the downlink and the uplink. Later on, the <clears throat> uh, FCA, uh, the slice manager is enforcing the rules over the FCA and as a unified platform is acting to all the uh, network interfaces that we have in the network and also is uh, injecting that rules over the flex RAM that is uh, at the end acting over the uh, wireless part. And here we have a demo of the uh, demo. Come on. Did you see the video? Not at the moment. It's somehow blocked. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. Did you see my screen? Was a complete sorry. Uh, still not. Okay. I will. Maybe if you have it online, and it's it. better to yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, this is the video uh, the the output of the video in a crowdio scenario. That means that when we are facing some uh, back no noise traffic and is without the slicing. Yeah, this is the this is the background traffic that right now is almost three gigabytes per second, and uh, this is the mission critical services that is uh, the video that is passing through our slides. Here is the slice manager that is uh, we are at, uh, attaching the flows that are coming from the critical services 
we are here, we, we see the encapsulation part and we attach the uh, associated slides to a, a UIS that we have already uh, stored here. We configure and at that moment, the uh, priority of the service is coming again and we are able to see the uh, to see the video in a congested scenario with uh, out losing the quality. Yes, and that's it. Okay, so I would like to thank you for for your uh, presentation. Um, I would. I think there are no questions. I mean, there is one question from Sandeep, but I don't think it's uh, so. He's asking from the network provide available latency information to the application on the device side, as it does to everybody. I don't know if it's still referring to um, uh, other than case or yours, but not uh, specific questions were addressed to while while you were um, you were presenting. So. Thank you for, for the presentation. If there is something that comes up uh, like a later question, if you would still be connected with us, you uh, you will be then more than, we will be more than happy for you to, to rejoin and answer. Okay, thank uh, you very much. We will, you're welcome. We will go through with the uh, last speaker, but not least for um, before our lunch break with uh, Timon Sloan. Uh, he's uh, um, working at the Open Networking Foundation and he's VP Marketing and Ecosystem, working on uh, open source networking, SDN, NFB, Cloud, Court, and many other projects on SDRAN and ORAN and 5G. Um, Timon, uh, good morning. Can you hear us? I don't think he's actually connected. I don't see Timon here. Let me just check. Let me, let me go back to, to you, Navid, with the so host. Um, what should we, should we uh, maybe answer some of the questions that were not answered from some of the past speakers? Or would you suggest? Yeah, but what we could do, probably Timon didn't manage to make it as he's in, in US. Yeah. Um, uh, we, we could, uh, if, if participants would like to ask a live questions, I think, they can ask uh, right now, and then exactly. we could invite them for the for the demo uh, uh, later. Okay, that's totally fine. So I would say for all of the participants, if there were uh, any particular speech which uh, let's say uh, arise some some questions, it's uh, good timing now. We we still have. Uh, 14 minutes before the lunch break to, to, to ask questions and maybe answer live. Uh, so yeah, if, if there are some live, live questions now, it's a good moment to. Uh, otherwise we could uh, start, if there is no questions, we could uh, start the, the break, right? And then uh, send a message in the chat room to start for the demo. I saw there is a there is a, an end raised by Buddy Joubert. Sure, sure, uh, go ahead. You could uh, you could unmute yourself. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my question probably will be um, directed to all uh, of the presenters. Uh, when speaking about uh, slicing on the radio part, uh, can you uh, provide us more details about what is possible today to slice on the radio part? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the question, Badi. Uh, so for all of the speakers, whoever wants to, to answer, yes. please feel, feel free to unmute itself and, uh, and answer the question. 
Can you hear me? Here's Robert. Hi, Robert. Yes, we could, we could hear you. Uh, so regarding the functionality of slicing that you can do on the run until now. Uh, so I reworked this earlier this year. And what you can configure for the moment is only static slicing. So you can have multiple slices in the run and they have exclusive uh, access to a part of the, of the spectrum. So basically you would define the lower and the upper end of uh, the resource block or actually in the downlink, the resource block group. And then only on this uh, part of the spectrum, the slice will be allowed to uh, schedule its uses. And uh, now, until now, we had only the static slicing and also the no slicing functionality if you want. So you would always have kind of one slice. Uh, what I will demonstrate briefly this afternoon is that by now we also have NBS and another slicing algorithm. So I didn't add those yet uh, to the public uh, base, but I will do this next year. And so by next year, you will at least have the static slicing. So just some resource block that can be used by any slide by the slice in question every TTI, then the NVS algorithm, and I can put the paper link if you're interested here. Then I also had uh, myself some work. So there's another uh, slice algorithm there. And depending on how much time I will have, I might also implement uh, maybe another algorithm, but in any case, I reworked the whole Mac uh, layer slicing functionality for 4G so that you could also implement your own slicing algorithm. I hope this answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for the question, buddy, and for your answer, Robert. Um, if, if there are um, some more questions, we still have 10 minutes to, to answer them. If not, we could uh, uh, start the, the the lunch break before and maybe introduce the the, the workshop you the workshop set the live training session and demo that will be uh, provided briefly uh, by uh, Chia Chu Chen on from NTUSD. Hi, can you hear me? Hi, we can mm. hear you. Hi, okay. Hi, um, let me share my screen. Actually, we still we are still not starting with your with your demo. Okay. It's just uh, was just an introduction. Then then we mm. will let you know when 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 is the time to to start. Uh, okay. First, I, I would uh, I would like to know whether there are still questions from um, participants for uh, some of the speakers who spoke this morning. Okay. If if we if we if we hear no answer from that, uh, then I think we could uh, we could start with your demo at one. Mm. Uh, so for all of the participants, the, the demo, so the prototyping of open source and IoT network will start at 1 p.m. So there won't be, we decided not to break the rooms into more than one. So it will be on this same call. Uh, and so whoever wants to join, you, you are all already in the same call. So from 1 to 1.30 p.m., the uh, chi you will be presenting and prototyping uh, open source and BIOT network. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, maybe some of you are he already here and we're in advance. Um, if you want to maybe uh, start now even, uh, then we could not interrupt the lunch break. Up to, up to you, Chi, if you are ready already, you can start now and then we, we yeah. give a uh, free lunch break. Yeah. Chi, are you ready to present? Yes, uh, I'm okay. ready. Okay, so then maybe we can do this right now and then go for a break and then we start the, the training afterwards. Okay. So go ahead, Chi. Oh, okay. We can see your screen. Good. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Chin, a student from National Taiwan University of Science and Technology. 
Um, what am I going to talk about today is prototyping of open source NBLT network. And this is the agenda for today's presentation. First, I will introduce the features and resources for our NBLT base station. And second and third, I'm going to show the step to build up the NBLT ENOB and uh, show how to configure the NBLT module. And for the last, I will demo for the NBLT base station working with the UE module. Let's begin by introducing the features of NBLT. Um, for the frequency domain to support the IoT device but not occupy the old bandwidth, the industry decide to make it narrower. So narrow band, it means only have 180 kilohertz in the frequency domain. And for the time domain, the NBLT adopts the same frame structure as LTE. And there have three different operation modes can be implemented for NBLT, including in-band garbage and standalone. And for our NBLT, we use the in-band mode and develop the control plan solution by release 13. And the band we use is 28. And for the currently NBLT, only support one UE to connect. For the resource, the setup tutorial and source code, uh, there have a link in the Mosa 5G wiki page and you can go there to directly link to the HackMD. And if you want to know more detail for the NBLT dis design concept, there have also a paper also from the NTUST is described the Mac layer implementation. Before I start to show the setup steps, there are the software and hardware requirements for our NBLT environment. For the UE module and tool, there are all provided from the portal and the, the core network is provided by the Nokia Bell Lab. So, for the NBLT ENOB, the USRP we used is B210 or B200 mini. Let's move on the slide five, the setup state for the installing NBLT ENOB. Step one, to build up the base station. Everyone can pull the source code from the OAI GitLab and check out to the Tech 2020 week three to install the requirement, requirement package. Then check out to the branch develop NBLT to build up the ENOB. After build up the NBLT ENOB, to run the NBLT base station, we also have to copy the configuration file from the project folder. And they have some parameters in the configuration file we should modify them as the setting in the code network. One is the MCC and MNC, and another is the MNE IP address. Also have to modify the interface name in an IP address for your NBLT ENOB. The parameters for the frequency domain since we use the band 28, the default downlink, default downlink frequency and the uplink frequency we have already set that in the configuration file. And this page show the network connection between our ENOB and the core network. After you modify the configuration file and you can run the ENOB by LT soft modern and you will see as a figure show, go got sync. It means you have already run successfully for your ENOB and can prepare to run your UE module. Let's move on to the slides 
11 to set up the UE module. They have two modules we have already tested with our InnoB. One is BC95B28, and another one is BC95G. Today, I will present setup step for the BC95B28. This is our testing environment setup in Eurocon. We prepare one computer in Windows system to use the tool to control the UE module and use the SSH to connect to the NBLT NOB. To connect to the UE module, we use the RS232 to use SB adapter. There are two tools we use in the UE side. One is Q Navigator and another one is UE Log Viewer. Also make sure the driver has already updated when using the USB to connect with your module. And these two tools are also provided by the Quartel. First, run the Q Navigator, connect the to connect to the main port with module and uh, click the connect to module, you also can see the information for the UE module in here, like the right picture. And also don't, fact, don't forget to insert the SIM card before you connect to your module. Second step, configure UE module by AT command. Click QCOM to change the page to AT command. I list the command we will use in here. One is the reboot command. Every time we use the UE module, we have to reboot it. And the second and third command is used to configure the UE module. Make sure the scrambling and SI avoid have already turned to false because our file didn't implement the scrambling. The last command is to lock the frequency by ERFCN. It will reduce the time to search our InnoB. After configure the UE module, run another tool, UE Log Viewer, and connect it with the debug port. To analyze the message in UE side, we also have to load file protocol bin. The file is also provided by Quartel. After connect with protocol bin, there are two useful filters when you when you analyze the message in UE side. One is RC debug ASN and another one is NAS debug NAS message. These two filters can help us to know the message sent and received in UE site during the RC connection and the attach procedure. So before the demo, this is the termi terminal we will use show later. Um, the first one is the OAI in OB and the second is UE log viewer. The third one is Q Navigator, and I will use TCP dump in the code network to catch the packet in code network. Okay, can you see the screen for the demo? Yes. Okay. And I will run the NBLT base station by LT soft modern. To run the UE log viewer, we have to connect by protocol being as I said. And now we can we can run the and be out base station. Okay, uh, when to the gas sink, we can reboot our module. 
and the lock to the frequency. And we can see the message in the UE side. Also, we can try to pin the gateway. And we can see the wire shock to see the attach procedure and the pin packet. Okay, wait. We can see the UE do the attach procedure here and uh, he, it tried to send the ping data to the gateway. You, thanks, Chi. Did you okay? Continue. Mm. Go, go on, please. And uh, for the previous demo, we can know the current status is we complete the attach procedure, and uh, we can doing the pin request from UE side. And but we have a remaining issue is for the file decoding failure. Uh, it's uh, happen when after the random access procedure. Um, every uplink message from the UE side will happen decode failure in the file layer. So we used the temporary solution by enable the NBLTCRC recovery in CMAC list. It will recover some uplink data uh, from UE side. And now we can um, decode success the authentication response security mode command and attach complete from specific UE. But I think um, this issue also, uh, will uh, influence um, for the later for if you want to send a lot of uplink data. So it should be, um, be a problem for future. Okay, um, this is my presentation. Thank you for listening. Mm. So does anyone have any question? Thank you. Thank mm. you Chi, for, your, for your presentation. For the moment in the chat, I don't see any, uh, any question. Navid is, um, is asking uh, whether the uh, MV IoT development project is still active. Yeah, Chi, the question is whether this project is still some developers, they are contributing and you have plans to, for instance, solve the problem of CRC, solve the problem of single UE, so that this could become also useful for the use case validation. Mm, okay, so
Yeah, do you see um, the qu questions in the chat room? Um, I let me see. BLT only. Oh, the BLT only supports band 28 or test with band 28. We only test with band 28, but we didn't try to another band before. And if you want to try another band, um, I also suggest you to um, modify the configuration file. And uh, also you need to find the suitable EAF, it's EAFC when you lock the frequency. If you go to configure you event simulator supporting NBLT. Um, because our NBLT didn't um, merge back to the developer branch, so I think it cannot use simulator. We try to use the connect work um, from OAI to connect our NBLT base station, but it cannot support the Connect World will uh, reply the authentication request to the UE. Is the MBLT development project is still active? Yes, it's still active because the CRC problem we have to uh, we have to still um, solve. So the uplink issue that you mentioned, so update. Yes, um, the uplink data not, if you send to large uplink data, maybe um, larger than four bytes, the file will decode, will happen file decoding error in the um, ENOB side. Can be connected to different EPC than multi um, We only um, connect our Inob base station with the Nokia EPC, um, but we try to connect to the uh, OAI connect wall before, but there will have something problem because the OAI connect wall didn't reply the authentication response to the base station. Okay, thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Mm, I'm sure which motor valid for low power UC black or we don't have a catch without PDM. At least feature. Oh, because we implement this MBLT by release 13. Um, like you said, the early data transmission is for the um it's not including in the release 13. So this feature we didn't um, implement in the MBLT side. And also we only implement the control plan solutions. So if you want uh, at this feature, you can um, develop. For the future road that roadmap of our MBLT, um, I think the main problem we should um, solve is for the um, current MBLT base station, we only support the one UE um, to connect um, in the file layer or Mac layer or our IOC layer. I don't think that is available now quite much. Yes, it's too much. It still have much feature have to improve, improve to uh, in our MBLT now. Yes, I agree. Mm. Okay, thank you for your suggestion. Okay, so thank you very much, Xi. And oh. I would say that the so no worries because the the, the session and the meeting remain active. The, uh, 
And so either you, you could send some more questions and, and Chun could be, could be answering later. Um, and for all of the participants, you could uh, just uh, mute your, your uh, mic or either just rejoin later. So uh, that, that is completely not a problem. And just as a reminder for future uh, speakers for the afternoon training sessions, just if you have the, some, some slides or some material you want to be uh, featured and uploaded online, just feel free to, to send it to me. I already shared with you my, my email. There is name at surname at And um, I would like to thank all the speakers that spoke this morning during, during the, the first session. And uh, uh, now we enter in our uh, lunch break. And um, so we will restart with the first training session at 1.30 p.m. So 1.30 p.m. we will uh, restart. Uh, for the rest, uh, have a good lunch and we will uh, catch up later. Thank you very much to all. See you later. Yeah, thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. Again, uh, welcome again to this uh, Mosaic 5G uh, workshop. Uh, I hope you had, uh, you had a great lunch and I think we are good to restart with our afternoon session. Um, just to briefly uh, explain what we went through. So this morning were more um, uh, some some explanatory sessions on to some theoretical concepts and some more explanatory on what future road lines and roadmap will be. Uh, now we will go through uh, the afternoon sessions, which will be four demo and training, so live demo and training sessions presented by uh, part of uh, Eurocom Group. Um, the first speaker and even the host will be uh, Professor Nikaen, who will uh, talk and present uh, Network Store. And it will be a training with a, a first lot, and this will be more or less the same structure for all of the four participants. First lot dedicated to the presentation. In this case, we will have two use cases demo. One, it will be on manual 5G NSA deployment with some M Mosaic 5G snaps. And the other one will be a large scale L2 simulation and emulation. And finally, there will be some space for uh, Q&A. So I will leave the floor to you, Navid. And uh, yes, the floor is okay. yours. Sure, thanks. Thanks, Bruno. Okay, could, could you see my presentation, Bruno? Yes, we can, definitely. All right, all right. So welcome to the first uh, training session. So we kind of start uh, top down. So we start from the <clears throat> store platform. Uh, we would like you to understand what is the offering in the store platform, what are the components of the store platform and uh, what could be done with just a store platform by itself. So store uh, as of uh, uh, today is nothing but a distribution repository of components, uh, cloud images, the uh, data sets, APIs, uh, methods for ML AI, and uh, use cases. You see actually on the right-hand side, the figures, it includes many different pieces that uh, could be used uh, either by themselves or they could be used in conjunction with the other uh, platforms that uh, we are supporting. Um, so the objective that we set for ourselves in, in the store we wanted to maximize the reusability. So for instance, um, uh, the SDK that we are offering is kind of a, an abstraction on the top of the controllers that we, we have, for instance, FlexRun and LLMake. And this significantly facilitates the, uh, the usage of the uh, FlexRun and LLMake platform. And, facilitates the development of the app and also extendability of the app. So for instance, we could uh, use 
a monitoring app and use the result of the monitoring app in another app. So we could connect them together, like chain them together with the reuse the code and uh, with few lines, we could uh, perform some uh, operation, whether it is monitoring or programming or control uh, from the underlying platform. As I said, extendable, so you can reuse the existing component, like existing SDK, existing X apps that have been developed, such as, for instance, monitoring, radio resource management, performance analysis, handover, and so forth, and build on the top or even improve them such that matches to, to your use case. So these applications, because they are sitting on the northbound, they can be hot plugged. So their uh, uh, existence does not uh, necessarily affect the, the operation of the user plane on the radio on the, on the core part. And all of them are cloud friendly, they're cloudable, like you can uh, run them anywhere in the network because all of the interaction is done as of today through the REST API, and probably in the future, this could be also extended to some kind of message-based. message, message based. So in terms of, let's say, the, the, the features, what, what, what do we have in the story in the more detail? In terms of component, remember that at the beginning, I said is a repository of components, cloud image, and so forth. So here is a bit more detail. So the, in, in terms of component, we are providing the SNAP packages. So this is SNAP is a new way of packaging in a sense that the, the, the packages are uh, standalone and they can be, be used in different environments. So they don't have the dependency. They are like sandbox already and it is uh, ready to, to be used. These packages is not only includes the application such as for instance, uh, OAI, uh, RAN, OAI core elements or even uh, the flex run or LLMEC, but also has a front end to facilitate the usage and create an abstraction, for instance, to interact with the database, HSS or Cassandra, or to reconfigure the base station. It, it has all the APIs uh, for that. It also includes the respective Docker image. So we have a nested layer approach. So we take the snaps and on the top, we we build the, we build the uh, Docker uh, images. And all of these things you will see later, they are built under uh, CICD. Both the Snap and Docker, they expose open API. It means that when, once they are running, the Snap exposes open API and you can access them, a start service, stop service, restart service, get the journal, uh, configure them, reconfigure them, and see the health of the of the Snap or, or Docker remotely. So this is very useful tool for the orchestration. And also we have charms and the blueprints for different network deployment. Uh, in addition to facilitates the development and the deployment of the X apps, we are also having the network development kit and service development kits, which sits one on the agent part of the, for instance, RAN, and the other one sits on the top of the, the controller. Uh, the 4G, 5G service platform, this basically coupling, coupling the SDK and bring the X apps at the center, we, we could kind of build a complete uh, 4G, 5G service platform. So instead of having them as a infrastructure, we couple them with the controller, we couple them with the X apps, and it brings a complete uh, a service bundle. And all of this being uh, customizable and extendable. And finally, because both LLMEC, uh, FlexRAN, and Q5G and JOX, they expose API, a, a large number of data set could be uh, extracted. One example that is uh, easily you can do today with the FlexRun API, get the data set, record the data set, and this Robert we will talk. The same could happen with LLMEC and with the Q5G and JOX. So you can get the data and use them for some uh, prediction or some data mining and so forth. So let me kind of position what is network store, what is X app, what is NDK, what is SDK, because there are some terminology, but 
in terms of architecture where they sit. So if we take 4G and 5G as really the, the infrastructure part, right on the top, we have the NDK, which is really network uh, development kit, which is designed to be network friendly. So, and X apps could be to some extent also uh, deployed right on the level of NDK. Then we have a Southbound API controller and the Northbound API. And then we have here at this level, the service development kit, which really <clears throat> designed to be oriented towards the service to facilitate the, the description, deployment and reconfiguration uh, of the service for a particular uh, use case. And on the right here, we see the network store. This is where uh, some of the applications could be fetched, either go down directly to the infrastructure or come on the top of SDK. This will be shown later today on the Flex Run training by, by Robert. We will be showing you the, the network store and how the application is fetched from here and deployed within the infrastructure on runtime. So no breaking in the service continuity. So we, we, we retain the service continuity. Uh, if I want to give uh, uh, what applications today are implemented in a uh, store, I can classify them like this. On the x-axis on the right, you see the applications that perform some control commands they want to program. On the left-hand side, however, you see the consumer X apps. These are the apps that only reads data from the platform. They just want to monitor and, for instance, create some added value information to be shared for, for, uh, for instance, it could be for uh, other services, right? We have then on the Y-axis, we have uh, network X apps, the applications that really try to optimize or reprogram the network. And we have service X apps. These are the X apps that try to, uh, to uh, define the service to provide, uh, to satisfy the requirement of the service. For instance, in terms of the uh, quality of experience of the users in terms of the user satisfaction in, in general. So today you can find the monitoring and KPI analysis. You can find the traffic analysis you can find the slice service management, spectrum management applications in the, in the store that you can actually use them and uh, extend them. And in addition to, to these X apps, there is a dashboard. This is a useful tool uh, if you want to kind of visualize or you want to use it for uh, simple demonstrations uh, of what are the network components, what is the status of the network, how many users are connected, how many slides are connected, and what is the actual throughput each user gets, and what is the round trip time. So this tool is also uh, found to be quite uh, useful for uh, demonstration and prototyping. So then if I want to give you a bigger picture of more generally the X app space, what could be done uh, with the X apps, assuming that you already have your RAN and core infrastructure in place and assuming that you have the controller in place, then it's just a matter of like developing these X apps to, to, for for your use case, for the particular use case that you are considering. So if we go again on the network family X apps, those X apps that try to operate with the network, so they are technology dependent. If you go to the consumer, those that they just want to read, so you can definitely develop a KPI prediction app. So it reads the status, for instance, from LLMEC or from FlexRAN. It calculates the, the throughput, for instance. It calculates per service throughput, per user throughput. You could also have mobility channel traffic prediction just by reading the information that already is exposed to you. On the top, for the service, you can ha have, for instance, some analysis on the crowd or content distribution, which content goes to which user and uh, understand the, the, the content. 
the also you could have some network aware application optimizer this is a very simple example like you want to optimize the the video transcoding based on the uh, status of the network in particular for the radio access network since it's a bottleneck so this basically reads the the rate achievable rate on downlink or uplink for a particular user signal this information to to the application application calculates the sustainable tcp udp or rtp throughput and then instruct the video optimizer on the transcoding that is achievable through this uh, this path Again, on the right for the producer, we could have a data-driven optimizer for congestion management, load balancing, content-driven optimizer. And for the service on the top for the producer, you can have a private networking. We saw, for instance, a talk by Toshiba this morning. The slicing seems to be very relevant for this private networking. And this, we could describe the, the, the private network the the requirement and then this translated to the creation of the service as well as resource management or even uh, uh, even more so if i want to say a, a word uh, about the the roadmap for uh, store what we intend to do definitively we would like to provide more x apps develop more x, x apps for diverse use cases because now the, the platforms are, are, are quite matured. Uh, redesign the SDK and DK to be data driven. It means to include intelligence and semantic into them. This will basically not reinventing the wheel. We are not planning to implement ourselves the air, but rather leverage them in, in the in the framework. Extend the network store to support more uh, uh, app runtime application. And of course, support for the for the 5G, which is uh, upcoming. Yeah. So there are plenty of resources for you to to catch up with the store, understand what we are providing. You have, of course, the website. You have a Git that will, will be open to public as of first uh, of January. Uh, you have the snaps. So Snaps, uh, for instance, if I, I show you, this is the official site for the Snap Store, and you have all of the applications already available there. If you, you click to one of them, you already have a video, and if you want to install it, you already have the command to install it uh, as it is uh, given by the, uh, by the store, the, the instruction to install. Uh, we have also the Docker images. However, this is moved to the Q5G project, the charm and bundles, bunch of tutorials that are available even for the RAN aware video optimization. We have the Flex RAN uh, base station application and some YouTubes that could also help you to give you a walkthrough of uh, usage of the, of the store. Okay, I also for the completeness, I provided the um, contact information for, for a store. And I think now, it, it, Bruno, if there are some rooms for the questions or we, we could uh, kind of uh, go towards the uh, training. The, the I think, training. I think uh, there, are, there are still there were no no questions for the moment. All right. Um, so I think we could just uh, go through the go through the demo. Okay. Okay. Have the slides here. Okay. So let let me switch the screen now. The slides are where are the slides? Okay, good. So go to the demo part and then we switch. So you need to share now. Bruno, could you give the uh, token to Chi so that we share from his, her screen, please? You could already share from, from her screen, actually. Uh, Everybody could, uh, could share. So. I know, but wait. Wait.
You can share, you can share. Can you see the screen? Yes. Okay. So, um, Okay, the, the first demo is, as we mentioned, it's about the manual 5G NSA deployment. Uh, let me close this, okay. With the, just with the snaps here, we don't want to show you the automation, but rather we want to show you how we can use the snaps in, in rapid deployment of the 5G NSA. You see the component that we have in this demo is that we have a commercial UE, 5G OPPO uh, smartphone. We have uh, one OI RAN uh, E node B machine, another one OI RAN G node B machine. So we have two machines. One is running the E node B. The other machine is running the G node B. These two machines will be connected through the X2XN interface because this is the NSA deployment. And then we have the core network that is connected to, to this uh, setup. And then we have the application service, right? So, okay. Uh, the first step to, to um, deploy such a network is just to get the snap from the snap store. And the command is quite very straightforward. Snap install OIRAN will install for you the, the OIRAN uh, snap. And then we can do a snap list. Just one thing, Namid, uh, there yes. was a, uh, a message in the chat that the GitLab link, maybe the one you shared before was offline. Maybe, maybe we can yes, because see them later. that is still restricted. We are going to open it. Yeah, no worries. You can answer that question in the chat. Just to stop, please. Okay. So here what we, okay, here what we see is that the oil run the snap is installed and this is the revision 54. Okay. So now, could you go back to the slide? Okay. So now we need to check the permission for this snap, like because this snap is a, a sandbox, it requires to have certain permissions and resources. And for that, uh, we are going to uh, check the connection. So here we see the uh, we, we see the permission it requires. For instance, OERAN requires CPU control. It needs to access the logs. It needs to access the network connector, the network control, and also USB to access the, for instance, the SDR in, in our case. So once the permission is, is done, now we are trying to check the configurations first. So OI ran info, but info, it gives you all the information you require for, for instance, knowing the particular configuration file for the NSA. If you are deploying E node B monolithic, if you are doing cloud run, you have a DDU and RRU. If you are doing disaggregated, you have CUDU configuration for our sets for you, right? And also you can have access here to the USRP, for instance, in this example, libraries. And this is also the links 
to the to the open APIs that I was talking to. I will show you this uh, later. So now we need to check. Uh, go back. We need to check the configuration file. So this is basically the, the configuration file of uh, you know, B. So here what we see, we see the MME IP address. We see that the X2 is enabled, right? We see the network interfaces for the inode B, for instance, S1 and MME S1, as usual, as usual. The only important thing is the enable X2, the, the non-standalone mode version. All right. Okay. And the energy, of course, I, I, I can address. Okay, this is dot twenty four. Now we do the same for the GNOT B. And wait, could you go up? Okay, exactly. This is the, the GNOT B. Okay. Now we go to the configuration of the uh, X2 interface. So here we see the again the MME IP address. We see that X2 is enabled. And here we see that this is connected to the targeting, and this is the IP address of the target window. All right. And of course, the interface of the G node B for the S1 MME, S1 U, and also X2C. Okay. Now, what we see is that we are in the step to run this, the applications that are embedded in the SNAP. So the first thing we need to run is the enode B. And then we run the G node B and in parallel, we check the Wireshark output in terms of S1 connected with the MME and also the X2 between enode B and G node B, okay? So now we run E node B on the top and G node B on the bottom. Okay, so what we see here is that the con X2 connection between the G node B and E node B is also done. Here we have uh, X2 connection setup request and X2 connection setup uh, response. So now it, this means that E node B is connected to the MME and the E node B and G node B are connected together. On the right hand side here, you, you see the screen of the mobile phone, right? It is still in the airplane mode. So please. So now the, the phone is searching, searching to get connected to the base station.
And I mean, just to check, uh, you are on mute. It was just to just to know whether it was volunteered or not. Okay. So I was saying that still the phone is searching to connect. Okay. Okay, it, it's connected to somewhere else, no? It seems that uh, the phone is connected to some other network. We need in, uh, to see where it is connected. Uh, you, you see here uh, that the phone is connected to the 4G network? So we, we try to, um, we need to uh, maybe pick the network. Just one sec. So we are just trying to look into the problem. Just be patient with us. Uh, nothing crashed. The only thing is that the phone is connected to another network, uh, which is not our network. And, I, and this is, um, uh, we, we need to maybe become closer to the base station then. This is what we try to do now. It seems it is connected now. Can you check? There is a, let me check in the lab. I think there is a base station running here. Just one second. Is it connected now? Thank you. 
Maybe restart now. Okay, now it is connected. You saw in the screen. Uh, uh, if you look at the Wireshark, uh, we will see that uh, this phone is connected to the 4G and the 5G basis stations. Could you increase the size of Wireshark just for a second? Yes, he, here we see that the procedure of the attach is complete. And then we see that the secondary G node B is added to this uh, base station. Okay, so now that it's connected, we just try to uh, check the data connectivity for this user. So we, we see on the right hand side, we, we see the data rate that is observed by the uh, 5G, 5G user. And now we, we go to YouTube. And for instance, we, we go to the Mosaic 5G YouTube uh, channel. So apart from the issues that we have got for the radio, you, you see that the starting of the G node B and E node B is nothing but installing the stuff from the store and then uh, configure it uh, properly and then deploy it. There is no uh, other uh, uh, operation that you need to do in order to, to run the whole uh, uh, 5G in a non-standalone mode. Could you go to the slide please, G? So what we, we did here is that we, we just showed you that uh, with few commands, installations, checking the connections for the permissions, configurations, and then you, you run both E node B and G node B, and then you can easily uh, co connect the, the cuts you eat. So with this part, and this all of this was completely manual later in the Q5G, you will see that all of this process could be uh, automated and using and leveraging the Docker images and the Kubernetes to, to deploy. And also you saw in the morning uh, from R2 lab, the deployment of uh, 4G network uh, uh, in an automated manner. So now that we uh, finished the, the first part of the uh, demo, now we would like to also show you the, the simulations aspect of uh, Opener interface and Mosaic 5G. Could you go to the next slide, please? Okay, now the this demo is about the larger scale L2 simulations emulations. We have three machines here. One machine is running the Inode B and the UE uh, connected through the FAPI interface, so through L2. So there is no physical layer for these simulations. They are connected through S1 to the uh, 4G core network, HSS, MME, SP Gateway C, and SP Gateway U. All of them deployed uh, as a snap. And then you have the uh, application server on the SGI interface uh, IP. Next slide, please. Okay. So the process is the same uh, installing the OICN snap from the store and installing the OIC uh, snap from the store. So to install the uh, OIC snap, the command is easy. So sudo a snap install OIC. And now we do a snap list just to, to, to show you that the OIC snap is installed.
Could you share the whole screen? Or you cannot? Okay, okay. Okay, let, let me continue because we are switching the screens from the PC to the uh, presentation. It doesn't seem straightforward. So the steps we are going to show you is uh, as, as previous. Assuming that you already installed OIC Snap, we, we check if the Snap is installed. We grant the permissions for the OIC Snaps and we are going to show you the, the permissions that this Snap it requires. Then, we run the open air uh, OIC and a snap. So SP gateway, uh, MME and HSS, we run the OIC and then uh, we will show you the output. Then we connect, we have a telnet interface that you, you, you see uh, on the top of the machine zero. We telnet to this uh, application. So we telnet to, to UE or to E node B and we start the UE zero. So the UE start, UE0 starts the attach procedures. And we see that the UE0 get connected to the, to the base stations. We check if the UE0 has the IP interface. So if config OI tune UE1, and then we start pinging Google from this particular user. So this user, this emulated user that is already attached to the emulated e -node B and connected to the core network, we, we try to see if this user has the internet connections. Once this is validated, then we could go for the, uh, for instance, more TCP, uh, UDP uh, traffic pattern using uh, iPerf. So let's, uh, let us switch the screen now. Navid, in the meantime, uh, I would like to, inter to interrupt you just because there is one question that is related to, to what you just said. Uh, the question from Badi is, does UE sim simulate one or multiple Ex servers? We are coming, it is uh, large, is basically designed to support large number of UEs. Uh, we are going to show you up to 32 UEs uh, in, okay. this, uh, in this uh, training sessions. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the question. Okay, now we go to the screen. So what we have here is, uh, is the kind of a console for all the windows you need for, for this uh, demo. So first we do a snap list and we see the OIC is installed. Then we do um, the uh, check also for the core network as well. Okay, now we, we run the HSS, you see on the screen. We run the MME on the top. We run the SP Gateway C, and then we run the SP Gateway U. A again, our objective here is to show you how things could be done manually. If you really want to control everything, uh, we want to go through to, to this level, but you have tools also to automate the deployment for the core network. You have a Docker Compose. You can uh, deploy them uh, quite easily, better than uh, a command line. So now what you will see is that we are going to uh, run the OIC in e node B. So this is uh, running. And we, we run the OIC UE. What you need to observe on the Wireshark on the uh, right hand side, we, we see that the S1 interface uh, connections of uh, emulated E node B to the core network. So now at this stage, the, um, at this stage, the, the E node B and UE, they are connected, but no UE is starting the attach procedures. So now you see on the, uh, on the bottom, uh, terminal, the telnet, 
to to this uh, user and then we say enable ue0 so once we do enable ue0 this emulated ue gets connected to the base station and we see the output in the wireshark so this means that this emulated ue uh, as in a real ue got connected to the uh, to the base stations now what we want to show you is that we want to show that this user has a tune interface so you see that this is the interface of the UE, the tune interface. And now we want just to make sure this UE has an internet connection. So we do a ping, we bind to the interface of this particular UE, which was 12.1.1.2. And we send this to google.com. And we see that it is connected. This UE has a connectivity to, um, to the internet. We also check with the iperf just to get some idea of the performance. So the application server is outside of the core network. It's something that resides after the, uh, is connected to the SGI interface. So we, we bring up a iperf server with, in this application server, and we start the iperf client on the user side. And please note here, we bind this iperf client to the user IP address, which was 12.1.1.2. So now we see that it is connected. It is connected here. We limited the bandwidth to half a megabit. Now you can increase the bandwidth just to, 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 to check. So put, uh, put maybe uh, eight megabit for instance. So we see that this user is connected to this application server and has the internet access. Now we want to show you the connectivity for the large number of UEs. So now we want to connect 31 users to this emulated base station. So there is this script uh, that is already provided in the SNAP. It is called a start UE. So first thing we need to understand is that we need to provision the, the uh, Cassandra database with all these UEs that you plan to, to add. So when you do the dump user, so OIHSS dump user, this will show you all the users that have been provisioned in the, in the HSS uh, database, right? And uh, maybe we can show the command for provisioning the, the users here too. Maybe what you could do, you can, uh, yes, uh, do that. Or maybe first we need to clean the users. We could clean the users. Clean DB, so we clean users, now do dump user. Now we see that in database, there is no user, there is no results as you see. Now we provision uh, this uh, 128 uh, users here. Again, could you please dump user? Now we do dump user. All of these users are provisioned in the database with a single command. And now we start uh, uh, the, the users. So look at the command on the bottom center. Start UE from zero, from one. We already have one user connected. And you see in the, in the MME logs that this user is connected. And I think our, our uh, not hyphen, no hyphen. Yes, go on. So now the user starts to, to connect, just observe the output of the MME. We can also observe the, the wire shark traces. Uh, We, we just wait for these 32 users to, to be uh, connected.
We just need to be patient a little bit. Then we will see the logs on MME. Uh, In the meantime, while while we do this, there are some some uh, slight questions that could be answered. So there is uh, one question from Borja who is asking: Does OI team work with Plexron? Yes, absolutely. That that will, that I will conclude with that. Uh, please, uh, you you observe in the MME that there are thirty two users connected, and now we want to check the if all of them they have a, a data uh, connection, so you can actually send data. So we have a script that also you have it available on the wiki. We we do a ping for all of these thirty two users. So this will uh, starts from. Uh, interface one to interface 33 and ping all, all of them. And we, we see that all of them are uh, uh, actually uh, connected. So one additional things that we could do here, if you look at the, uh, could you increase the, the size of this screen, please? Yeah, we see that here, the CQI for all of these users is, is constant, right? So. With this telnet interface, you have a, a possibility to have a more, uh, to allocate the, the CQIs according to certain mobility model or data sets that, that, that you have. Let's do a help. Let's do a help first. So we see on the telnet interface, we have a command called enable CQI. And here we could do, for instance, enable CQI star star. Enable, enable CQI, CQI. So this will uh, allocate random CQIs to the all the base stations. And we will see the output on the right-hand side of the inode B, the CQI is, is actually changing. And could you do again the ping, please? And still, we have the uh, we have a data connection with uh, with this uh, CQI. So with this, I am going to finish my uh, presentation. Please go to, go to the presentation. Okay, so. What we see here, uh, so we, we, we showed you the, the step of the provisioning of the users into the database, and then you dump users and you check if those users are provisioned. The script that starts the UE for you uh, through the telnet, it's connected to the telnet, enables the, the UE, and the scripts that basically checks the, the data plane. Then you can modify the CQ. If you have a model, you can actually pair user allocate the CQI to them and observe different throughput across them. And of course, the next step is that you can plug FlexRAN and experiment much more like a slicing resource allocation. Uh, and for that, I really invite you to, to watch the, the FlexRAN training to uh, see the possibilities that is open to you to experiment with this simulator, the core network and the FlexRAN and have some uh, impactful uh, research afterwards. So with that, uh, I conclude uh, the, these training sessions. Given that I used more time uh, that was expected, I try to answer your questions in the chat room. Bruno, is there anything thank I should do? Uh, this is not, I would like to thank you, first of all. Uh, normally, I would like to, to all of you know, so all the participants know, but as, a, as of a light demo, it's uh, normally that we always consider some some troubleshooting, and uh, so so it's it's good to to fix things uh, live together. So thanks, uh, Chien and Navid, for for your presentation. We 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 would move on um, with the uh, second training session, and the second training session will be held by Osama Rook, uh, all, also part of Eurocom and uh, Mosaic 5G Group, who will be talking about uh, Cube 5G. So always a brief presentation on the topic in a one demo in this case on one use case. So cloud native deployment and runtime reconfiguration and, and a session on, on uh, Q&A. I don't want to, to see any more time. 
Uh, Osama, good afternoon. Uh, could you hear us? Uh, yes, I hear you, but I cannot share my screen. Okay. Actually, okay. you should... Now it's fine. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. Can you see my screen now? We can see your screen. Yes. So, uh, hello everybody and welcome to this training uh, for uh, Q5G. Uh, what is a Q5G? Uh, Q5G, uh, it is um, cloud native agile 5G service platforms. From the point of view of a cloud uh, native telco applications, it is a realizable agile service platform for telco applications with the support of 4G and 5G networks. From the point of view of uh, network component and the cloud images, um, the design um, in uh, Q5G, it is a nested well-defined layer with a reusable and loosely coupled layers. Uh, additionally, these layers have a completely independent lifecycle management. What is more important even for the uh, network uh, functions is that they conform with the uh, CNCF principles uh, for cloud, uh, for telco uh, applications. Um, Q5G also uh, support uh, DevOps for the uh, to automate uh, the full uh, life cycle uh, from the moment where we got uh, the code um, or the um, you got through function, for example, from the Git, uh, from the Git or GitLab, until the moment to provide uh, your functions or new features uh, to the end users. Additionally, Q5G support uh, multi-version functions, uh, say physical, virtual, or uh, even cloud-native functions. In order to make uh, Q5G um, flexible and uh, can support uh, even more uh, features or uh, functionalities in the future, uh, Q5G support uh, extensions uh, like uh, Q5G operator that we will see it in this training for the objective of automating the deployment of 4G5G network in a cloud native environment, uh, Kubeflow for uh, machine learning, or even Prometheus or Elasticsearch that also uh, possible to support it uh, for the objective of monitoring. Um, if you would like uh, to deploy uh, your network in a cloud native environment with uh, basic um, needs like uh, install, uh, apply, have a provision or uh, configuration management, uh, so you can go ahead directly and use uh, Kubernetes uh, directly without any additional uh, needs. But if you would like to uh, get uh, more uh, features like seamless upgrade or uh, patch on a minor uh, version upgrade, you need uh, something additional more than uh, Kubernetes like uh, Helm. Uh, however, a Helm cannot support a different life cycle of your application and storage like follower and recovery. So we need uh, something uh, that can give you such possibility more than what can give you HAL, which is, uh, in this case, it is uh, Ansible. Um, it is better to mention, it is uh, worth to mention that here Helm and uh, Ansible, they are kind of like uh, um, the, the operator that uh, can give additional uh, functionalities or features uh, for you to, for the deployment on a cloud native environment. Uh, however, uh, for, um, for 4G and 5G uh, networks, so what we need even more, uh, la uh, like metric alerts, local processing for the objective of uh, monitoring or do machine learning stuff, or even for uh, auto tuning, abnormal detection, or uh, schedule uh, tuning. And here uh, comes uh, the uh, final operator, which is Go operator, uh, where we uh, provide Q5G operator for the objective of fine granite management, configuration, and automation. Uh, what you can, uh, uh, Q5G, uh, with Q5G, you can uh, deploy your network in around one minute with a zero touch configuration. Additionally, it can provide you the possibility to make a resource allocation in a shared or dedicated manner. Uh, with the open ABI that uh, we already uh, supported for the uh, whole CNF, uh, for uh, many CNF functions, uh, you can do a fine grained end to end surface control and monitoring. With the uh, CICD that's already supported in Q5G, uh, we, uh, you have an agile um, continuous development uh, and uh, deployment. However, what is also that you can do with Q5G? 
uh, to do function split, for example, for the run, uh, according to the uh, user traffic or according to the load in your network. Additionally, uh, you can um, deploy your network with multiple BLMN, like for example, uh, one run and multiple core networks. Moreover, you can customize your core network where you can define the uh, core network uh, to which this uh, uh, base station will be connected. Uh, with the support of X apps, as we saw uh, in uh, training of um, store, uh, we can do many fancy things uh, like performance monitoring, BLM and management, or even uh, cell configuration. Uh, you may ask yourself a question why uh, you need uh, Q5G. Uh, Q5G is in line with the Cloud Native Computing Foundation for Telco Applications, where the design of uh, Cloud Native Functions uh, conforms with the 12-factor methodology for uh, cloud native functions. Knowing that the 12-factor methodology is a well-known method methodology for designing uh, software as a service. Uh, Q5G also provide an agile and uh, telecom friendly uh, 4G, 5G uh, deployment for both the run and the core network with different deployment like uh, monitoring and aggregation. Uh, if you would like uh, to control your uh, network after the deployment, uh, also Q5G can support uh, control functions like uh, FlexRun and as you will see in the training session later and also LNMIC. Uh, and the more important thing uh, for you as end user, uh, Q5G is assemble and uh, easy to use where we provide a set of uh, scripts that easy to use for build, uh, configuration, reconfiguration, and uh, also to deploy uh, your network in uh, Kubernetes, a Kubernetes cloud native environment. Uh, Q5G uh, has its three main components. Uh, first one is uh, Docker, where uh, Q5G automate the installation, uh, configuration, update uh, of your network functions inside uh, the containers, let's say uh, Docker's, uh, where also you can build uh, the, the Docker images for different snaps uh, or also like maybe uh, we can uh, uh, build it for a new, uh, a new functionalities like AMF and SMF. And more importantly, uh, in uh, Docker, Q5G provide a rich set of easy de to deploy examples with a zero touch configuration. The second uh, important uh, component uh, in uh, Q5G it is Q5G operator that automates the deployment of uh, 4G, 5G networks in uh, Kubernetes with the uh, capability of auto configuration, reconfiguration, update, uh, or even upgrade of your network. Also, it can provide you the capability of deployment of, the, of deploying your network with different aggregation modes like monotic aggregation, disaggregation, or the aggregation. Uh, the final component in uh, Q5G is a CICD. Uh, which automates the uh, full life cycle of both VNF and the CNF functions uh, to provide a new functionalities or uh, features to the end uh, users in a quick and uh, reliable way. Uh, here we provide a quick overview of the uh, full pipeline for CICD, where we have first stage uh, built the uh, function as VNF, uh, we go to test it. The second stage, similar to the first one, it's kind of like build the CNF, test it, and after that go and deploy it in a production environment. Uh, as a software architecture, uh, Q5G, it's composed also from the, uh, the bottom to top, uh, your infrastructure, which could be a bare metal, virtual machine, or any uh, type of cloud. On the top of it, you have Kubernetes running, which can be uh, provisioned by uh, different tools like uh, Minikube, MicroKets, uh, or uh, KubeAdmin. On the top of it, you have your uh, container uh, runtime execution environment uh, like uh, Docker for the uh, CNF applications or uh, different uh, uh, runtime execution like Kubert or Virtlet for the application that they are not designed in a way that they can run directly in a cloud native environment. On the top of uh, the uh, runtime environment, you have uh, the SDK like Operator SDK with the uh, set of uh, Mosaic 5G component like uh, Open, uh, OIE for the run and the core network, FlexRun and LNMIC. The same also goes for the um, BNF. 
and on the top of all of that um, and on, on the top of uh, these functions uh, uh, we have open api which is a uh, very important uh, a feature that need to be supported in a cloud network environment for the objective of the uh, communication of the functions among themselves or, uh, or accessing to these uh, functions from outside of the world. If you would like to uh, deploy your network in a cloud network environment, uh, you can go and use a Q5G operator that automate everything for you uh, in Kubernetes. And after that, if you would like to do machine learning uh, techniques in uh, your deployed network, you can go and use a uh, Kubeflow. Um, as we, as I said before, the uh, the design in Kube 5G for the uh, CNF it is a nested layer design. Uh, the first layer uh, that is uh, composed of your application, like uh, Mosaic 5G components with a set of beans, labs, and frontends, as we saw in the uh, storage training which is packaged in uh, the uh, SNAP version sandbox. Uh, the second layer, uh, which is app data, which is important to separate it from the application for the objective, for example, of the scaling. Uh, the next um, layer is uh, utils and hook. Uh, utils, it is a kind of like a list of uh, a set of uh, helper tools that you may need it inside the container. Say here like Docker that you need, for example, to test your application. And the hook, it's kind of like magic uh, tool that uh, can manage the full life cycle of your application inside the container, like installation, configuration, reconfiguration, or uh, running up your application properly. And finally, we have everything package it in the uh, container and uh, additionally the function that can interact with other functionalities like uh, database Cassandra open ABI kubeflow for machine learning Elasticsearch for monitoring and all of them are working in cloud native environment uh, now let's go to the uh, CI CD of uh, key 5 g with a practical example uh, just to better understand the CI CD we have give here a uh, flex run as an example uh, so first stage, we, uh, we go and take the source code and we go to the uh, first stage of continuous integration, uh, where the objective of this stage is to uh, build the VNF uh, uh, version of the uh, function, where we take the code, uh, the build the uh, VNF function, which is a snap for our case, and after that, go and test it uh, with a unit uh, and integration test. If everything is fine for the uh, first stage, we go to the second stage, which is uh, which is uh, continuous delivery, where uh, in this stage, we uh, build a DCNF function using uh, Docker. Again, we have similar steps. Firstly, we uh, create a DCNF function, and after that, uh, go and deploy it in a deployment and a test environment, and after that, uh, test it for a set of functionalities. If everything is fine, with the second stage, we go to the final stage, which is a continuous deployment that can be achieved using uh, Kubernetes and the uh, Q5G operator. Again, we have similar uh, stages. Uh, go and deploy it in production environment. Make sure that all the functions or the new features are working uh, not only in the deployment uh, environment, but also in production environment. And after that, if everything is fine, we go and push the uh, both VNF and CNF version to be public for the all users. Uh, here we provide a practical example for the uh, case of uh, uh, Flexrun in Jenkins as a well-known tool for the uh, CICD, where we see here we can map uh, one stage to one or uh, multiple uh, sub-stages in uh, Jenkins, for example. Uh, for the building slab, we have three sub-stages. First one to prepare the environment uh, before building the snap, go and build the snap, and to that push it to a temporary repository to be tested later. Uh, as I said before, uh, in Q5G we have three main components. Uh, regarding the Docker, or more specifically Docker hooks, it is implemented in Golang 1.14. Uh, for Q5G operator, it is uh, implemented using OpenShift operator SDK, uh, version 0 0.7, and Golang 1.14. For the CICD, as uh, shown in the example, we use it uh, Jenkins. Uh, regarding the software or Q5G, it's uh, open source with the Apache uh, version 2.0. Uh, 
uh, to show the uh, reproducibility or the, uh, um, the practi uh, QFG in a practical, we already uh, re reproduce it in uh, Eurocom. Uh, and also like as you, uh, you uh, saw in the morning with the, um, uh, with the presentations of Professor Walid of out, uh, in uh, Ortolab uh, in Ria Sofia Antipolis. Uh, also, uh, we are um, um, working with Orange Omana to, to, to support QFG also in the context of uh, 5G uh, Victory Project. Uh, additionally, we have uh, also like uh, potentially to, to, um, to deploy QFG for Davidson Consulting, which is ongoing. Uh, so, what is next for uh, Q5G? Um, what, can, what is supported for the moment for Q5G as uh, um, a whole platform? Uh, we provide uh, possibility for auto build a configuration of Q5G, while we plan to support real time and near real time run functions for Q5G, and also we'll support uh, 5G. Um, uh, scenarios like, for example, non-standalone uh, mode, as we saw the uh, in the uh, training of uh, uh, SNAP uh, uh, in this store. Uh, in terms of the CNF, uh, we already support uh, the whole functionality of the run and the core network with uh, um, Flex Run as a um, con uh, run controller uh, as a CNF with the possibility of deploying your network with a zero touch configuration. Also, we provided a set of uh, rich examples for network deployment using Docker. Uh, as if um, we are planned also to support uh, other, function, other functions like AMF, SMF, uh, and OSCM as a CNF. And also definitely will support uh, also Open ABI for all these uh, functions. As a Q5G operator, uh, before you better already support the automation of uh, 4G, 5G network in, co uh, in Kubernetes with zero touch configuration with uh, the capability of uh, deploying uh, the network in different uh, modes like uh, monolithic and uh, aggregation. However, what is more important uh, also to support uh, Kubeflow, uh, which is expected to be uh, supported in the mid of, uh, in the, of uh, February, 2021. Uh, and also we can uh, we plan to go um, in more uh, fine grained uh, uh, automation and management for Q5G operator like uh, metric uh, to support uh, uh, deep inside like metric alerts and the log processing and uh, also autopilot like abnormal detection and auto config tuning. Uh, for the final component of uh, Q5G. Uh, we already support uh, an agile and continuous agile continuous integration and de deployment while we support the uh, deployment in the production uh, in the near future. Um, if you would like uh, to contribute uh, to Q5G, so you are welcome or also if you have like many interesting idea that maybe it's uh, also interesting for the supporting uh, uh, Q5G or supporting um, uh, 5G in cloud native environment, uh, so you are welcome for any uh, interesting and contribution. Uh, here we provide a set of resources that uh, could be interesting or useful for you to, to understand or to uh, hands on with uh, Q5G. We have the uh, website, uh, Git, where we provide uh, also the Docker, all the uh, Docker that they are already like uh, uh, working and uh, you can go and use them directly. Also, we provided a set of tutorials uh, to better understand the Q5G and uh, also with a set of examples. Uh, finally, we provided also like uh, a set of videos on how to, uh, to, to use and uh, deploy your network using uh, Q5G. Uh, if you have any questions, or maybe you can uh, contact us directly now via the chat, or you can uh, send an email, or you can uh, reach us a, a, a using uh, via the um, uh, Twitter or uh, LinkedIn. Uh, Bruno, maybe you can go to uh, training, or uh, is there any? Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. There is just one uh, one question that they asked, uh, Luis. Uh, he asked uh, about, does this mean that I can go to the repo and try Cube 5G in my K8 cluster? 
Uh, yes, you can do. If you already have your cluster, you can uh, use it directly. Yes. So you can just like go use a co 5G operator. No need to. Uh, I, I can show you like now for the you like need two steps configured and after that deploy it directly if you already have uh, Kubernetes. Okay, so that's perfect. Uh, I think we can uh, we can move on with the with the demo. Okay. Uh, so uh, with the demo, so let's start with the demo. Uh, uh, what I plan in the demo. So firstly, I'll show like how to build Q5G how to configure it and uh, how to deploy uh, two types of scenarios. First one for Docker, Docker Combos as an example of uh, continuous delivery and also uh, using Q5G operator for uh, to deploy your network in production environment. And here also like to, for the easy to understand, I show like the project layout. Uh, so the first step it is uh, to uh, build your uh, uh, Q5G so uh, it is, easy to you so you can uh, so using uh, this uh, the q5g you can just like use it with the hyphen i so it will install all the dependencies for you uh, like config manager where like the uh, important dependencies that needed python 3 and uh, some by, by, uh, by, uh, packages that's important to run it properly it will also install for the uh, docker and docker compose uh, to use uh, Docker properly for the Q5G operator, it will install uh, for you uh, Kubernetes, where for the moment we support uh, micro quiets and we'll support uh, very soon the Kube admin uh, to deploy your Kubernetes, uh, either like cluster in one uh, in mode, one node or multiple nodes. Uh, so here, just like to better understand, I am here like in the uh, project, so like a, a so like this is exactly the uh, file, so uh, the, the script is that you can just like go, uh, if you just hit it, it will show you like list of uh, the help that to better understand uh, the capability of uh, the uh, current uh, version of uh, Q5G. Uh, the second stage it is to, uh, Uh, sorry, something I just like miss it. So it is the right version. Uh, so what you need uh, to uh, to configure. So uh, you need to go to uh, the uh, either you have two possibility either you uh, with the built five G. So you can configure it either uh, using uh, the uh, short configuration file, where uh, the uh, short configuration file it is reside uh, in the uh, common uh, uh, directory. So if you go to uh, common uh, and config manager, uh, so we see here a set of uh, uh, um, the configuration files. So the important one, it is the uh, first one it is short. Uh, conf short uh, default. So if we open it, so the first stage is to go and uh, configure this one according to your setup. So here, like we provide the command, which is like for MCC and NC for your network. And uh, the second one it is to uh, define the DNS of your network also. And uh, this one, uh, if you'd like to change it or you can keep it also, it is uh, it's, uh, accord, uh, again, according to your setup. And uh, for the uh, base station, the important uh, um, parameter that you need to change it. Uh, so if you are aware of with uh, OERAN, so you can better understand these parameters. So you have here like your uh, bandwidth with the frequency. So this is uh, only the required uh, configurations that you may need to change it. We also here provide a different set of parameters that optionally you can change it, but it is not important. It's a Q5G operator can deploy the network with the default uh, file, with the default uh, uh, parameters. So after that, uh, what you can uh, do, uh, so come back again and 
uh, hit it with like uh, configuration and with the diff, uh, with the file that we already show this one. So if we just like hit it, uh, uh, Q5G will take uh, this configuration file and uh, will uh, will configure all the uh, uh, configuration files that they are needed uh, for you uh, for uh, Docker and uh, for uh, Q5G operator. So here we see here uh, it will uh, configure the custom resource file for Q5G operator. And here it will cost, uh, define or change uh, the configuration files for uh, for Docker. Here the uh, configuration file and here the Docker compose. After uh, go and uh, executing uh, this step, so we can uh, go to uh, the uh, second stage, which is like the uh, deployment, where we have two types uh, of deployment. The first one is Docker. Uh, compose as just an example of a continuous uh, delivery. So all what we need, go to where the, uh, firstly, the network that will be de uh, deployed is, uh, is shown here, which is composed of uh, the uh, uh, base station, Cassandra, the core network with, uh, in a re-aggregated mode where like all the uh, entities of uh, uh, the core network are deployed in, uh, in, uh, inside uh, one container. We have the base station, also as one container, we have the flex run as one container and the uh, inode B is connected to the front end that's composed of uh, USRB antenna uh, to connect later the uh, your phone. So uh, we can just like copy it. So we already here like a, a inside the Q5G. So all what we need just like to go to the right. Uh, uh, where like the Docker Compose resides. So we see here like two files. The first one, Docker Compose, and the second one, uh, it is the configuration file. So we see here like uh, the uh, configuration for the base station. If you go down, uh, we see here the uh, configuration for the flex run. So for the moment, we have only just like to define the uh, snap version and uh, also the configuration for the core network. So we see here, like for example, for the ME, define the MMC and MCC that is automatically configured for you using the uh, config manager. And the DNS also it is taken automatically using the config manager. So all what we need to do, just like uh, Docker. So if we come back again here, we see like Docker combos up in daemon mode. So now it's start like uh, to uh, deploy your net, uh, the network. And now we just like uh, need to wait for some time. So, uh, and here like we have the uh, phone, uh, which is a uh, pixel two that it is, uh, you can show so like, uh, so here we can see like this is USRV that is working as a front end. So we need just like wait for some time. So to, uh, for the network to become uh, ready. Uh, so uh, during this time, I can just like explain a little bit about uh, the uh, configuration file that you may uh, need it. So again, uh, if you go there, uh, CD command. So the two important configuration files, it is the first one, it is the uh, config short default that we already show. And uh, the uh, second one, it is the config global default which uh, has the uh, global uh, configuration, which is like, it is already open it here. So kind of like this file or this configuration, you don't need to use it. It's like already uh, configured in a way that it can work with any setup. It is uh, set up and dependent. But if you'd like to go in details, what is inside, 
so uh, seems to me like the network is currently connected. So like you see here, like the, uh, the user bit is already up. So we can try now to connect the phone. So now we see it here, like in uh, still in airplane mode. So we can just like activate it. Okay, so it seems to me there is some issue. Uh, looks like it's working. Okay, now so we see that it's connected to LTE, and uh, if you go, uh, for example, to uh, yeah, we see here like open our interface for network. And if you go down to check, for example, the IP address for the phone, so we can see here it already has uh, IP address. Uh, for example, we can check YouTube for the connectivity. Yeah, you see like we see already like it's already connected. Even we can just like check other for video, just like uh, to make sure everything is fine. So uh, this is, uh, that's it for the first uh, uh, deployment. And now let's go and uh, to the second deployment. So uh, what we need to do uh, to stop now the network. So all what we need just uh, down to make the network down. So we here, like we see that like, uh, try to make the uh, component uh, down. So before like the order, like uh, flex run, uh, Cassandra, uh, CN and run here, like it is like in the inverse order. So run kind of uh, run CN, Cassandra and the flex run. Okay. So uh, this one we already demonstrated. So now we can go to the next uh, stage. On the uh, demo, we deploy a Q5G operator uh, in Kubernetes environment. So here we deploy a 4G plus network with like a uh, disaggregated mode where every component of the core network, uh, say HSS, for example, I can show you, uh, HSS, MME, SP Gateway, say, uh, and the SP Gateway, you user plane, like uh, all each uh, deployed in a different uh, pod. So now what we need to do to go to the uh, Q5G project, Q5G operator. Uh, so now to, to the root directory of a project, we go to OpenShift uh, Q5G operator. So the first step, what we need to do to uh, apply the custom resource definition for the Q5G operator. Uh, okay, sorry, now firstly, we show the uh, um, the Kubernetes is that it is already working. So here we show the set of uh, the pods is that already running. So for the moment we have nothing. And uh, if we hit per get nodes, we see already have uh, just one node that is working as master and as worker at the same time. So what we need to do again, uh, apply the CRD with hyphen N. So we see like applying the CRD. Uh, if you go the next step is to uh, uh, run the Q5G operator as pod uh, inside Kubernetes. So uh, just like to make it uh, uh, easy. So like also here we are in the same project, uh, just like to better understand Q5G. So here we are in the uh, root directory. So we go to OpenShift Q5G operator. So what all what we need to start the uh, Q5G operator as a pod inside the Kubernetes. So we already see here that already start creating and now it's already working, the Q5G operator. Uh, the next stage or the next step, it is to uh, go and deploy your network with the flex run in disaggregated mode. 
So we can see also here, we are just like, uh, but also here the command for to easy to use it. Uh, this aggregate is T12. So like you can just copy it from here and add a flex run to, uh, to deploy also a flex run in the network. So we see here where they start deploying the core network uh, and uh, you can just sort like that. So we see here like uh, Cassandra uh, database, we already saw it here, Flexran, uh, HSS, MME, uh, SB Gateway say and SB Gateway U and uh, DRAN. So already like deploy it and now we just like need uh, some time to, uh, so that like the base station connected to the, uh, to, the core, to the core network or more specifically to MME. Osama, sorry for uh, interrupting. I just that now we are talking and we are talk, we are targeting an open shift uh, uh, environment on Red Hat. There was a question related to this um, from Faisal, and he asked whether he could use a Cube Five G in Ubuntu environment. In Ubuntu environment. Yes, actually, it is Ubuntu environment. So I can show you, like, if it is like LSP uh, release A. Uh, yeah. So you see here, like uh, it is like Ubuntu 18 I'm using. Okay, so it's fine. Yeah, maybe, maybe, okay. It was just because you were, um, you were on a Mac and it was a question that was asked before. And so maybe uh, I still didn't see the, yeah, the, this, the version. Yeah. Sorry, I forgot to mention that. So like uh, for the, uh, this demo it can support Ubuntu 16 and 18 uh, without an issue. Okay. They also asked whether run container can be configured with node affinity properties, but then I, I don't know if you saw the chat later, but there are some questions that were. Uh, okay, for the run, I can show you in details what you can configure for the moment. So like if you go here, uh, okay. Uh, I can go like to firstly to uh, the short configuration file. So we are here. So uh, conf short default. Okay. Uh, so here we have the, uh, this is easy to use as we have like the, uh, the uh, bandwidth that you are using. Uh, you have the uh, number of uh, physical resource block in the downlink and uh, you have TX gain, RX gain. You have many other parameters. So it's like nearly the majority of the parameters that you may need to configure for the base stations already supported. Okay, perfect. So I think that this uh, will, will, will answer the question. The last question that is asked is from Luis and he's asking, where is the CN configuration? Uh, where? Yeah. Uh, CN, sorry? CN configuration, yes. Uh, CN configuration, okay. Uh, Okay, this young configuration for the moment we, uh, okay, uh, you have uh, two ways. Either you go to, uh, conf, uh, to change uh, the uh, conf short default. If this is what you can satisfy for you, for the moment we support uh, the MCC, MNC, and the DNS and the APN. Uh, otherwise you go to the, uh, the global or a long configuration file where you can go down uh, you see here, like here, for example, we can see the uh, database. We have also like, it's kind of like for more details, if you are more interested in it, you have database for the uh, MySQL. Uh, here you can configure, this is for Kubernetes. You can specify the resources, the limit and the request. And this is also applied for, sorry? No, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, so this is applied for the all components, not only for the database. Okay, I think this answered this question as he, he, he replied with thanks. So I think I think this was this was good. Okay, so uh, like here also for the core network. Cool. You 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 can keep going. Just okay. No uh, other questions. So now let's check with the, like the. Uh, sorry. Yeah. So now we see like the um, user base again up. So we can try to connect it to uh, phone again. So yeah, this uh, da, 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 da. Uh, 
yeah, it's just like matter of hardware. Sometimes it gives an issue. Uh, Uh, yes, so like uh, for this one, either we have the possibility if you have like the problem that the phone cannot connect, so either you can restart the phone or redeploy the network. So we can start with the, for example, restart the phone or uh, redeploy the network. So it's also like it's also uh, good to show you how to uh, stop the network. So like just hyphen D, you can stop your network. So we can see here uh, the uh, the network that you can, uh, all the ports are related to the uh, database and the run and the corner to call this uh, stopping for the moment. So we can just like apply again the same uh, uh, command. Uh, so during this time, so I just like to uh, give more uh, details if you are more interesting. So like here we see here some uh, some parameters that like commented. So if you'd like to use it, you can just like and comment it, and it will be like uh, taken to consideration directly. So for example, here for if you'd like to specify the resources, the limit, and request. Uh, for your entity, you can define it directly. Uh, also, additionally, that uh, it was somewhere here. Yeah, you see here, for example, uh, KS not selector. Here, you can specify. Uh, on which node exactly uh, your uh, uh, your port will be deployed. For example, here I specified that like it will be deployed on the uh, node it has this label. So if I go here, I can show you. Keep control. Uh, get nodes. Show. So you see here, like in the labels, we have uh, exactly the uh, the labels that we already, that we specified uh, here. So you can do, if you have like your cluster, uh, uh, community cluster with multiple node, and uh, you can specify on which uh, entity or in which node exactly you would like to deploy a certain entity. So just like to make sure that's working. Okay, let's try again. Yeah, now we see that uh, it's connected. So it's jumps sometimes like uh, the phone doesn't connect so it's just a matter of hardware now we see the phone it is connected and uh, again and uh, we check on now like for the internet connection uh, we see everything is fine So uh, additionally, we can check the same, like the, it has also IP address, uh, just. Uh, so now we can uh, go to the next and the last step. It's uh, to uh, deploy. So now the last step is just like uh, to uh, switch from the uh, disaggregated mode to re-aggregated mode. So for example, you imagine if you, in your network, like you have less traffic and the, the 
uh, core network uh, has it needs uh, less resources so you can just combine them in one pod and you can deploy it in a certain uh, uh, node so all what we need just like uh, to uh, execute uh, this command to uh, switch from the uh, disaggregated mode to re-aggregated mode So we see here again, like deploy uh, your network all in one mode. That is like a uh, re-aggregated mode with the flex run as a controller. So we see here like an important notice that we what we already supported in uh, QFG operator. So like the shared entity will not redeploy it. So we can see that from the edge. So like uh, here it is still working. So we did not remove it as uh, these two entities are shared between the two modes. So if you come back here again, so we see that uh, the uh, controller and the, the base station are con uh, shared between these two models, so we just keep it. We do not uh, redeploy it. Uh, additionally, I can show you also here. Uh, I think I have two more. Uh, as uh, we saw, like in the uh, during the uh, training of uh, store, we uh, said that uh, these NAB uh, functionalities already support uh, API, so you can access uh, to the API uh, to uh, open API for every entity using uh, the ports. So with a logic increment for HSS, MME, SB gateway, uh, start by HSS for the um, Open ABI and Open ABI manager. So it's like matter seems to me just like. So this is for the Open ABI for the uh, HSS and uh, this is for the manager. Let's say that to manage the Open ABI, for example, if you want to change the uh, IP address, if you want to change the port, if you want to restart the uh, ABI, you can access from uh, this port. I can show you a real example when the uh, network is deployed. So now we see here the uh, user bits connected again. So we can check again for the internet connection. So we see here like it's uh, connected directly. So uh, we can check, uh, uh, for example, uh, ta -ta -ta. I need to access Uh, for example, if I go to the uh, CN, I get the IP address. Um, you see, uh, for example, for uh, MME, if I go here for the MME, it was triple P2. Osama, in the meantime, there is just one, one technical question they, they want to know. I, I didn't answer personally because I don't know the technique you use, even though there are multiple. They want to know how you have connected uh, your laptop to the phone without Wi-Fi or cell network. Ah, uh, actually, it is uh, just uh, mirroring. It is like, uh, for example, here I'm using a visor. There are many applications, but for me, yeah, exactly. I'm using visor here, just like to uh, mirror your phone. Exactly, exactly. Thank you very much.
So it's just like loading, it, it takes some time because it's like uh, it's such connection. So it's uh, not so quick. I can do it here and Google. Ten. Or we can, for example, just to make it a bit curl. Status. Yeah, for example, here I can just like to show you an example. So it's like the same, but it takes just some time. It's a matter of uh, time. So I can show you here like using call. So like it can give you like, for example, if you go to the status, you can go to the status of MME. We see here the MME is enabled and active. If you go to, uh, for example, journal, uh, yeah, so here it's like, it'll show you the uh, journal of MME. And if you can just like go like that. Uh, so you see here, like uh, journal of MME, show the, uh, as we saw that in the uh, training of uh, a store, we have like, uh, I mean, uh, the connected, it is uh, one in what B uh, and one uh, user equipment is connected. In the meantime, there is a, another question from, from Patrick who is asking, uh, is it possible to connect OICN or uh, NS3 simulator? Uh, for the moment, uh, we did not support it. Okay, I can show you like that. So it's kind of like, to me, there is the issue in here, so I can, what I can do, like, one minute. So this is like uh, just uh, the second phone. So what you can see here, this is the open ABI. So uh, I hope that you can see well. So this is the IB address with uh, the ID uh, with support. So we have here like open ABI manager. We have uh, three parts. Uh, the first one, uh, MME. MME API and MME uh, API manager. So if you go to the first one, for example, uh, we see all the list of capability that it can be uh, supported for MME. So you can get, for example, the configuration. You can just like go try out and exit. So you see here, like the, uh, give you like the configuration file. You can, for example, config show. Again, just one click and it will show you the configuration files of for enemy. So this is, uh, and uh, many other things that you can do it with the other uh, functionality that we already provide. So again, here status all, yeah, we see here it's already so, so it is the same. Uh, so we have the same functionalities for status all, for example, if we try it, so we have all the uh, functionalities for this uh, entity. We here see uh, uh, MME that is already active and uh, the service ABI manager, it is like, it is uh, by default, it is not active. While we see the ABI, it is active. Okay, Osama, I would, uh, so oh, first of all, I would like to say if, if there are, so for the following five minutes, either so uh, we we for the ones who want to have a small break in the meantime you have other five minutes to maybe conclude uh, just just not to run over time and um, and then there was uh, just another question so still related to why sim they wanted to know whether you can leverage the, this infrastructure to connect it to to connect oi sim uh, actually, uh, again, we did not support it yet. Uh, so, like this is, uh, we will, uh, we are planning to support it in the near future. As we see here, like there are different many functions not supported yet. Uh, AMF, 
uh, SMF and including your OACM and OIUE, also like you supported in the near future. Okay, good. So for the moment, it's not supported yet. So just uh, just as a reminder now, um, so if you still need to finish, of course, go ahead. In the meantime, for, for the ones who want to have a... I, I uh, already finished it actually. This is the last uh, brief. Okay. So like, uh, that's it for me. If, if you have any okay. other questions, well, you are welcome. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, so we have a five minutes break in order not to go off schedule. And then we will continue at 3.30 with uh, uh, the last two trainings, one on Flex Run first by Robert Schmidt, also part of Aeregon Mosaic 5G, and one on LLMAC. So we, we will catch up in uh, five minutes. Thank you, Osama. Thank you very much. Here we are again. Good afternoon, sorry for the short break. But uh, in order to make it with the schedule, it's uh, good to, to stick to timings. So um, I would like now to welcome Robert Schmidt, also from, from Aragon, Mosaic 5G Group. Uh, we'll be holding a training on to FlexRun. So um, implementation of a flexible and programmable platform for a software-defined radio access network. Hi, Robert. Could you hear us? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Good afternoon to you, and the floor is yours. Can you see the slides? Yes, we can. Okay, very good. So, um, hello, everybody. So, my name is Robert. I am PhD student here in uh, Eurocom under the supervision of uh, Navid Nikayan, and I'm also the maintainer of FlexRun, and I'm active developer for Open Air Interface. So, and uh, without further ado, let's directly get into the slide. So I will first uh, start with a little presentation on FlexRun, and then we will come to the demo and some workshop to show you how to use FlexRun. And I will try to go over most of the northbound APIs. So first of all, for those who are not that familiar, what with FlexRun, what is FlexRun? So the generic definition could be something like a flexible and programmable platform for software-defined radio access networks. So software-defined uh, networking, for those who don't know, come, it comes ex actually from the wired uh, world. So initially, or basically in a normal network, you would have switches that make autonomous decisions on where to transmit packets. And uh, the idea was to take the logic out of, the, of those switches or routers and put this into a central controller so that you could have a network wide, wide view over what flows traverse through your network and that you could like make more efficient decisions. And uh, this same concept can be, of course, applied to radio access networks. So then you have software-defined radio access networking. And now FlexRun is the flexible and programmable platform so that we can apply this to open air interface in this case. So what are the features? What can FlexRun uh, do for me? So first of all, there is a centralized and distributed real-time control. So first of all, centralized because you might have applications that run within the controller, but also on top of the base station and that can make uh, decisions for the network. And um, uh, real-time since you can make those decisions on a millisecond basis. Furthermore, then, as I already said, in general, for the software-defined networking, what is uh, typical is the decoupling of the control uh, of, I mean, in, in SDN, generally, you say the coupling of user plane and um, uh, control plane. What we rather for FlexRun say is that we have the run control plane, so uh, tight protocol mechanisms like, for example, HARC operation that run within the base station, but the control logics can be taken uh, into the controller so that you could decide uh, what, uh, how, to, how the base station should be, uh, behave in a general um, manner and which could then uh, extend the base station control through the FlexRun protocol. Furthermore, as I already said, you have uh, control applications either on top of the controller or within the base station. So uh, there is a certain abstraction through the FlexRun protocol and you could on the fly also upgrade certain control functionality without affecting the, the, the system. And finally, uh, as an extension of this, you can have control delegations. So you can delegate uh, control between the controller and the base station in both directions. So uh, let's uh, bring it a little bit more to the use cases that we might uh, 
um, implement. So we might have, so on the left, what you can see, what I put in, in bold is actually the names as they appear in the documentation of Flextran. So I will show this later. So the implemented use cases basically are statistics. So for general monitoring, what you might need for, for um, you, the implementation of your control of your operation. Then there is the net store, which is general generic programmability through applications that can be deployed on the base station. Then we have the elastic monitoring and the recorder, um, northbound APIs and applications with which you can uh, record the run state or the statistics with which you could then do data mining or analysis or possibly machine learning and so on. There is the PLMN, PLMN management, which you could use for run sharing or MOCN as 3GPP calls it. So the multi-operator core network with which you connect to multiple core networks of different operators. And this you might also use for end-to-end -end network slicing. Then you have the RRC control endpoint with which you can do mobility management. So uh, trigger handovers. You have a cell configuration policy to do a spectrum management, to reconfigure a base station, to use a different frequency. And uh, for what Flexrun is quite known, I guess, is the slice configuration. So network slicing, configure different slices, configure the scheduler and so on. Other possible use cases that you might implement are, for example, video optimization, dynamic functional splits that you can change. Uh, coordinated scheduling, possibly for multiple base stations by using uh, interference management inf information and in general then interference management and probably also admission control and uh, any use case that you can think of. So of course we didn't implement everything, but in theory you could implement everything of course. So the architecture in uh, general, uh, I hope you can see my screen, uh, my mouse cursor. So there are two parts basically, which is on the run agent that runs on the base station and you have the controller. So let's first look at the agent. On the bottom, you have the run data plane, which basically means the uh, base station. And on top of the base station, or better said within the base station runs the run agent that accesses the base station through uh, the run API. So there is a first abstraction if you, if you want and which can also be extended. And already this run agent works like a local controller, which can also run the control applications as you see them directly onto the base station. And the run agent uh, also gives um, some support for heterogeneous deployments. So you might have, uh, for example, because this question came up in the chat before, a CU and a DU, and then on each CU and on DU that belong to one base station, you have uh, each a run agent, which then give the information to the controller. And this brings me to the next um, building block, the Flexron controller. So uh, the agent and the controller, they communicate via this Flexron control protocol that you can see in the middle. Uh, and then the Flexron controller is a top level controller now that has the information over, in a, in a first instance, over all the different run agents that you can have. But if you have agents on the whole, network base stations than over the network, of course. And uh, in this way, the controller has information about all the base stations, about the UEs that are connected, about their state, about the resources that they might access and so on. And I've already mentioned that there are control applications that can run on top of the base station. And of course, you can also have a control applications that run either within the controller or on top of the controller. And uh, Navid already presented to you the SDK of the store. So uh, you might have uh, different types of applications. And uh, finally, I would also mention two things. So there is uh, this framework for monitoring that I already mentioned before, Elastic Mon. And in general, you have the FlexRAM producer that you see here within the or next to the controller that could uh, export to such uh, a framework. And it might also be used to uh, export data to uh, a Mac platform, for example, LLMAC, as Teen will present later. So I don't want to go too much into the detail about the protocol, just to give you a high level overview what, what protocol primitives are there. So you would have uh, primitives related to configuration for statistics and measurements for commands uh, for event triggers and control uh, delegation. So for uh, configuration, this might be, for example, the bandwidth that the base station is using and that you would use for monitoring. 
for statistics and measurement would be more fine-grained measurements, for example, for a CQI, and in general, the, the uplink and downlink performance, for example, in terms of um, resource block usage or throughput, and that you can also use for monitoring for optimization purposes. You might have commands that the controller sends to the base station. So for example, a handover initiation, uh, you can have event triggers that the run informs the controller about new events, for example, that the UE just arrived or that the UE disconnected. And uh, then you can also have the control delegation that I mentioned in the beginning, where you would, for example, deploy and release apps that you use for general programmability and multi-service operation and so on. Uh, a bit more about the, the details. So um, if I... On the right side, again, you see the same scheme that we have just seen, so controller and the agent. So the controller is written from scratch in C++, and it has support for a hard real-time mode of operation that I will also show uh, in the in the in um, my demo later. And you can have the control applications with the global view that are uh, deployed within the controller, and the software release here is an Apache uh, 2.0 license. The flex run agent is directly integrated within open air interface. So it's also written in C as open air interface. Uh, there you can have this local control through the applications. And since it's integrated with open air interface, you have the same software as OAI, that is the OAI public license version 1.1. And uh, in order to make the control between the controller and the base station, there is um, the FlexRun protocol. So we use Google protocol buffers. And actually for the controller, we use the C++ version that comes directly from Google. And uh, on, the, on the agent side, so with an OAI, we use the protobuf C library. Uh, let me uh, say three words about our roadmap. So currently what we released recently is the version 2.4 and actually now there is a version 2.4.1 because while preparing this workshop I found some bugs. So and in this release you have these agent local applications that can be pushed. I will show at the end of my demo and also a new endpoint with which you can auto associate users to slices uh, based on regex so that you don't have every time that the UE uh, associates you don't have to associate by hand you could just say all you UEs from a certain network should go into a certain slice and what we plan for the future is uh, because Flexron until now only supports uh, LTE the LTE version of OAI is the 5G version and some basic ideas that we already have is that we would uh, ideally rather the keep with uh, the protocol buffers that we currently use uh, as opposed to the ORAN rig because they use ASN.1 and uh, but at the same time in order to align where possible we would like to align with the E2 protocol and ideally if we manage this properly hopefully have a compatibility at the north bone with the, uh, the X apps of the uh, rig. And in general, what we want to do then, of course, is to support all the 5G centric use cases that might be there, like beam management and uh, bandwidth parts and other things like this that do not exist in 4G. And with this, I would also uh, ask for a contribution if you're interested to contribute to FlexRun, to FlexRun 5G, maybe you already experiment with OAI. Uh, we invite you to come and uh, tell us if you have ideas, if you want to collaborate on, on certain topics, if we can help you, maybe you can help us, this would be great. Because in the end, Mosaic 5G is a community uh, effort. And uh, I would like to conclude the presentation with some useful links. So uh, as before, like website, the repository, the SNAP, uh, Docker, there is uh, the API documentation for the northbound interface. And also now we made uh, a documentation for the Google uh, protocol buffers, uh, messages that are exchanged between the agent and the controller. And uh, I linked to two papers, so the original FlexRun paper and one paper that we wrote for making the CU a DU split supported by FlexRun. And there are a number of tutorials where I listed the wiki articles in Mosaic 5G wiki and also some YouTube videos. And uh, if you have any questions, might be now the maybe the, the, the point to ask your questions. So I don't see the chat. I got some uh, questions before. So maybe because I noted them here, 
Uh, there were some questions about E2 and Flexrun. So I actually made a, a present or a one slide and maybe let's go briefly into this before I go into the, into the demo. So this is uh, the image that we saw before, uh, which is basically the ORAN architecture that you see here, where on the top you have the RAN intelligent controller, the RIG, which is a near real-time controller, and it's connected via the E2 interface to the DU and the CU. So everything that you see on the bottom here is a split base station. And in, from our point of view, uh, let's start with the similarity. So FlexRAN and the ORAN controller are quite similar in the sense that they both target to be a near real-time uh, RAN controller. So they both uh, support or, or, or can can influence the way the, the base station operates. And um, they both have also, for example, the support for the CUDU split. Uh, some of the differences is that first of all, FlexRun at this moment only targets or only supports for GLT. And uh, I mean, one of the reasons is that OAI works for 5G since two or three months. So we didn't really work on that yet. Uh, also, as I said before, Flexron has support for CUDU, but OAI doesn't have a CUCP and CUUP split. So in other words, we have the F1 split where we have DU and CU within Flexron, but Flexron doesn't support the CUCP and CUUP. One of the big differences, I guess, is that we actually use the Google protocol buffers and within the ORAN rig, they use the E2 interface that uses ASN.1, which is a big difference, I guess. And especially this comes because from what I've understood is ORAN, they want to maintain a large compatibility with a 3GPP and uh, 3GPP uses ASN.1 for everything like the ROC messages, the S1AP messages and X2 messages and what's on. And uh, we actually decided to go with uh, the Google protocol buffers for performance and also for other ease of use. And then one of the similarities, they both have applications on the northbound and uh, also the uh, in the rig, there is something like the E2 agent with an agent that runs on the different E2 nodes, whereas FlexRun controller has the FlexRun agent that runs on top of the different nodes. So I hope I answered some of the questions. There was also the question about uh, the A1 interface. So personally, I was only working on uh, FlexRun. I think we have already seen a presentation where there was uh, some integration with an orchestrator either here in Eurocom or I think it was some institute in, in, in Spain. Sorry, I don't remember now. Uh, but so there, there are some uh, projects that use FlexRun and that integrate. So in the sense, you could also see that there is some integration there. But as I said, we don't have the E2 interface and we don't exactly have the A1 interface. But uh, if people are interested to implement this, they can implement this probably also within FlexRun. So I hope I answered most of the questions. Are there other questions? Bruno, have we heard any other questions? Apart from the ones that you answered just now, I am. I was reading the chat. There was no other question. Just the one on A1, but you just answered. So it's, uh, okay. I think, I think so uh, then let me go into uh, the demo. So uh, here you see the demo plan. Uh, we will use the the this generic uh, deployment that you see on on the left. So for sure, we have the Flexron controller that will communicate with one base station and we will keep it simple and only have one base station throughout the whole demo. And um, so this base station in the beginning will be radio. So for numbers one to four, and then we will use actually the, the, the OAI SIM that we have seen previously for numbers five and six. So especially when we come to multiple UEs and so on, we will rather use the simulator because it's easier to control. And uh, then the base station uh, will be connected to one or two uh, core networks that run within the premises of uh, Eurocom. And actually, most of the time, we will only use one core network. But with it, during the demo, we will connect to a second one that are connected to the demo. So overall, the, the whole demo setup will evolve a little bit, which is, I guess, in the nature of the whole control thing that we are doing here. And I will start with a quick. Uh, just prime on how to set it up, which is really simple. Then I will show you how to do monitoring, how 
to make some basic analysis and how you might integrate this with other frameworks. Then we will talk about the PLM, PLMN management. So for having multiple operators with different core networks, we will uh, discuss uh, the cell configuration policy. So for spectrum management, for changing the bandwidth, then we will come to everything related to scheduler and slicing. And then at the end, we have the generic programmability with the applications that we deploy on the base station. And actually then in the end, there's still, still some sample use cases, but I cannot show everything. And I hope we can um, manage to have most of this. And by the way, I would ask you if you have specific questions or something that you want to absolutely see, uh, please write it in the chat and uh, Bruno will tell me so that maybe we can take some more time at certain things that you struggle with or that you didn't understand or that you want to know more about. So, and uh, before, or let me, ah, and one thing that I wanted to say, so I will have to switch my windows and I try to organize this a little bit. So on the top here, you see the different virtual workspaces on which so before here I was on four, which is demo plan. The three is will be flex run, will look like this. Here we will run uh, OAI. Here I will have this drone application in the browser with some uh, things. And here at the end, I will have the controller. And let me just restart this so I, I have uh, everything ready. So FlexRun, how can we install it? So first, what you would do typically is that you say sudo snap install. In my case, this is already installed, so everything is all right. And to just once you have installed this, then you need to um, give some, um, how do you call it, some privileges so that the snap can, for example, do certain things. This is all described in the wiki, so I won't go over this. And once you have done this, you can start FlexRun. And if you see this, then everything is already fine. And you could start to check within the browser whether your FlexRun works ex as expected. So there is the capabilities which you could request and FlexRun at the northbound always gives you a JSON. And uh, so you could always check this within the browser and then you would see that here, for example, we see that we have version 2.4.0. Can I make this maybe a bit bigger? That is running and we see what are the different northbound interfaces. For example, here you see the net store and where you can trigger, remove and reconfigure an application. And if ever you want to access something and it doesn't work, then it maybe it's worthwhile to have a look here whether actually this is present in the version that you're running because this can also be changed in principle dynamically, although we don't do this. So, and with Robert, this, we... Sorry to interrupt, there is, uh, there is just one question that is maybe yes. good to answer before starting with the technicalities. Uh, the, um, Luis is uh, uh, asking that he wants to create tight control loops. How easy it is to overwhelm Frexon API? Uh, so you mean, well, there, there, there are two things. If you, uh, you, the first thing that you could do is that you have an application within the controller and then basically uh, then it's only the, the, the interface between, between the Flexon controller and the agent that matters. And if it's, I mean, already tested and if you're, for example, an Ethernet network where you have sub millisecond round trip time, then you can have this within one millisecond and actually an application can execute within the controller every millisecond. So I will show this later in my demo, then you could make this frequently. If you actually access FlexRun from the northbound interface, so for example, an orchestration, orchestrator, then typically the round trip times are more in the order of a couple of milliseconds. So then you have already higher delays. And uh, from my experience, you can kind of overwhelm the controller uh, by making frequent requests. So the best, if you need some certain uh, infrastructure and you need some information and you know that you need it frequently, either you use the FlexRun producer that I can show you later, or maybe you write an own helper function uh, sorry, helper application that runs within the controller and that exports the information that you need for yourself, which is not that difficult to do. I mean, there are some applications and if if you want to implement something, then uh, you can also just ask on, on, the, on the mailing list and I can show you or tell you how to add your own applications, but yeah. Thanks, Luis, Luis continues and he's, he's actually saying, he's actually asking whether control loops, generally speaking, are, are a good idea and if FlexRun in the future will, uh, or already does, support uh, alarms or third-party storage like uh, Prometheus. 
so so yes um i mean it uh, to answer the second question like the 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 third party storage so as i said there is this flexron producer or it's also called elastic mon with which you can export data and we used this in a project previously to actually export data on a millisecond basis but since you cannot send packets every millisecond actually what we would do is like send bulk uh, packets where we would like every 10 milliseconds send send 10 samples at the same time so already with some delay in a foreign database you would have all this in information and the first question whether you can implement tight control loops yes you can i mean it depends in the end what is your real timing requirements when you want to have this every millisecond probably maybe the best thing is to do it directly in the base station if it's a couple of milliseconds there's no problem to implement this in the in the in the um, controller so for example in theory you can reconfigure the slicing every 10 milliseconds and i never tried it but there is no there shouldn't be any problem to reconfigure this every 10 milliseconds and react to what happens in the base station. And if you're a bit more on the northbound, then let's say on the base of hundreds to seconds, hundreds of milliseconds to seconds, there's no problem to implement this. So yes, but uh, then in the end depends also strongly on what you want to implement. And I think in general uh, for the Oran rig, this would be similar. I don't think that there would be any tighter delay there because they have the same underlying uh re how to say constraints and requirements so uh okay. i would go on yeah. to not to try on. to not lose too much time uh so i already discussed in the beginning how to set up and uh let's uh have a look at the general uh, monitoring and or the statistics that you can use for monitoring also for troubleshooting and that you will always use for control and as i said in the beginning we will use a real phone so maybe let me do the following and directly connect the phone here so i already had this present and uh, of course i need to first start the base station without the base station we don't go anywhere so here i prepared and i used the snap to start the base station and take some time to start and Now we are good. We could also look, by the way, into the Flexron controller, and then we see that there is a new base station with, by the way, all the capabilities that I discussed before. So this is a base station without any split. I can show this in a moment because there was also a question. So we could now this, uh, connect our phone, and then we see it's connected. There's some retransmission. This shouldn't be a big issue. And the first thing that we can do is, and uh, now I I wanted to show you and always give the link to the documentation. So now I'm within the Flexrun uh, general documentation and I'm basically on the real website. So if you're interested, you can also follow and see so that you see and we will discuss all the different sections. And what I will use now is that I go here, get the run statistics in JSON. And by the way, personally, I always use the JSON. I never used human readable uh, format. and then the first thing is, as I said before, we could go to the browser. So let me go here, just go to the statistics and we get the statistics. We see there is one base station with a certain ID. It has these capabilities and no splits. So for example, if you had the CUDU split, then you would see here that there is F1 and it would actually tell you that there are two agents. Now there's only one agent. And we see the statistics and you see, for example, the bandwidth uh, that you have, so 25 resource block, we see on which frequency it operates, we see what is the current PL PLMN ID, uh, we see uh, the scheduler configuration, so around Robin, we see that it's connected to one um, base station, we will come to this later, we see there's one phone that is connected with uh, MC20895, um, we also have the statistics. So until now, there is no not that much going on. We didn't download anything, so very little information. And uh, yes, and uh, most of the time, it's quite painful to come and back. And if you want to see to reload, so what I do typically is not even have a look here. What I personally do most of the time is that I use uh, the 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 terminal to look at it and i also put uh, this in the presentation that you will see later so what we will cover next is to how we can see this on the command line using curl and jq which is very practical and how we can also watch scripts so watch because then we can see this periodically and we i will show you how to use the simple scripts so that you could reformat the statistics so that you could um have a look at the statistics that are interesting for you. So as I said, first of all, we would use the this um, 
stats endpoint. If you just do it like this, then you don't see that much. So we already use JQE and we will reform it. And what we see is basically the same information as we just saw it. So PDCP, max statistics, if I go a little bit up, then we will see, um, oh, we have two phones, that's interesting. Uh, we will see that uh, here's the bandwidth and so on, all the same information. And what you could do, yes, thanks for summer for disconnecting the phone. Uh, uh, what we could do next is that, for example, if you're only interested to, let's say, the PLMN ID, so we would uh, go, let me go up because I still the same thing. We would see that there's this enode B configuration. Uh, we could go down, we see here's an array, so this means multiple base stations. We could go into inode B cell config, have the first cell config, and then see the PL, uh, PLMN ID. So we could go and say inode B config, inode B dot cell config, first cell. Then we already see the first cell and then the PLMN ID. And why do I show this? Because I want to show you that with JQ already, it's really simple to select something that you want to see. And in a second step now, as I said, we could use uh, scripts. So I already prepared a script for this workshop where we can see some interesting uh, uh, statistics. So I made this uh, JQ um, or this script that I will use in the moment where we can uh, select the max statistics from uh, the northbound object that we get back. And for each base station here, set the BS ID. And then for each phone that we see, have a look into the UE max statistics and list some information like RNTI, PDCP, and so on. So what we can do then is that we actually say, okay, instead of seeing this, we want to see with the script here the statistics. And then we will actually get uh, the base station ID, so what we had before, we see that there is a single UE and it has some statistics for Mac, for PDCP, it is connected to this base station. And as I said, what would be ideal now if we could see this uh, periodically again, so what we will use now is this watch script, and I will put this S here for silence, so we don't see this header all the time from curl. And then we see uh, the statistics here periodically, and you see that now by default, uh, um, watch updates every two seconds. So every two seconds, we see that something is passing, is happening here. And now if we get the phone, I wanted to make this little example with you. So what we can do then is that we, uh, let me uh, adjust here a little bit. We will get the IP address. We see that this phone is not connected. There is a problem here. Let me reconnect. This is the demo effect. Connect it again. And now we see it has the IP address ending on 04. So I will just do an IPerf and I already prepared here. I connect to the core network. I will send uh, to this IP address eight megabits per second for 10 seconds. So this equals one megabyte per second that the phone receives here. So this means sending one megabyte per second during 10 seconds, we will have roughly 10 million bytes in the PDCP. You see updating this here. So this is what we then also get in the North phone. And then there were already, I think, some questions about could we see a data rate and so on. Of course, once you have this information here, then you can calculate uh, this information. And this actually brings me to something that I forgot. So now we saw all these statistics and I wanted to before show you the drone app from within the store that Navid already showed earlier. So we can go and we go and see the drone app. So this is the drone app. And uh, this is just a visual representation of what we see. So basically this drone app just uses the northbound interface. So for example, if we look into the base station, I clicked on the base station, then we see all the same information that we saw before, like 25 resource blocks on a certain frequency, uh, PLMN ID, scheduling information, then the UE. And what you also see is, for example, the throughput here. And this is basically just calculated from polling the northbound interface every second, calculating, and then you have all this information with a nice representation. So this is the drone app that is within the store that you just have to uh, call with a, I mean, this is very simple. I can show you here. You would just call a drone app on a certain address, on a certain port, and then you use this here, call this, and you get this interface. Yes. 
So this was the same thing that I wanted to show you. And now that we have already seen a lot about the statistics, there is one important thing that I actually want to show you, uh, which can be uh, important when you, for example, do some monitoring. So what we have done until now is that some application, for example, curl or the drone app would go to the northbound interface of the controller and ask for the statistics. And as long as you don't ask the frequency, let's say every 10, every one second, then you will get a frequent update. However, what is also important, and then we come back to this um, tight monitoring loops and so on. What is important is how often the base station actually sends the statistics to the controller. So what is important is to configure the reporting quantity, so which statistics are sent and how often. And uh, for this, there is um, also within this that's inter um, group of, of North Point interfaces here, you can see get statistics configuration. And let's just use this for a moment and see what uh, by default happens. So I just paste this here. We have, we get the statistics configuration. I put JQ there. And what we see is that by default, Flexrun or the agent sends the statistics every 100 milliseconds, okay? It sends periodically all the statistics, but only every 100 milliseconds. So for example, if you wanted to do a count tight control loop, then you want to um, con configure this to happen more often, which I will do in a moment. Um, yes, but I wanted to show you one thing why this is important. I guess you can already imagine, but before I do this, I will go to the next section. So we have seen the statistics and now let's see uh, one other group of endpoints, which is the recorder that you can use for generate some data sets. So you would get information every milliseconds with very fine grain temporal traces. And I already put the mark here. So there you need the correct reporting quantity and frequency. And I will actually just show you for the sake of having shown this to you, uh, what happens if you don't do this right? So we go, we get here to the recorder, which is you now at the bottom and we record run state. So we will just go to the controller. We will tell it, please record. Uh, and I will say all for, let's say three seconds, so 3000 milliseconds. So what we will do now is I go to my window. I trigger this, let me put this aside. This is not important. All statistics, 3000 milliseconds. And now we look into uh, the the Flexron window and it said it created a new job. It will record for three um, seconds. And since it sampled every millisecond, we get 3000 objects which are in a file. And since this is in the snap containerized things, the easiest instead of searching the file is to download this afterwards. So we got the ID here. And if we go back to the northbound interface to the recorder, we can download the recorded run state. So we use this and at the end, we need to put the right ID. So here, as an example, this is one millisecond. If everybody ever manages to set to record in the first millisecond, you get a bottle of beer from me. We will put this here and then we can save this. So I will just put this in recorder.json. This is hopefully right. And we see it has downloaded 11 megabyte of data because there are 3000 times this whole JSON that we have seen before. And again, I prepared for us a little script to have a look at what is going on. And this time for every sample, I uh, show the recording time, the RNTI of the first UE and also the subframe number to exemplify, exemplify what I have said before. So I will uh, just get this thing, which is like a lot of data here, and I will pass this to JQ and we will get this into this recorder script. And then we see every millisecond, something is recorded. However, we see that uh, in every millisecond, it's the same subframe. And I said before, this is because we only upload or the, because the agent sends the statistics only every 100 milliseconds. So, and then you need to search and for some time. So at some point it will switch to 2,868. So it was here is 2,768, 2,868 and the following TTI. And this would now happen every 100 milliseconds. So if we go to millisecond 194, it will then change to the next one. So, and this is, uh, where was this? Sorry, here. 280. 
well here it's maybe there was uh, sometimes it can happen that there's a small glitch that there is some things that is not properly synchronized so you can lose some samples in the controller then you would have a lower number and not 3000 it might also happen that this happens for example in the agent but we have seen that every 100 millisecond there's an update so if you want to do this correctly and i just want to show you that this actually works i uh, already prepared also another configuration for the for the statistics so there we send every milliseconds and now i will just upload this so i post the new configuration here then i will start again the recorder as before for three milliseconds then it runs for three milliseconds and then I download this again into the same file. So 3000 objects have been persisted. We save this again. And now we will look again into this temp recorder.json file with the script that I showed before. And if what we should see now is that every millisecond of a recorded time, we also have another subframe, okay? So this long explanation in the end, just to tell you, if you want to record some data, if you want to make it a tight control loop, if you want to make whatever, then uh, please configure the statistics reporting as I showed on the previous slide here uh, correctly. Otherwise, you will always record the same information. And also one word why we don't do this by default every millisecond, because in the end, this is very demanding in terms of compute to send a lot of data and most of the people don't need to have this. So therefore, I showed you the recorder, how to make some data set generation. There is also the Elastic Mon framework uh, with which you could now export data into a database. So we, at the time we used Elastic Search, that's why I called Elastic uh, Monitoring. If you have some time at the end of the session, and uh, especially for one reason, because I don't have Elastic Search installed here now, we, um, uh, I can, however, show you how the FlexRun producer works and it's not so complicated. And the send is very similar to the recorder. You can just configure more how often you want to get the data and with what granularity and so on. Uh, are there any questions until now? If not, please interrupt me, Bruno. If not, we will go to the next part. And now I okay, will come. Hmm? There is just one, I just saw it now. There is just one question from uh, Luan Wang. Uh, he's asking whether is it possible to do real-time RB resource allocation through northbound API. Uh, yes and no. So as I said before, you can uh, the you can reconfigure the um, resource block allocation, for example, for a slice almost in real time. Actually, the agent only updates this every ten milliseconds but this would be easy to change. So yes, you could this, but not at the northbound because this whole HTTP exchange with JSONs and so on, this takes a lot of time. So if you want to modify this, let's say every 10 milliseconds and what you actually find in the literature are like optimization problems where they optimize the resource block allocation over a certain frame. So for example, during 10 milliseconds. So for example, you could actually write an application for flex run uh, where you have an application on the northbound that feeds the result of your optimization every 10 milliseconds. And then this controller application updates the agent or the, the base station user plane. So yes, you could this, but not by sending this through the northbound every millisecond. I hope this answers. Um, another question from, from Enrique. Uh, he's asking how you deal with the, when the R anti-I is changing all the time in the slicing part. Uh, this is indeed a problem uh, for for two reasons, but this is a the, well, this is a, both a problem from a flex run or in general a controller point of view. But this actually wanted by 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 anybody who has a phone in a public net. So the 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 the, the thing is, yes, the RNTI can change, and the problem is that typically you won't have any any uh, information about the UE because for example also the MC typically I mean in Flexron we see this but typically in the production network the the NAS traffic between the MME and the UE is encrypted and then you don't have any access 
So then it might become uh, complicated. And the, uh, with that being said, the answer for 4G is, I think, that the 3GPP didn't really foresee that you would have slices. And in 4G, it can be difficult to identify UEs. Uh, actually, I will come now to, to with and if you have multiple operators, you can identify the UEs. I will show you. In 5G, what you will have is this NSSAI, so the Network Slice Selection Assistance Identifier or something. So the UE can say what is the service it wants to get in terms of a network slice, and then you have this information. But what you will typically not get in a, tra in, in a production network is the MC because this is not wanted for privacy reasons that you get access. And uh, yes, the RNTI is changing all the time. So the RNTI is not really reliable. And in the end, as the name says, it's a temporary identifier, so you cannot use. And so long story short, and 4G is challenging, and 5G, you have more information for the information. And uh, But at the same time, it's a very good question to come to the PLM, PLMN management. I really have a problem with this word. Um, which you can use for spectrum sharing or MOCN, so multiple operator core network, and as an extension also for end-to-end -end network slicing. And uh, what we will do now, maybe if you let me go back. So before we had like phones and one core network, and what we will do now is add a second core network. And uh, before you actually add a second core network, is the important thing is that you have to add a new PLMN. So you need to tell the base station that from now on, it's not serving one operator, but two. I will do this first. And then you will add the second CN. Then you can also connect the phone. And uh, well, let, let me go into this and I will explain all the things on the way. And then also how you can, can distinguish the UEs there if you manage to, or if you set up the two uh, core networks. So we have, um, one phone already connected. Let me just, uh, so yes, I already prepared something. So if you remember before, we were already looking at the PL PLMN ID and it is 208.95. There are some crazy things happening here. The phone reconnected because the connection is not 100% stable, but it's no problem. So as I said, first of all, we need to configure a new PLMN. So we will go into the PLMN section here and we find push PLMNs. So we use this endpoint here and what we push is actually the list of new PLMNs. So uh, I will use this. I already prepared the script. So before we had 208.95. Now we will have 208.95 and 208.94 and we will push this into the base station. So let's do it like this. We push this and this is... Uh, uh, by the way, uh, just so that you're not confused, before I was working on Flexrun, now I will shift more towards the OAI uh, side of, uh, of, of, I mean, uh, to, to the OAI windows. And what we have seen here is that the agent uh, um, received this command to set um, two uh, uh, P elements. And if we look into the P element ID information, then we already see that there are two. And now what I will do, I already, if I go to the first CN, we see there is one UE connected and my second uh, CN is actually not uh, working yet. So I will start the HSS. I am not using all this Docker stuff yet. Maybe I should, I have been told, but too late. So I start everything manually. And now I can go back to the Northbound interface and I will find the Northbound for add a new MME. So what this will do, we use this endpoint here and we will just give the new um, IP address of this MME. And uh, by the way, don't be confused. So MME in this context, you can uh, use this equally for CN, CN. So typically you will have one MME within a CN to which you configure. Probably you can have multiple MMEs, but if you use something relatively simple like OICN, you will have one MME. And if you connect to a second one, then this means a second core network. So we go here. And by the way, also again, just to show you, I prepared uh, the new MME. So before the first one was running on IP address 118, the next one is on 119. I will use this endpoint. I push this um, new file 
And if we go here to the output and we push this, then we see it's connected. So for those who already worked uh, with OAI quite a bit, I think this looks familiar. So the flex run agent adds here the new MME and then all the output of um, OAI happened and we are connected. And if we go by the way to CN2, what we will see now that we have one connected base station. And uh, now we can, I can actually show this in the drone again. So before, and now we come, by the way, back to this, how can we identify different UEs? So before we have still this one base station and we had the one P PLM, PLMN ID. Now we have two. We also have the two IP addresses. And actually when a phone connects, we get the MC, but usually, as I said before, you would not have this, but what you always have is the selected PLMN ID, which is sent with an RRC message. So for this UE, which belongs to this operator, it's 208.95. And I will now go and I will connect the second phone that I have here, which is 208.94, and it connected there. And we see that the MC is different, but as I said, we would not have this, but what we would have is the selected PLMN which you also have in the Northbone interface. So if you go and you connect the phone, then you should find this somewhere. I don't know. And uh, then actually we can also see that this phone is connected to another MME as this one. So now we have two CNs. If we go in the CN overview, we see here the first CN has one base station, one phone. If you go into the second CN, we see um, one base station connected with one phone. So two, uh, UEs that belong to different operators that are connected via one single base station to do different core networks. And of course, we could also make this unhappen once this phone disconnected, then we would go back here. And uh, there is, if I go into my PL PLMN management uh, things, there's also remove MME, which is basically the same one. You just use this uh, delete, um, how is this called, HTTP method. And we would, now we have only one UE here. So we say, delete this same MME. Then FlexRun agent removes this uh, MME. Then this SCTP association is removed. If we look, for example, in the CN also, there is nothing that is connected anymore. So we can stop this. And the final thing that you would typically do is clean up properly. So we take the PLMN. We remove the 208.94, we push this again, and now we can see that there's only one uh, PLMN, one UE, and everything is back to normal. So to wrap up, if you want to have like end-to-end -end network slicing, you could use this to dynamically bring up uh, with multiple core networks from an orchestrator, then the orchestrator could tell the controller to connect to those different uh, core networks. Then you can uh, connect a second phone. Then you would always have a proper identifier, which identifies the different operators, and then you're good. Are there any questions here? If not, because we are running, I guess, late on time, let me quickly go to the cell configuration policy, which is for spectrum management. So for example, if you have unlicensed spend or, I mean, I guess you can think of the of these uh, use cases yourself. And uh, what is important now, I mean, we will use the same deployment as before, 1CN and radio. And by the way, this is something, I, I never tested this with OAI SIM before this question comes, but I don't know whether you can actually restart uh, the base station. and. Now I said the, the second thing after the first thing. So since we will modify this operating frequency bandwidth and possibly also the band, we need to restart the soft modem because we need to set different variables in the physical layer, also in the RRC and so on. So the first thing that we will do is that we'll disconnect the phone. Then we will uh, restart the base station with uh, the new frequency I will show in a moment. Then we can reconnect the phone. And for this, what I thought what we will do is First, I will just show you that at the top here, you have cell, recon cell configuration policy. So you can change the cell configuration within respect to bandwidth, frequency band with this thing. And what I thought that we could do to just show you how this works. So you remember in the beginning, I was showing that we had 25 resource blocks. So for those who work with OAI, 
this equals uh, roughly 17.5 megabits. So this is 17.8. Uh, so if we send now, for example, let me, uh, I need to go to the core network. I will make an iperf to the eight. And if we send 20 megabits, so then we see this maximum 17 to three megabits. So this corresponds to the 25 resource block. If we now stop this and we could disconnect now the phone and I will come back to the cell uh, uh, configuration policy thing. So we disconnect the phone. Let's put this aside. And uh, we have here the cell reconfigure script so and uh, by the way maybe i should now show cell config so if we look in the con current configuration as i said we have this frequency 2600 or 2.645 gigahertz with 25 resource blocks as we have also seen and here now we will reconfigure to sit on the same frequency but with a larger frequency so we will send this um command so We'll post this configuration and we post this file and then we see that the base station restarts. So what we can see, so we were here, we see that the flex run agent, but this is executed by the inodb application for, let's say, historical reasons, sets the new uh, frequency, sets the new bandwidth, requires the restart, then all these five threads and I don't know what they uh, are stopped and freed and some memory is freed and then we restart again and we see that here the USRP comes up again and then we wait and then uh, everything is fine and now uh, we reconnect the, the phone we can uh, do the same thing as before we could now check again for the IP address which has been increased by one so we do this and now let me send a little bit more to actually completely sent and what we should see now is that we have 35.1 megabit which is due to uh, um, the, uh, to the larger bandwidth and let's not yes this actually what you see here is that actually since there is zoom running at the same time and it's recording my screen there's actually quite some things going on in my processor so that uh, that the real-time operation cannot be assured so yes but I guess you got the idea um, you can restart to have uh, a larger bandwidth. What I didn't show you is that you could also restart the frequency. And I didn't show you this for the reason, not because it wouldn't work, but because uh, then the UE needs to scan again and might uh, not immediately find this, which is the reason. And uh, so you could change this. You could also change the band. And I want to say one thing. So this uh, didn't, I mean, over, I think I implemented this already two and a half years ago. And uh, over the time, multiple times, this functionality got broken because somebody would work on the thread management within the file and so on. So it did not always work. And actually, just before the workshop, when I tried it, it didn't work again. And there are always some limitations. So what I found, and might actually be interesting to, to fix this, you can increase the bandwidth. But I found why I had problems when you would decrease the uh, bandwidth. So if you have 50 resource block and you want to go back to 25, there are some problems with the USRP. And also there seems to be one thread that is not perfectly, I mean, where there are some issues. So sometimes you might have some problems here, but most of the time it works. And I'm happy to get contributions if somebody wants to fix this or wants to work. So I could give you some pointers where you need to search. Yes. Are there some questions here? Uh, are we good with the time or is it... You are you are good with the timing. Just three minutes left. Uh, and then, I'm not, then I'm not good with the time because I have material for twenty more minutes at least. Huh? So what I want okay. to show you now, let me just and maybe people can say what they want to see so that we don't take too much time. Uh, so now I would go towards the L2 simulator, show this uh, scheduler selection. So we would uh, modify the CQI. Then by with the round robin, we would see that the throughput is not so good. We would modify this to use proportional fare. We could also see the slicing, so the stati static slicing that most people know. And already before in the chat, I was writing that there might be, uh, what, well, not that there might be, I already have uh, other slicing algorithms, for example, NPS, but I didn't merge them yet, so I could show this. And uh, then finally, we come also to the base station local applications that might first, or that are first uploaded into this network store, and that can then be dynamically 
put onto the base station. And then, uh, even if then would be more time and interest, we could have a look at the Elastic Mon. So uh, in this case, as I said before, I don't have the complete framework. So, but I would show you the Flexron controller that we can configure to export some data. And there are also other, by the way, before we run completely out of time, use cases so you can trigger handover so before there was uh, the question in the chat whether i already implemented uh, more complex uh, radio resource management algorithms no i did not because i mean for multiple reasons first of all we don't have a simulator that uh, supports multiple base stations and uh, working with multiple real base stations i mean for example this handover with the real ue works but it gets very complicated because you still have other radio access networks, commercial ones, and I don't know what around you, and radio is always unpredictable and so on. So I did not never really experiment with that a lot, but for sure you could do this in Flexman if you have a simulator. There are other things like the run aware video optimization, which also enters a little bit LMX. So Tien will talk about this. And with this, I would be at the end. So if people are interested and we, if we have some more minutes, I could go into some details here. Just let me know. Robert, I would say that we could, um, uh, the, the net store is very interesting and it is the new feature that maybe is interesting for people to understand. I think Bruno, could we give him 10 minutes? Yeah, definitely. Okay, so if fine. you have 10 minutes, uh, Robert, try to see how you can manage this demo with the other demo in an understandable way. Both at the same time. Okay, well, we, we can for sure actually combine them. So let me connect, uh, disconnect here the phone. Um, as I said before, in the second part, we would go to the simulator so we could use multiple UEs. And I will try to combine. Uh, because as I said before, with Zoom and so on, it can be challenging for my computer. So I just need to reconfigure because then I uh, did... So because uh, we want to combine these two uh, things and because this NBS uh, slicing algorithm has not been merged by myself, I will now go to use the source version and I also should not forget to restart the core network, which is important for my scripts. So we restart this. We uh, start this uh, source version of the base station Did I Sorry, before I almost forgot, I also need to restart Flex Run for the source version because there it's always uh, also uh, important for this NBS uh, thing. So now I restarted the controller. I will go start um, the base station. And for the UE, we can actually uh, use the simulator. So I will come back now. So I will uh, briefly, uh, well, no, not briefly. There is the slice configuration. I will do this at the same time, but not go too much into detail here. I will say, and for those who are interested, in any case, you will have the slide so you can uh, read and look it up by yourself later. The uh, net store. So the interest of this whole net store thing is that you could have custom application that you could execute directly on top of the base station and with which you could now embed some more intelligence on top of the base station. And I will give you a very simplistic example, which will be this MC application. There is also a video with the burst analysis application that I developed where uh, based on the traffic profile of certain um, UEs, you would reconfigure the, the slice association and also change the slice algorithm. So there's a video uh, and a paper with the demo that I made for Mobicom this year. So I restarted everything as I already said and what we will do in the following. First, we have to upload this MC application into the net store. So first, what does the MC application do? It's very simple. Uh, as we have seen, we have the information about the MC at the controller, but actually this information comes from the base station. So in a sense, you could say already this information about which UE should go into which slice uh, is readily available at the agent. So um, we don't need to 
uh, send this information about uh, the the IMC to the controller so that the controller reconfigures. Actually, if we deploy an application right in in the in the base station, the application can directly reconfigure. So what IMC will do uh, is to reconfigure the slice of association of UEs based on their IMC. Yes, so what we do need to do first is to upload this application into the net store. So of course this application could also be loaded by the controller from, from, uh, from this directly, but we wanted to show how you could also integrate something like an app store like thing where you tell the controller to download something it will go into the uh, into this net store and check whether the application is there and then deploy. So first we will deploy this into the application that runs at 8080 before we use 9999 for the controller. Now it will be a different application, so a different port. And what is also very important if you ever use this, so when I was uh, using the scripts myself before, you typically I used just this D here. And now we need to use data binary because we will actually upload the binary objects. And if you don't just give the D, then you might cut it and then your buy station can crash and all not so nice things can happen. So once we have uploaded the, the application into the net store, then we could trigger the deployment of this application into the base station. So we will go to the controller. We will say, uh, please uh, check whether there is the MC application and deploy it into the base station. And once we have this, then we also need to reconfigure the base station application. I, uh, yeah, this is not correct. I should have written uh, reconfiguration of the app in the base station, sorry for that. Uh, so we will uh, reconfigure this MC application. Actually, it will say in which slices it should go and uh, which UEs, and this is expressed by a regex too. And uh, then if we add new UEs and then we can add many, then they will automatically be associated. So we will see this at the same time. And then once we are done, we could also release the, the base station. And as I already said, there's an application that you can uh, watch on YouTube later. And one important thing that I should do now and which might otherwise make problems is that I should first, sorry, uh, configure the static slicing because this was in the flow of the presentation as I have foreseen it. And if we don't see, then my problem. So I configure the static slicing. So maybe people have seen it. We can also just have a brief look. So we see here, there are now uh, two slices that are deployed with this static slice algorithm. So um, one in uh, two in downlink. So downlink, we have two slices, one that uses the resource blocks, resource block groups actually, all of this is written in the documentation from zero to nine and the other from 10 to 12. And also in the up we have two slices and there is no UE connected yet. And what I will do next is that uh, I have this applications, uh, they are here, MC and sample. And we can also see here that we have the net store. There is nothing deployed yet. So what I will do now and uh, just to, to give you some directions. So there is again, this net store uh, with all the endpoints. And by the way, for those who don't know, there's slice configuration. So what I did was here. Now I will go back to the net store. And uh, as I said, we actually need to first upload this into this uh, net store application, which is not the controller. So I put the example here. So we push into the net store and then we push a certain application. So uh, so if we, for example, first push the app and we look into the drone, then we see that there's an app application. We could also go and we say MC. And if we then look into the store now, then we see that we have this MC application. The next thing would be to uh, now, as I said before, deploy the agent application. So now we really come to this example. We just tell the controller to download an app with name MC, not uh, sample. So if we send this, then a lot of things happen here. Let me just go first into the controller because this is where the more interesting things happen. There was this trigger app request and it triggered uh, for an app with ID MC. So it would check into the net store and then it finds it and then it downloads the thing and sends it to the application. And since it's actually a bit larger, this would, for example, violate this real-time constraint within the controller. So this means that we could not manage one millisecond, but it took two milliseconds. Then we see in the application that it received something uh, which it wrote into a shared library. It starts the application and now we have a new MC application installed. As I said, 
the third point is to actually configure this application. For this, again, I also prepared something. So I already made this uh, MC reconfiguration script. So as I said, we will configure UEs that match this regex, which is uh, actually what I wanted to do is that all UEs with even uh, um, MCs are put into a certain slice, but actually I put uh, a special version of evenness where all the numbers at the end need to be even. But anyway, you will see this in a moment. So certain UEs will be associated to a certain slice. And what we can now do is that we do uh, this MC reconfiguration. So also a net store for a certain app, we do a push and then this is sent here. And we see now application MC was found and we reconfigured and it uh, all UEs that match this uh, regex will go into slice three. And what we can do now is that we actually just uh, start and we uh, um, tell it to, uh, let, I need to go here into the right thing. We will start the UE similar to what uh, Navid, well, not similar, in the same way as Navid has said it before. So I have this start UE script where we could uh, connect to Telnet. And actually, this means read until we find Telnet. Then it enables a UE and then makes Telnet end. And what we can do now is that we start the zero. It's connected. And actually, the first UE has the MC1. So this one is uh, odd. So nothing happens, so it's still in slice three. If we come now to the second UE, it starts and you see here that the flex run agent did something. So the logging mechanism that is used by the app is used like flex run agent. And it says the RNTI with this MC has been associated to slice three. So we see here, this one is now in slice three. And uh, in this way now we could actually connect many UEs. So let me go and we do this. So we have many UEs now in this drone application. So we can rearrange this a little bit to maybe see more clearly. And then you will see this is an uh, uh, even MC. So it's in slice three. This one is, as I said, this is the special version of evenness. So this has a one here, so it was not matched by the regex. Let me find another one, which is the eight. This is even, so it go, went into slice three and so on. And uh, this way, now you can deploy an application. And finally, also to make it short, you could uh, delete this. Uh, no, this is not the right one. We need to actually, we need to delete the app MC, and if we go to the bottom and we send this, then we see it is disabled. And if we were now, if we would add multiple UEs, then it, the, the whole thing of this auto association would not happen. And by the way, also only that you see, so we saw here that a lot of UEs are connected, but for none, the controller actually had to reassociate the, the, the slice ID. And uh, finally, because we were discussing this, uh, before and I was already mentioning, I just want to show. So we have the UEs, some of them are in slice three and we have here this static slice algorithm. And just as a little bonus before I will finish, we can have NVS and if everything, if I did everything correctly, then yes, we see it loaded a new um, uh, slice algorithm too. And some of the UEs have been automatically associated because that there is some logic in the controller. So it tries to when re configuring a slice algorithm internally, it means that slices vanish, you instantiate a new slice algorithm. So the controller automatically reassociates certain UEs. But it means now that I configured NVS in the downlink. So here we see algorithm NVS. And uh, for those who know the paper, and if not, I invite you to read the paper personally, I like it. Uh, we have uh, you first slide that has 10 megabits out of 17.5. So this is the way of saying how much resources you should get and the second one 6.5 and also second we cons um, made two slices in the downlink that are both nvs but in the uplink it is still static so you can have uh, let's say an asymmetric slice configuration one slice algorithm in the downlink another one in the uplink and actually the nvs and the other slice algorithm that i implemented they are only available for the downlink and with this i would like to conclude 
So I showed you how to deploy uh, this app store. We briefly, very briefly discussed about the slice configuration. You could also reconfigure the slice algorithm. So uh, maybe for yourself, or as they say in the book, this is left as an exercise to the reader, or in this case, to the viewer. You can connect many UEs with the L2 simulator. You can connect via Telnet, enable uh, the CQI. Then you will see if you send throughput to all of these UEs that the throughput is relatively low since round robin is not channel aware. You can reconfigure this to proportional fare and then the throughput will go up. And with this, I would like to conclude. Thanks. Thanks for your attention. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, please don't hesitate to uh, ask questions in the chat or also send me an email or ask on the FlexRun mailing list. And I am happy to answer all your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Robert, for your time. Uh, I know there, there, there would be some more time. Maybe just one question Puya is asking uh, if you are using B210. Here now I was using the P210 mini. I can actually okay. show this. Uh, uh, Osama gave me this uh, trick, so I can uh, try. This is my deployment here, so people can see it. So this is the screen where you can see yourself. And uh, here is the, I mean, it's connected via USB to the B210 with the antenna. This is the, well, now it disconnected, sorry. Well, you, you got the idea. There is the second phone here, which was the other operator. This is the 20895 that I've shown before. So yes, I used the small mini, which is perfectly fine when you do 4G for 5G, it's not enough. Okay, thank you very much. So I, I, I would like to, uh, to, to thank Teen for his time because it went off of his demo. Okay, so as Robert already said, um, it's time for our last uh, training on to LLMAC. So Team uh, Team Guyen is also part of Eurocom and Mosaic 5G team. Um, LLMAC stands as a low latency multi-access edge computing platform for a software-defined mobile network. Team, could you hear us? Yes. Uh, thank Bruno for the presentation. So let no me worries. share my screen. Can you see my screen now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So uh, let me uh, now we'd like to present the the last piece of the mosaic 5G uh, uh, 5G ecosystem and then make with the color zero. So in the in the previous uh, section, our colleague Robert just presented the the flex run, which can be considered as the run controller to monitor and control the the um, run information in real time. So uh, very similar to that, uh, the NMAC is basically a controller for the edge and for the core network segment to monitor not only the IP traffic, but also the state of the underlying run and core infrastructure. Uh, so um, what is NMAC exactly? The NMAC is defined as a low latency multi-access edge computing platform for software defined mobile network. And also, thank you, Robert. We, do, we already have the, the basic notion of the SGN, and I don't want to go in, in more detail here. Um, for the LNMEC objective, um, LNMEC objective uh, the first objective is to provide a platform with the capability uh, of monitoring and controlling the underlying run and core uh, infrastructure in a flexible and, uh, and programmable manner. Uh, it can be achieved. Um, uh, through the abstraction layer between the data plane and, and the make platform. And second objective is to, uh, is to support a fine-grain network slicing capability by first relying on the flex down slicing feature uh, as presented by Robert earlier and uh, also for core network by introducing measuring features in, into o OVS. And also by relying on flex down and open flow protocol, um, LMAC can provide a native IP service endpoint and uh, real-time running information um, per user and uh, service basics. And also for LMAC application, LMAC can support not only the typical application, which uh, basically can uh, obtain the statistic information, but also for the low latency application. The low latency application can access the local API to meet the, the no latency requirement and can also up, apply the policy to set up the, the data path. 
so you can see here uh, some generic uh, use cases for NMX that already be implemented, uh, including video optimization, uh, traffic steering, end-to-end -end network slicing, uh, dedicated core network, and uh, IoT gateway. Uh, we can also use uh, NMX to enable further use cases uh, such as um, uh, service offloading, load balancing, content caching, recommendation system, just uh, name a few. Uh, so um, uh, uh, consider video optimization as an example. I, I will present a brief uh, uh, for this use case. So by relying on the information provided by FlexRun, an application can uh, monitor uh, the cell load status and and radio link quality in order to, to enforce a new resource allocation policy and also to change the video quality accordingly. Um, also, the NMX can also decide to get the video, uh, video from the local server in, instead of, uh, of a, from a remote one. So in, uh, in overall, it can improve the user quality of experience. Um, for more uh, information for this use case, please refer to the link uh, at the end of uh, this slide. Uh, for the NNMEC um, high level features, uh, NNMEC decouples the control and user plane by leveraging uh, OVS uh, with uh, GTP support and open flow protocol. Uh, so, providing the ability to scale each network uh, plane uh, independently. And also, uh, and might bring the flexibility and, uh, and programmability to the underlying run and core data plane infrastructure through the abstraction layer uh, of the underlying data part with the OpenFlow API. So the traffic rule uh, are automatically generated and boosted to the associated OVS. The rule can be the default rules for initial um, establishment of the switches or also the specific rules for the EV traffic or for specific uh, MAC application. Uh, for low latency application, uh, we provide a, a flexible um, framework uh, through local API to meet the, the low latency requirement and also support e event driven interaction uh, uh, between the application and, uh, and also provide the service deployment kit to uh, simplify the, the application deployment. Uh, so move to the NMEC uh, architecture. Um, uh, the NMEC platform consists of two main uh, services. Uh, the first one is uh, EPS, the uh, Edge uh, Packet Service, which is equivalent to the radio, uh, to the traffic rules control. Uh, EPS manages the st uh, static and dynamic uh, traffic rules and handle multiple open flow library and, and OVS GTP. Uh, the second uh, service is Radio Network Information Service, or ANIS, for controlling and monitoring real-time run information. Uh, and then the, the data and control plane API can act at an abstraction layer between run and core uh, data plane and NMX platform. The open flow and flex plan protocol facilitate the communication between the NMX platform and, and the underlying run and core infrastructure. And then to uh, facilitate the MAC application deployment, the application manager provide API or SDK for both uh, elastic and low latency application as we uh, presented earlier. Also, we provide a stand, uh, standard SC MAC MP1 uh, reference point API as you can see in uh, the next few slides. Uh, for the NMX implementation, uh, the platform is written uh, from scratch using C++ and Python, and uh, currently it supports uh, x64 native system and uh, under Apache license uh, 2.0. And NMX provides OVS with GTP support in uh, Linux kernel version uh, uh, 4.9 and also under Apache uh, version 2.0 license. Um, for the NNMEC uh, features, uh, currently NNMEC uh, provides the ability to add, to delete, or to update the, the user and get the user information. Or uh, similarly for a slide, by relying on the NotBow API, as you can see in, in, in the next few slides. And also NNMEC uh, can uh, allow the application to get the flow statistic for both uh, uplink and downlink. 
the traffic di redirection of forwarding features allow the di redirecting the user traffic uh, from a remote server to a local one to improve uh, the quality of service, uh, for example, for video optimization or traffic steering use cases, uh, as you can see in the live demo section later on. Um, we are also working on, uh, on um, uh, some original features such as a uh, traffic uh, metering uh, for the OVS data path to support network slicing and also some implement some QoS uh, operation uh, as uh, red uh, limiting. We also implemented some API divided in SCMEC uh, 011 specification for MP1 reference point and 012 uh, specification for ANIS uh, uh, services. We also implementing a new event handling model for all the, the events related to MP1, to ANIS, to uh, the internal NMX event to, uh, to better support uh, MEC application deployment. Uh, in addition, we, we are working on the copy action features. Uh, in this case, the packet can be cloned and, and, then, uh, and then sent to the MEC application to be, uh, to be processed. Um, uh, you can see here the, 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 the list of the notbound API that uh, currently be supported by, by Ed and Mac. Uh, for example, the notbound API can uh, use to manage the user and slide information, such as to add the user, delete the user, or get the user information. Also, the, the uh, traffic redirection API to programming the, the route uh, and redirect the user traffic belonging to a user or a particular slide. To a, uh, from a remote server to a local local one. And also the application can get all the uh, traffic flow statistic uh, in both uplink and downlink. And we can see this API during our, our demo later on. And uh, also uh, all the information, the detailed information for this API can be, can be found in, in the API doc uh, in the, all the, the LMX website. And you can find the link at the end of uh, the presentation. Uh, now for the uh, for the MP1 reference point, um, we have different API to create uh, create a service, to update the service and get the service information or query the service availability. Uh, one application can subscribe to to be noticed when a service become available or become unavailable via MP1 subscription. Uh, and then another application can consume the uh, available services, for example, to get the PRMN information uh, provided by any service. Um, so uh, to prepare uh, LMX for the, for the 5G, uh, we have um, uh, two approaches depending on the way we, we implement the MP2 reference point between the LMX and, and EPF, the user plane function in 5G. Uh, the, in the first approach, we, we, we use the current LMX implementation uh, for 5G. Uh, in this case, we reuse the OVS ZTP as uh, uh, UPF, and then we need to, uh, to update the OVS ZTP uh, uh, to support original ZTP header for 5G, uh, for example, to carry uh, PFI information. Uh, in the second approach, uh, we rely on the PFCP protocol as defined by 3GPP at uh, the MP1, uh, sorry, MP2 uh, reference point. Uh, so in this case, we need to implement PFCP protocol stack into the LNMAC, and uh, we can then we can reuse the, the OAI SP GetKU or the future OAI CN 5G UPF at, uh, as our UPF. And actually, we are working on both uh, direction uh, and uh, and uh, decide which one is the better. Dean, before, uh, before going forward, there is just one question related to um, supporting Linux kernels. They're asking whether there are any plans to support newer Linux kernels for LLMAC. Uh, actually, the, as you can see here, there are two parts. One is if we use currently OVS GTP, we, we need to do that. Uh, another approach is that we move to the remove completely the the, the GV, uh, GTP kernel. We move to the the PFCP implementation. So in this case, we don't need to 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 do this. There are two so there are two different uh, approach for that. 
Okay. And uh, another question they are asking is if uh, dedicated bearer, so different QCI, is supported by SPGWC in LLMAC? Uh, NNMAC does, you see, the, basically the, the core network, we send the common to the NMAC to establish the bearer. So whenever the core network support this dedicated bearer or default bearer, the element can support this kind of, uh, of, uh, of beer. Okay, and the last question is whether LLMAC is compliant with 3GPP. Uh, yes, of course, you see, uh, uh, you see here that uh, you can say that um, yes, because we support uh, the standard, standard, standard MP1 and MP2 uh, uh, reference point for SC uh, compliant. And then we uh, we are working on the, the P PFCP protocol to, to make it compliant with the 3GPP uh, solution. Okay, Tim, thank you very much. You can uh, go forward. Thank you. Oh, okay, thanks. So for the, uh, I just want to say that uh, here you can find uh, the, some very useful link for the LNMAC. For example, to the link for the LNMAC website, the source code, uh, the snaps, Docker, and the API doc. Also, we have uh, the, the, the tutorial and the wiki for, for the for facilitate and to help you to, to deploy a, the, the NMX test bed. And uh, thus, uh, one more thing uh, I, uh, I should mention here is that it, maybe now is the time for you to come and, and contribute to, to NMX project and move our, our project forward. So, uh, so that maybe we can, uh, if uh, we still have some question, we can, uh, uh, take a few. If not, we can mo move to the live demo. Yeah, there is just one last question. Ashok is asking. There is saying also OBS now has user space GTP support. Uh, any relevance to your LLMAC activities? Uh, yes, of course. We are working on that. We can we can we can see that. It's actually the you can see here the metering table. That means it bring the OBS from the kernel space to the user space. We are working on that and. Actually, we implemented that feature, but we, we need to validate in a real test bed. And the final question is which, if you know, three GPP standard uh, is compliant to? Sorry, I, I don't get the point. Uh, they're asking I, which, I the three GPP, which GPP standard is compliant to? Which TGPP standard? Yes. Uh, you can you can say that the TCPP standard. Uh, you can say for the for the PFCP protocol, uh, uh, which uh, which eighty five by TCPP to communicate between the user plane and, and data plane. Yeah, uh, currently, okay. for instance, we, we could also mention that uh, the 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 OVS support S one U. Uh, and uh, more in the future, we would like to also support the, the as uh, Tin said, the, the interface for the N3, N6, N9. So in that sense, the uh, you know that LLMAC has two parts. There is part for the controller and there are part for the uh, UPF or user plane function. Uh, so it basically standard compliant in terms of the interfaces. Yeah, because they were asking about which kind, which specific release. They're asking R16. Uh, uh, no, for, for the, the moment, e no. Go on, go on, team. Okay. So now I uh, switch to the, the demo. So in this demo, we will showcase the traffic uh, redirection features of the NNMAC with the N2 simulator, uh, the, the N2 simulator as uh, presented by Navid earlier. Uh, so in this demo, we, we go through different steps to set up uh, and then make test bed and then uh, uh, attach multiple uh, simulated UE as he presented earlier by Navid again, uh, and then connect the UE, uh, UE to, the, to the internet and uh, play with the traffic uh, redirection features. Uh, so uh, first, uh, uh, take a quick look at the high level architecture of the NMAC uh, deployment. So you can see in the figure um, the uh, some logical component in a typical de deployment scenario for the LNMAC. Uh, in the control plane, you can see the, the um, flex, flex run uh, on top of uh, the run 
as a controller, and a Mac as a controller for the Mac and Edge, uh, sec, uh, the, for the, um, sorry, for the Edge and Core segment, uh, and OAI Core Network. In the data plane, we have um, OAI uh, uh, Run, OVS GTP, and, and the Gateway. And the Gateway here is just a, a, a router or a PC performing uh, NAT uh, operation for the, for the UE. Um, so for the for the traffic redirection features, it can be used to enable some use cases such as uh, traffic steering and video optimization. For for example, you can see in, in this figure is a, an example for a tra traffic steering use case. In general, the traffic steering refers to the capability of the Mac to support uh, to route the traffic to the targeted uh, application. The traffic steering is controlled by the Mac platform through the co configuring the MP2 uh, uh, reference point. And so basically, the traffic will be routed to an edge server application before going to the remote server. Uh, so, for, so for video um, optimization use case uh, presented earlier, so I don't want to, to go to in more detail here, but uh, again, uh, here you can see the link uh, if you are interested in uh, this use case, please check uh, the reference link. Um, uh, for the for the demo, here is uh, the real um, network deployment for our demo. So in this case, we have four different machines, uh, one for the core network, uh, another one for the uh, uh, NNMEC, uh, ENUDB, and simulated UE. The third one for the OVS GTP, and the last one for the for the um, Gateway. Uh, as you can see here, the NMAC is co-located with the with the ENUB, but also you can deploy NMAC in a separate machine or or in uh, in a same machine with the uh, OpenLCN. Uh, also, we can have a very similar test bed for the for testing with the with the cost UE. Uh, you can see the in the in the tutorial and the video for the video. We already have uh, this uh, this kind of test bed. So in this uh, in this demo, uh, first we we told uh, we go through uh, uh, very quick uh, some main step to set up the NMX testbed with N2 simulator, and then uh, we will attach several UE to the network, um, establish a connection to the internet, and then we show the capability of the NMX to connect uh, traffic statistics, for example, for monitoring and data data mining, uh, and then uh, we play with the traffic reduction uh, feature. So first, go for the first uh, first part of our demo. Uh, so after the uh, deploying the test bed, uh, some UE uh, will be attached to the network, and then you can see the in real time the in the NNMEC and OVS screen the the action to set up the traffic rules for the UE, and then we test the UE connectivity. But just uh, you can see very simple, just ping. Uh, Google, but you uh, uh, but uh, but uh, you can also test with the uh, IPERF. Uh, also, I should mention here that, uh, as you can see in the demo, normally the, use, the UE traffic will be routed from the UE to the e B and then go to the, the, S, the P gateway view, basically in the, in the core network. But with the NNMEC, the traffic will go to the uh, OVS GTP, which uh, in the edge, and then to the gateway, and finally to the internet, as, as you can see here in the, in the left, red line. So uh, let's go for the demo. Uh, let me switch to my demo. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So I need to uh, first uh, launch uh, the OEI SSS. It's normal as in the previous demo, nothing special. We launch MME and then the MME connect to the, connected to SSS and then we go for the OAI SP Gateway C. It's important to note here that the we have to launch SP Gateway C first and then the SP Gateway U. And then you see they are connected together by uh, exchanging the PFCP uh, messages. So now we need to run a little bit and then move to the next one. Okay. Now I will do check the 
OVS flow. Uh, actually, the OVS DTB is already running because I don't want to relaunch OVS. Sometimes when you, you relaunch OVS, you lose the, the SSS connection, so I don't want to do that here. But you see, uh, basically, the, there are no uh, OVS flow for the, for the OVS. Now, if I launch and then make, wait a little bit and then you see the, the default rule for, uh, for the OVS flow. Basically, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, for the establishing the, the switches. For example, the very simple one is drop all the packet. So the OVS doesn't do anything for the EV traffic for the moment. Now I launch the e -Node B sim. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, in the meantime, I clear a little bit uh, because you see, uh, I need to go for uh, go to the server server to the server which actually running in the the e -Node B and uh, and, and Mac. So the same for UE. Similarly, in the, as mentioned by Navid earlier, we don't need to mention here again. Uh, but actually, to uh, to enable the we we need to do the telnet common, and then at the same time, maybe we can watch uh, IF config to see that uh, make it a bit larger. Now I actually enable the, the UE. You, you need uh, to see in the OVS GTP screen and then, and then make the actual uh, action. So enable UE zero. You see the first, the core network, we send the common to the NMAC to establish the bearer, the attach to UE and establish the default bearer. You see here the information, the MC of the UE the UE IP address, the slide ID by default is zero. The uh, ID for the uh, uh, channel ID for uplink and downlink, and also for the inode IP address. And at the same time, you can see here in the OVS, there are two new rules, one for uplink and, and another one for downlink. And you can see in the NME, NME let me make it a bit larger. You can see the, that only one UE attached, so you can see that. Now I try to enable the second one. Here is, uh, here is it's difficult to see because it's not enough uh, space. But if basically you can see here is the, the interface for the user one with the IP address. And then the second user, we can do with few more, we, sorry, two, and then continue with the, the fourth one. So now we have four uh, UEs. We don't want to go uh, for a large number as Navid already presented. Okay. Now we try to ping the traffic as mentioned earlier, we need to buy the IP address. With, for example, we want to ping from the UE1. We just put the uh, IP address of IP1 and then Google. Uh, maybe we can see here TCP. Yeah, you see that actually the traffic go to the gateway and go to the internet. We can try with another, no, we don't need this one. So we can try with another UE. We ping with second UE. You see the IP address change. Yeah. Not uh, one dot three. And then for the third UE is the same. And then the fourth UE. Of course, we cannot have the UE number five because we don't have, so is everything okay for the moment? Yeah. Now I switch to another part of the demo. So by the way, do you, do you have any question for that?
Bruno, can you hear me? Yeah, so some of, most of the questions that were asked were, were already already answered by by Navid. So I I I don't think there are some some new questions still still un, unanswered. Maybe the only thing TIN is important. Okay, you showed for the ping, but the same holds for the UDP TCP traffic. So uh, but maybe maybe later. I, I later you can show that. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. So now we go for the second part of our demo. That means in this case, we just show the capability of the LMA to provide the statistic uh, informa information as similar to the way uh, Robert did with the Flextran. Um, so LMA can also, provide, uh, can also provide the traffic statistic by using a browser and also a common line with the GP and watch script as uh, Robert presented. It's very similar to that. Uh, so, but uh, unfortunately, I cannot show uh, with the browser because you see, uh, I have to to do some uh, SSS connection uh, via several uh, server to to reach the the, um, the RMX. So I don't have the direct connection to that for the moment. So I will, but I will show you by common line, and you can see here the common for the to get the flow statistic, not only for all the slow for all the flow, but for a particular flow associated with one uh, EV and a bureau ID. And also you can find all the, the common in the, in the API doc. So let me switch back to the uh, screen. Okay. Uh, let me do. Okay. So for the first comment, now I get to the all the information, all the flow, the variables flow. But you can see here, the first one, the first bunch of information come from the IP, the UE with the IP five, number five, 12.1.1.5. And then you have the information for the second UE, one dot uh, one dot uh, four, and then continue with the third UE and the last one. So you see here, you can have the information in general, the ENOPI information, the BRL ID, uh, EMC information, the tunnel ID for uplink and downlink, slide information, uh, UEIP, also you have the information for uplink and downlink. For example, the number of uh, packets, and also the buy count. Uh, if now, if I want to get statistic for just one flow, for example, the for the first user with this MC and the bureau ID number five, and then you can see exactly like that. Uh, for the moment, we don't uh, we don't uh, connect uh, our LMAC with Flexran, so we don't have uh, a lot uh, information come from the Flexran. But later we uh, we can uh, connect, and then all the information, for example, as uh, Robert presented, we come here, and then you can see a lot of more information. Uh, so now just uh, come back to the live demo and. Uh, uh, last section. So now for the for the third one or the la last part of the demo, uh, I will I will show you the the traffic redirection feature of the NNMAC. Uh, in this case, I will pick on one UE, for example, the UE zero. Uh, and uh, in this demo, instead of downloading uh, or or playing the content from a remote server, you can see here the IP address of the server and the and the file and the MP4 file. Uh, we uh, uh, we uh, get first we get this from the remote server and then by applying the traffic redirection API to redirect the request from uh, to uh, to a local server in this case we just put in the in the gateway so basically now the we can get the file directly from the from the local server so uh, we can see that in real time the the improvement in terms of uh, throughput but actually also in terms of uh, and to end delay. 
uh, so the common here I use is the curl common with the traffic redirection uh, API. Uh, you can see the you need to put the MC of the UE, the mirror ID, and also the IP address of the remote user, uh, sorry, the remote uh, uh, server, and also to the to that means the IP address of the local user, uh, local server. Uh, so let's go for the demo. Oops, sorry. I need to copy the comment from here. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yes, we do. Okay. Uh, before doing that, I need to do some uh, some setup uh, because uh, for the moment we need to to configure the. Uh, the simulated UE to support uh, with a larger packet. So first we will launch uh, here the wget common. Uh, okay. You see uh, the user, user, user zero, we get the traffic from this server and then the throughput is not so good. We can check that. TCP dump, that means you can see here that the traffic go to the, the server at IP address. So now I will do is do the traffic redirection comment here. And then you see uh, it continue to download. And you see in real time, the throughput increase a lot. Before it's uh, around uh, 200 and now uh, one, uh, uh, 1060 or something like that. It's more than, uh, uh, more than 10, uh, eight times or something like that, okay. So basically, here we don't see the the improvement in term of uh, in term of end-to-end -end delay. But of course, when we get the information, when when we get the content from the from the local server, it will be increased. Uh, the it will be reduced a lot of the end-to-end -end delay. So that's all for the for the demo maybe i can i can show you on so uh, if uh, we have time i can show you uh, the the ipuff uh, uh, ipuff uh, for the to test the, the, the traffic is this okay or maybe tin uh, just for for the sake of time you can maybe i think the 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 message is clear the traffic is working on the yeah. on the simulated emulated ue and the same traffic could go through sp gateway u or it could go through the ovs and of course it is clear that the performance of ovs is significantly higher than uh, uh, sp gateway u because of the uh, implementation in the kernel space uh, and of course, also here we observe that the data rate from the user perspective is significantly uh, improved. Um, what I would say is that maybe you could just show through the API docs, the MP1, the interfaces that are accessible for um, uh, LLMEC, if this is possible for you with your computer. Uh, let I me think, try and then if it yeah. work or not, uh, please, please wait a moment. And then we, we go through the wrap up and we, we yeah. close the, the session. Yeah. I think just a few mm. words on the API docs would be uh, already good. Please wait a moment, let me try with the, my internet access mosaic files. And, uh, I don't know, this connection is so, so slow. Uh, uh, 
I cannot uh, have. Let me try with uh, with another browser. Do you want me? Do you want me to share? Maybe it's, it 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 would, be, it would be better because I don't know why in my case it doesn't work uh, with the both the Firefox and and Chrome. Okay, I I will share, and then you explain. Okay. 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 Oh, okay. Right. You can see here is the, the list of the, the new API for the MP1 service. Uh, as I presented earlier, the MP1 service you can you can actually do is that uh, you can uh, uh, you can do with um, for example you can you have a, a service you want to provide the information for example the ANIS service which provide the PRM information. So from the beginning, you need to register to the to the Anonymic platform. So the MP1 service we do this. The 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 service we register to the to the Anonymic platform, which which provides some kind of information. For example, the category, the IP, and the link for the for the for the um, API. For example, you can see here Anis, the version, all the information needed for, for another application to discover. And then after that, can use the service offered by, by the, by the uh, producer. And then after that, if, uh, if another application subscribe, for example, one another application interested in POM and information provided by Anis, so when the ANIS uh, service available, this application we receive the notification. So from that moment, he can uh, start to use the ANIS service. Of course, when he receives the notification, he also receives the information regarding the, for example, the URL or the information need to 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 how to use the service. So is this the the, the idea of the? Uh, the M MP1 implementation. Uh, a word on Arni. Uh, for the moment, uh, for the Arni is defined in uh, in SC Mac uh, uh, zero uh, twelve specification. There are several um, uh, information need to be provided to the to the to, to, to the application. However, in this case, we just implement PLM and get PLM and info as an example. So we are working on, on that to, to continue to introduce new uh, event, new information to that. But of course, you are welcome to, to, to contribute. Okay, so just maybe final word here that I can wrap up. So LLMEC has, in contrast to FlexRan, it has uh, some uh, APIs interface from uh, MP1 perspective and from the application perspective, and also some native LLMake uh, uh, APIs that uh, you see add users, dedicated bearer, default bearers, uh, and so forth. So, Tim, do you have anything more to to say? I I, I think we are we are good. Uh, no, no. If you want, I can show only the iPad. Uh, if not, uh, it's okay. Uh, I think it's if... okay. I think it's okay. So, yeah, Bruno, I think we do you have uh, any question? Not, not from my side, Tim. I, I think, as, as I see that many, many participants are already leaving, I think it's good to, to give some, some last words from my side, and then Navid will conclude the session. Okay, okay, okay. Fine for me. Um, so, just briefly showing with you sharing something with you. So um, we, we already said that, uh, it's just uh, a brief reminder on, on slides. I already received uh, most of them, but if you still didn't, didn't send them, uh, it's, it's good to, to send them to me in this case in a PDF for format, preferably. Uh, why? Because we, we, are, we are featuring on our uh, LinkedIn page uh, all the uh, all the slides and all the speakers that actually shared uh, either the, the training sessions in the afternoon, either the ones in the morning for 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 general theoretical uh, concepts. Uh, this is uh, um, how 
the, the uh, our LinkedIn page looks like. So whenever you want us, I send. I already sent the link, but uh, if you want just to see the name, and you you will be featured on that page. Uh, so maybe it's even a good way of of uh, connecting and maybe um, creating some networking. Um, then uh, just uh, some quick words. Um, technically speaking, so the overall video of the workshop will be uh, uploaded on on YouTube. Um, so that for all of you who didn't have the possibility of seeing some parts or actually uh, even joining the overall network, the, the overall workshop, even for some uh, different timing sessions, um, the complete video will be uploaded on our YouTube channel and the name is Mosaic 5G Ecosystem, but also I already shared the, the, the link and it will also be published and shared on our LinkedIn page. So uh, even on website, so you will have the possibility of, of seeing it. Um, the the interesting thing about and one one interesting outcome from from this uh, uh, workshop is that all of the questions that were answered were not answered just for the workshop itself, but it's good for us to have them in order to update our frequently asked questions because uh, we have this section on our Mosaic of G website, and there is the link. Uh, but we will use these answers and questions in order to update uh, that section so that whenever you uh, feel comfortable to 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 go over it and then look at them again. Maybe you 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 will find more even for other users who are who are getting in touch with us. It's good to have uh, to have these answers already. Uh, and as I said already, these slides used will be all, uh, of course, depending on the ones who are actually sending them and sharing them, will all be published. I already published some some of them. Uh, five or six speakers are already on the website and they are sharing with some. Uh, good uh, hashtags the, the the post, so it's good for for uh, sharing, spreading the word for the workshop. Uh, this is the end from my side. Uh, I would leave the word to uh, Professor Nigaen, who is actually going to conclude the session. Um, and if there are any more questions, uh, ask them now and uh, subscribe to our channel. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Bruno. I just have three slides. I think we, we reached to the final stage of this workshop. I really want to thank all of you, the participants, the presenters, and the people worked a lot to make the training sessions successful. Uh, many thanks to all of the people that helped towards the success of this uh, workshop. Um, a uh, few things I wrote and I just wanted to highlight them for you as a, as a last uh, word. Uh, we could uh, safely today say that many use cases are becoming possible with OAI Mosaic 5G available freely. So of course it is not a carrier grade solution today, but it uh, allows people to have a realistic uh, network set up and basically uh, progress in their uh, research and development. Both Mosaic 5G and OpenAir are now cloud ready for mainly Ubuntu, Red Hat and CentOS and mostly also for other distribution. Many flavor exist today. So there are some that we did in the context of Mosaic 5G. There are some others you, you saw this morning, for instance, with the OSM approach there are some solutions that Red Hat, for instance, proposed for uh, e imaging of uh, open air uh, software platform. So if you're really interested in deployment in the, in the cloud, cloudifications, cloud native, you have already some good materials to, to start with. And with the current software platform, I would say that it is possible to bring ideas into existence. And basically it boils down to a few steps you basically decide what is your network service delivery platform that you want to, to deploy, compose and customize it, automate the deployment. And then I would say everything after all boils down to developing X apps. You don't necessarily need to get to the protocol level to get the hassle of installation. I would say a lot of background work has been done to make it easy. Uh, the, to increase the usability of the software and make it uh, uh, easily experimentable for, for, the, for the use cases. So 
Again, today is easy to create this 4G, 5G infrastructure. We, we showed you today, uh, for instance, Osama for Q5G, it showed you how easy it is to automate the deployment with different deployment scenarios. Even I showed you today, even with the simplest snaps are, are, are still very easy to, to deploy the, the network. And you can actually reproduce the use cases that uh, partner did, uh, we did, or others did in your premises. And a lot of innovations could become possible by means of X apps. Actually, I presented you the X apps and I think the power is in these X apps, the algorithms, the, the concept that you, you want to show. And there are different dimensions in the X apps that you could consider. Maybe you could more go towards the consumer apps, more maybe from the service level, understand and enable the location-based services, identify the crowd distributions, optimize the applications or more on the producer apps, more on the private networking or even data-driven. And I think data-driven is what we would like to target maybe in the next year, like uh, realistically uh, incorporate uh, machine learning uh, engines, AI engines into SDK, not that we want to develop them, but integrate them in the SDK so that you could develop X apps that exploit uh, such a power, such as machine learning and, and AI. And we would like really to call for your contribution or collaboration towards, uh, towards this. So my final word would be that community interactions, collaboration and contributions are really the essence here for all of us to, to create and sustain this uh, R&D platform. So that is basically call for interactions, call for collaborations and call for contribution. And I think with this, uh, I can uh, close the, the, the workshop uh, unless uh, there is a questions from the community that uh, we could basically uh, hear and try to try to answer. Is there any questions that uh, must be discussed or answered? I don't. Um, I don't think there is. Uh, so I leave more... the floor to you, uh, Bruno, to to close the session. Then. Yeah. So um, just to conclude, I I would say that in this new normal that we are facing, it's uh, uh, it was let's say we were it was mandatory to to organize such an e meet so virtual workshop, uh, but it will be good maybe when it will be possible to 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 organize something that even bigger with with some new updates on the work we are actually targeting. Um, and we tried to keep it theoretical, but at the same time interactive in the first part. Uh, and we tried to keep it very practical in the second part. So we, we hope in the first way that, in, that it was good and you enjoyed. Um, we, we tried to keep the schedule very thick, even though, uh, as you may know, uh, it's it's not always that that easy. On the other side, we we hope you uh, you like the practical sessions on top of our discussions that that uh, there were. Uh, and this is uh, even though now we are 65 on top of this morning we were 125. Uh, I would say we we reached a very high number. Maximum number of participants were 130. That was the peak. Uh, and I would really um, thank to you all. Um, or for the work you did in order to, to prepare and set this up. Um, so yes, I just conclude saying thank you and uh, we will uh, meet in our current uh, next development state. And um, thank you very much for your uh, attention and questions. And um, yes, to all the participants, maybe we will try to, as Navid said, to align the workshop with the next OI workshop. So thank you very much. Um, uh, the uploading of the recording will be done by today, tomorrow, max Monday. So we will manage everything as soon as the, the recording will be very big. And uh, thanks again to all of you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.